The World of the American Pit Bull Terrier by Richard F. Stratton Preface At Thanksgiving dinner recently, my favorite uncle introduced me as someone who raises pit bulls. Knowing my uncle's wicked sense of humor and predilection for inflicting embarrassing situations on me to see how I get out of them, I knew I was walking into a trap. My uncle's friend was obviously intelligent and well-educated and, above all, a good and classy person. So, naturally, his response to my exposure as a pit bulldog devotee was something of a shock to him. My God, my God. He said, shaking his head in mild disapproval. I looked at him confused and replied, brainwashed by the media I guess. After he had made this pronouncement, I gently rebuked him for allowing an educated man like himself to be so easily deceived. And because he was educated, intelligent, and open-minded, he listened to me as I explained what the pit bull really was like. He apparently gave me some credit for what I had to say, as he left that night with a comment on the way out that he wanted to talk to me about the possibility of acquiring a pit bull puppy, much to the surprise of my very knowledgeable uncle. Well, from experience with my dogs, that pit bulls, despite their reputation to the contrary, have possibly the best and most stable dispositions of all dogs. Unfortunately, it must be assumed that anyone unfamiliar with pit bulldogs who chooses to read this book has been brainwashed by the media, because surely most of the public has been brainwashed, and where else would they have gotten the information? It is to be hoped, however, that the reader will be receptive enough to consider this most deserving of dogs on his own merits rather than his reputation. It may seem that where there is smoke there must be at least a small fire, and sure enough, there is. There are dogs with such a knack for fighting, and since they enjoy fighting, they can be a danger to other dogs, regardless of size, and to other animals, too. In this way, the owner of a pit bulldog must be a responsible person and not violate the laws as many others do. Unfortunately, it must be assumed that anyone unfamiliar with pit bulldogs who chooses to read this book has been brainwashed by the media, because surely most of the public has been brainwashed, and where else would they have gotten the information? It is to be hoped, however, that the reader will be receptive enough to consider this most deserving of dogs on his own merits rather than his reputation. It may seem that where there is smoke there must be at least a small fire, and sure enough, there is. There are dogs with such a knack for fighting, and since they enjoy fighting, they can be a danger to other dogs, regardless of size, and to other animals, too. In this way, the owner of a pit bulldog must be a responsible person and not violate the laws as many others do. Since the pit bull is a unique dog breed, special precautions are needed to keep it. I've put together a chapter that details some of the systems for keeping more than one pit bull, and of course they can be used even if you only keep one. It's easy once you know how, and it's worth it, as these dogs are truly special. Some may think I'm soft on pit dog owners, or breeders as they prefer to be called but there are plenty of other writers who know little about the pit dog breeder but condemn them completely and regularly, so why should I join? Me to this? I think my position is more to put things into perspective for readers who have been fed stories of how kittens and small dogs are used as bait in pit dog training. Also, despite a scientific disposition, I am a hopeless romantic when it comes to this breed because I see this dog as the most courageous and heroic of all dogs, and I am not convinced they would look that way without the sport. Furious that they forged them. Perhaps one reason I am so tolerant and understanding of a pit dog breeder is that in my youth it was my good fortune to meet distinguished men who happened to be pit dog breeders. 
Though they could bear to watch a pit dog take punishment in a competition, they were more affectionate than many people around animals, and they were genuine dog lovers, too. They were much more responsible dog owners than the vast majority of people, including many of those who criticized the pit dog breeder. My old mentor Bob Wallace, in particular, was highly critical of the irresponsible behavior of most dog owners. And I've never known anyone who had a better feeling for dogs or took more care of them. This is my third book on the American Pit Bull Terrier. Ideally, the books should be read in order, starting with this is the American Pit Bull Terrier, then Book of the American Pit Bull Terrier. American, and ending with this one. There is no harm, however, in reading the books out of sequence. In fact, this book is in some ways more of a primer than the other two, as it deals with basic material like elementary things like feeding and housing for the American Pit Bull Terrier. Some readers may be shocked that I provide a generalized form of fight training in this book. But why not? The practice of dogfighting continues unabated, so why not help newbies provide their charges with the best possible condition and feeding methods? After all, my thesis has always been that competition dogs are not cruel if done properly. Also, exactly how this is all done will be of interest to the pit bull owner and perhaps even to those poor lap dog devotees who have been horrified and sickened by stories of how pit dog breeders are constantly on the prowl for small dogs to use them as training guinea pigs. One of the problems with a third book is to avoid repeating what was already discussed in the other two. However, some things are worth repeating, and other items need embellishment. Generally, however, the material in this book consists of what I have yet to say about what I consider to be the most extraordinary and unique breeding of dogs that ever existed. Richard F. Stratton when someone unfamiliar with the breed takes his first look at an assortment of American Pit Bull Terriers, he may be singularly unimpressed. Some have large heads, while others, by comparison, have narrow heads. Some of the dogs are small, and even the big ones look like soft-coated hounds. What these dogs have in common is not readily apparent to the casual observer. The trained eye, however, notices the muscular bodies, agile movement, and jaws that even narrow-headed dogs possess. All dogs, from the smallest to the largest, have a fierce aura. Even so, few people will not believe that these dogs are the most formidable of canines. The supremacy of the American Pit Bull Terrier has been demonstrated time and time again. When we consider that this creation was created to fight for at least several hundred years, and more likely several thousand years, it is not surprising that it would triumph, despite its size, over other races that were not created in this way. However, 25 or 30 kilograms pit bulls conquered 60 kilograms tosas in Japan, and these dogs were bred to fight. Why do these American Pit Bull Terriers have such an advantage? The answer is not so clear, but I think it has something to do with the length of time that breeds have been bred for this purpose. Obviously, the Pit Bull is a purer descendant of the ancient fighting dogs than the other breeds. Of course, some people will be repulsed by the breed precisely because of its vigorous enjoyment of the fray and its deadly efficiency in doing so. So be it. Race is not for everyone. In fact, a pit bull owner must be a more responsible person than most other dog owners. One of the problems with the TPBA, American Pit Bull Terrier, Breed is that while it requires a responsibility from the owner, it is very often attracted to irresponsible people, but not always. Some famous people have been involved with these dogs. But why would anyone want a dog like that? 
It is often asked, usually to the amusement of those like us who would like to know why anyone cares about any other kind. Perhaps a more valid or more perplexing point is why anyone would be interested in dogfighting. The issue is that very few pit bull owners are involved, but how to explain their interest? To see this from a more objective perspective, let's consider horse racing. Now, we all know that horse racing is populated by a large number of obscure characters, however, there is no doubt that there are also many good people, too. Smart men, and women, are absolutely obsessed with owning and breeding thoroughbred horses. Many of these people are captains of industry or at the pinnacle of success in other fields, but their greatest passion is for these horses, and their greatest joy comes from whatever good results they achieve. But why is this sport of kings so fascinating? After all, the slower automobile easily goes faster, and other animals some smaller than thoroughbred horses can run faster too. But it doesn't hurt. We can all understand that fascinations with such things are not unreasonable. All right, let's consider the seemingly irrational interest many people have in arena dogs. First, fighting is a much more complex activity than simply running, with many variables and many complications. Then the APBT is the absolute champion in this area. Other animals of a comparable size don't stand a chance. Also, because of its great strength, agility and courage, the APBT is skilled in things other than fighting. As a prize, the pit bull is intelligent, loving and has the most stable attitude of all dogs. There are several things in which the APBT is unique. Let's take just one as an example. A large number of pit bulls have the ability to climb trees. There seem to be two explanations for this fact. First, pit bulls are extremely stubborn, and if there's something in the tree they want, they'll climb it. Second, Pit bulls use their front legs in wrestling as leverage, like a wrestler uses his arms. This makes the forelegs more human-like and capable of grasping. All this, together with the characteristic strength of the breed, allows many dogs to climb trees easily. Either way, I think anyone with an open mind can see that there are many fascinating things about these animals. They are much more complex than racehorses, and they are such a remarkable breed that it is difficult to be satisfied with any other breed after owning a pit bull. This is all the more remarkable when you consider that the breed is more troublesome to breed than other breeds, they must be kept separate from other dogs, and they are not especially good-looking, in many people's opinion. In fact, my friend Professor Lutz, who has always bred different breeds but is now a pit bull fan, named this dog the mutt with the mumps because of his appearance. Actually I always felt that APBT wins both ways. Some are quite plain or ugly, others have a distinct grace and elegance. It's probably natural to conclude that these pit bull lovers want an animal with a propensity for fighting, however they will not be satisfied with any other race. This premise will hold true for few APBT owners, as most have no interest in the fighting aspect of these dogs. However, even this large number of pacifists will not condemn dog fighting, as the general public does, because they know their dogs so well that they can admit the simple fact that letting them fight is just as cruel as letting them fight. A little bird fly. With regard to the small percentage of APBT owners who are interested in the fighting aspect, the reader may find that even though the fights are complex and exciting, any interest generated will be dwarfed by the brutality involved. But once you know what you're looking at, a fight doesn't feel any more brutal than a marathon or, better yet, American's favorite sport, American football.
At any rate, it is not my intention to convert the general public to dog fighting. But despite the fact that I am obviously a fan of the pit bull, the product of endless years of pit fighting, it would be incongruous, not to say outright hypocritical, for me to condemn it. My biggest concern is that if the fighting is shown to be worse than it appears, the result is a general uproar that will result in laws being passed that will make it difficult to own a pit bull. There are other pernicious effects of such legislation and I'll get to those later. The purpose of this chapter is to show that the pit bull is a truly unique breed. Of course, all owners of all breeds think this about their own breeds, but in the case of the APBT it's true. This is why people, good people, show a loyalty to this race in spite of everything. Surely there is no other race that demands such devotion and courage. In addition to unusual devotion and responsibility for his dog, the pit bull owner must be resolute, as he will find that the general public's attitude will be negative and often hostile. It doesn't help knowing these idiots don't know what they're talking about. You don't know whether to be happy or depressed to watch people who are conditioned by animal welfare groups and the media in general insisting that this was their idea. Humanist groups teach the public through the media to react negatively towards pit bulls. Anyway if you are going to have one of these iron dogs, you must have some strength inside. Those that do will be rewarded many times over by their dogs. And for the ignorant who can be so annoying, let's be patient and tolerant. Maybe with a little pity it will be good. Not everyone can appreciate a good APBT and enjoy it. History is indeed little more than the record of the crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. Gibbon the world loves a spice of wickedness. Longfellow. Crawling. The Demon. Although the origins of the American Pit Bull Terrier are shrouded in the mists of time, my personal speculations are reinforced whenever I take Judo out of its chain. Despite normally being a calm dog, Judo has a real passion for fighting, and for this reason, when he is released from the chain for any reason, usually for a walk, he will throw himself at any dogs barking at them. This, in turn, encourages other dogs to go absolutely nuts trying to catch him. In the course of the tumult, I can detect two or three voices, including judos. For those who haven't heard the low bark of a hunting hound on the trail, why is it different from barking in kennels, their voices carry an almost agonizing ecstasy and longing. Judo's voice will never be mistaken for that of the famous Bugleland, but it nevertheless has the same urgency and delicious delirium as that of the hounds. Now, lest the reader jump to conclusions, I am not saying that pit bulls and hounds are common descendants, perhaps thousands of years ago. Who knows when mankind and canines first acted together in hunting? But it must have been thousands of years ago, and this was probably the first practical activity of dogs used by mankind. Hunting was serious business then, but undoubtedly most men enjoyed the hunt too, and the dogs who also enjoyed it and excelled in it were perpetuated. We are assuming, of course, that mankind knew nothing about selective breeding in those days, but it is easy to imagine how the less enthusiastic and less able dogs could not participate in the hunting raids and, perhaps, were driven away or killed. This would be an indirect selective breeding separating the less profitable animals. Dogs assisted in hunting by helping to track game, then bring it down, and finally kill it. Eventually, specialization evolved. Thus, dogs with longer muzzles and drooping lips were better on the trails. The long-legged, slender-bodied dogs were faster than the others, and they were more adept at bringing down game once spotted. The strong, 
powerful dogs that were most useful in the kill were not as fast but were nevertheless necessary once the game had been brought down. In this way, both man and canine have developed an appetite for hunting. With the advent of farming and technology, hunting was no longer necessary and became recreational or a sport. Not all men or all dogs, for that reason, were any longer allowed to hunt. True hounds were kept in kennels or on chains when not hunting with their owners so they wouldn't bleed the game or attack the domestic livestock. Stray dogs caught hunting were killed, and so were the men. Men were called invaders if they hunted but were not part of the people of the land, and the penalty for trespassing was often death. There was a time when it was illegal for peasants to even own a hound, because what else would they want one for if not for hunting, or, better, poaching. However, peasants were allowed to keep small dogs which were used to repress nuisance animals such as rats, moles, and badgers, and the dogs that did this were called terriers. Unfortunately for peasants, bulldogs were generally thought of as hunters, and peasant ownership of them was prohibited. It is possible, even probable, that many of the small bulldogs were masked as a terrier so that their owners could keep them. This must be the origin of the name Pit Terrier that the Irish often used for their dogs, while everyone else referred to them as bulldogs. And there, too, may be a clue as to why Irish pit dogs were so small. Be that as it may, it's easy to imagine how sports were developed by the use of these three types of hounds and terriers. It's easy to see how hunters became interested in which dog was the fastest, and thus the dog race was born. Various tracking tests evolved for track dogs and are still used today. And it's not hard to see how curiosity developed about which was the most formidable of the killer dogs. In my opinion, dog-on-dog -dog fighting originated much earlier in history than most people think. To demonstrate the dog's efficient hunting connection, captive bears and bulls were used by what came to be called baiting bears and bulls. Butchers later used these dogs to hold a bull chosen for slaughter. This practice, along with goading the bull, apparently solidified the breed with the bulldog name. Prior to this they were known, in several languages, as wild boar hunters, bear biters, bull biters, mastiffs, and banished, confined, dogs. Meanwhile the peasants, too, had their hobby with their terriers. So we hear about badger baiting, or pulling, and rat killing competition. Since many peasants had a bulldog, and bulldog crossbreed, disguised as a terrier, it is strongly suspected that the poor, too, indulged in dog fights. While people in general were interested in dogs for what they could do, they also appreciated a good-looking dog, one who was also good at his dexterity. A devotee's concept of beauty was closely related to function, so the perception of good looks tended to depend on the type of activity in which the dog was involved. One of the first groups to develop conformation patterns was the bloodhound people, and they started showing their dogs, too. So there were now two categories, sporting dogs and non-sporting dogs, which meant hunting dogs for the first category and, the rest, fighting for the second. This system is still used today in American Kennel Club conformation shows, except that other categories have been added. Thus, we have divisions such as the toy group for lapdog sets, working dogs for dogs that do farm work or guard work and anything else that can be referred to as work, and the hound group which includes scent and vision which was developed for people who thought hunting dogs were special enough to be in their own category. The system had its flaws, of course. One problem was that some breeds would fit into more than one category. Our own breed, for example, would be a hunting dog, or hound, a working dog, like a catching or guard dog, and even a terrier, 
as it was used for rat and badger killing. Just to mention two examples, the dachshund was mistakenly placed in the hound group, apparently because the classifiers thought that hund, dog in German, was translated to hound when it was actually dog. The Boston Terrier is placed in the non-sporting category, and I think that is as good a place as any since the breed is certainly not a terrier. But then, why the designation terrier? The flaws in the system resulted from a combination of ignorance on the part of the people who employ the system and the resistance of many races being classified under a single category. However, the system has worked well for exhibitions for many years. The sad part is that the public is only informed about dog shows and has gotten its information about dogs, directly or indirectly, from American Kennel Club sources. In this way, misjudgment and fanciful ideas about dogs abound, because the pent-up capital of exhibitors has been the adoption of ridiculous and unsubstantiated stories about their breeds and the treatment of unregistered breeds with the American Kennel Club as if they did not exist. As someone who has tried to delve into the history of our race, I can figure how easily misconceptions can be solidified into the official history of a race. Fortunately, I have the advantage of seeing whatever historical evidence is available from the point of view of being familiar with the pit bull in almost all its aspects, arena dog, captive dog, hunting dog, guard dog, domestic dog, and so on. However, any student of any race should maintain a skeptical attitude toward all aspects of any race history, including this one because the histories are gathered from various personal contacts, other writings, which must have been borrowed from even other scripts, illustrative work, old documents, and ancient artifacts. I get very upset with these stories that purport to trace a specific race back to the ancient Egyptians. And yet, I can look at artifacts, or their photographs, from that time and see dogs that look a lot like ours and were used as ours perhaps were, too. However, I will never try to say that these dogs were our breed, Egyptian pit bull terriers, although I think it is perfectly logical to think that our dogs are descended from this type of dog. But going back to more modern times, we have no way of knowing when the first imports of pit bull dogs were made but my guess will be that they came with the infamous ones who were threatening all of Europe with civil war and who either escaped or were brought here. This would have been before 1776, but of course this is pure speculation. We know from photographs that the dogs were here before the civil war, and, of course, the imports which were so crowded with the Irish migrations resulting from the potato famine of 1845-1851 are well known. In fact, what really happened was that one of the few Irish people who became immediately economically successful in this country at that time either returned to their homeland and brought back the pit terriers, or they were sent by their family members who still lived there. The pit bulldog has always had an appeal to minorities, and I'm not quite sure why. More likely, the oppression and hard work is more bearable when you have a dog in your house who you know can beat every other dog in town. Fascination with the fighting dog can be almost pathological in its intensity, but it can also be a bomb for the wounds and outrages suffered by an unjust society. Anyway, since we know that pit bulldogs existed in several countries, it seems that other immigrants were instrumental in bringing dogs of their favorite breeds and from several countries. The population was concentrated in the New England, New England, areas, so, at least in the beginning, dogs were mainly found there, too. But pit bull owners are individualistic adventurers, the kind who would venture out into an unpopulated wilderness. In this way, the race moved to the south and west. The breed continued to be, and is to this day, used for a myriad of activities including fighting and hunting and as hunting dogs, but of course the vast majority of people keep dogs as pets or guard dogs.
Pet owners typically knew arena dog owners or at least arena dog breeders and were often studious of the breed aspect. In other words, things were much more than they are today. From each information, indications are that the breed was simply called bulldog by enthusiasts. However, when Chauncey Z. Bennett created the United Kennel Club in 1898, he recognized the breeds as American Pit Bull Terriers. The word American helped to distinguish the breed from the show Bull Terrier that was often referred to as the English Bull Terrier. However, Bennett had a definite preference for using the word American to name his race. Thus, he had an American Fox Terrier and a hunter of a type of raccoon from the United States, and an Old Glory Black and Tan, and later, the Spitz, long-nosed dog breed, became became the American Eskimo. For a while, he also registered white colice as colice colombianos. Colombia was another word used for America that was more common in the old days, as in the song, Colombia, Gem of the Ocean, Bennett wasn't necessarily an ultranationalist, but people thought ours was one special country, and they thus accepted anything new or dubious if it had American in front. Bennett's reasoning was that if a race was developed or changed slightly in this country, then it could be called American. For a long time afterwards, there was debate over whether the breed should be called Pit Bull Terrier to emphasize the acceptance of arena dogs or American Bull Terrier to promote the breed. American Pit Bull Terrier with the Pit in parentheses was Bennett's solution. When the American Kennel Club was petitioned to recognize the breed around 1935, the name American Pit Bull Terrier or American Bull Terrier, could be used because of the influence of Bull Terrier owners who felt they should have a patent on the name. Bull Terrier Boston Terrier owners who wanted Bull Terrier Boston recognition were turned down for the same reason. A further factor was that the AKC American Kennel Club did not want to use a name that had been used by the UKC. United Kennel Club Will Judy, who promoted and edited Mundo du Chao, Dog World, at the time, suggested the name, Terrier Yankee. Anyway, Staffordshire Terrier was the decided name, and the breed was placed in the Terrier group, which is a strangely inappropriate place. The English version of their arena dog was recognized by the British Kennel Club as the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, apparently the bull terrier breeders there were more reasonable or less influential. For many years, people considered the Staffordshire Terrier, Staff or Staff, and the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, Stafford, to be the same breed, even though they developed entirely different bloodlines together and had different standards. Among exhibitors, there has always been a fascination with imported lineage. Thus, in the 1950s, some staff owners imported Staffordshire Bull Terriers and crossed them with their staffs. Well, this certainly caused a civil war within staff circle, as many of them would not accept Staffords as being the same race. Howard Hadley, one of staff's most respected and influential owners, led a successful fight to get the Staffordshire Bull Terrier declared a separate breed by the AKC. A problem then arose because the registry had two breeds with very similar names, the Staffordshire Terrier and the Staffordshire Bull Terrier. At this point, staff's owners, who fought so hard over the name American Bull Terrier so long ago, were offered to have the name withdrawn, but they declined. The reason was that they had spent over 20 years and thousands of dollars promoting the name Staffordshire, and they were now reluctant to give up. This didn't make any sense, of course, because the staff never became popular, and most people had no idea what they were. In any case, the name American Staffordshire Terrier was chosen as a compromise and, last I heard, it is still the name being used.
In the meantime, a registry office to exclusively register pit bulldogs was founded by Guy McCord in Chicago. He was called the American Dog Breeders Association, and he registered the breed as Pit Bull Terriers. Later the office was taken over by Frank Ferris who had married the widow of John P. Colby. In the 1970s, the registry office was acquired by the Greenwood family, and at this time, the American Pit Bull Terrier, without the parentheses, was the official name for the breed from the ADBA, American Dog Breeders Association. Under Ralph Greenwood's direction, the registry office grew tremendously in size and influence. Prior to this, the ADBA was simply that other organization that registers pit bulls. The pit bull's popularity waxed and waned like all breeds, but it was always less popular than the breeds at the height of showing because it was so much less exposed than the others. Another obstacle was that in the old days, people who kept dogs as pets let them loose, as it was considered cruel to confine them. A pit bull, however, had to be confined, penned, kenneled, or chained, definitely inconvenient in those days. However, the breed kept adherence among the general public, although it was not a large group. I remember Bob Wallace once complaining about how people would ask him if one of his prized pit bulls he was walking was part boxer. Well, one of the reasons Bob was so furious was that boxers were a relatively new breed to him, after all, they only became popular in this country after World War II, while the pit bull was the formidable old breed. For Bob but I bet Bob would love to go back to the days when race was virtually a secret rather than an unofficial scapegoat for the humanists. Aside from being kept as pets and guard dogs, the dogs were also used as hunting dogs, usually as silent stalkers, but occasionally, but very rarely, the pit bull would bark on the trail, pedigree dogs, usually as captive dogs, but a surprising number as all-round dogs on farms, and of course as arena dogs. Activity in the arena was much more exuberant in every district of the country, but each district lived in a world of its own. A trade magazine, such as Dog Fancy, Dog Breeders, Pit and Pal, or Pit Dogs, would occasionally prosper or eventually go out of print. The Bloodlines Journal, published by the United Kennel Club, was a constant source of information, but it contained fight reports only from the southern arenas. Action, photographs of dogs in close quarters appeared very rarely in this magazine, and during the 1950s, reporting stopped altogether. A variety of rules were used for competitions, see Appendix A, but in the 1950s, Gabon Trahan and Floyd Burroughs teamed up to write what became known as the Cajun Rules. Similar rules were written by Al Brown, but they were not widely used. In fact there is a rumor that some winners in the West made new rules, calling them Cajun Rules, thinking they might be better accepted that way, and sent them out to various key men. There were three main strokes in the Cajun Rules, namely, 1. Emphasis was placed on the trainer's hands being positioned in front of the shoulders, of the dog ready to scratch. 2. A turn was more liberally defined as a turning dog simply turning his head and shoulders away from his opponent without regard to whether or not it was a loss of interest in the fight, even a maneuver that resulted in the momentary turn of head and shoulders. Shoulders was called a turn. 3. An off-hold count ranging from 10 seconds to 2 minutes, could start with one scratch at a time, and the losing dog to start. The biggest impact of the Cajun rules was to shorten competitions and thereby greatly increase the chances of preventing the loss of one of the dog's lives. In the early 1950s, IQ. Kennedy founded a magazine called Pit Dogs. It caused a general uproar among pit bull breeders in general, 
while the Bloodlines Journal became more and more timid in supporting the breed and almost never mentioned the fights. Now, here was a magazine that not only published the competitions but also featured their photographs. The magazine was successful and was later taken over by Pete Sparks. Though cleverly crafted and information-packed, the magazine, whose title was changed by Sparks to Your Friend and Mine, was certainly counterproductive to the arena dog's activity because it focused the public's attention more appropriately, I should say that it attracted the attention of the humanists, and they used it as a red flag to throw in the face of their constituents. Soon the arena dog conventions were broken by various agencies on a regular basis. For a while, Cuba was the perfect place for the conventions, but Castro's tenure ended that. Arena dog breeders learned to be a little more secretive about their activities. Either way, the magazine went on, and so did the public pressure. In the early 1970s Your Friend and Mine ceased publication, but other magazines took their place. For this reason, public pressure continued, and in the late 70s, the mindless proliferation of intentional crime laws began across the country. During all this time, the breed has gained unprecedented popularity among the general public. The reasons probably varied. One was that since controlled laws came into existence across the country, pit bulls were no longer a special problem as a pet dog. Another was the reaction of the general public to the increase in residential burglaries. Many citizens have obtained guard dogs, and the pit bull has always had a good reputation as a staunch guard dog, despite the fact that they don't bark much and are fond of people, even strangers. If nothing else, your appearance is an impediment anyway. I think, however, that even the sweetest of pit bulls wouldn't stand still if their owner was physically attacked, and I can't think of any other breed I would want by my side. Finally, all the publicity generated about the dogs by humanists may have resulted in funds for their coffers, but it also engendered interest in the breed, and as always in the wrong person for the wrong reasons. With this huge contingent of people-loving pit bull breeders, organizations began to form. One of the first was the Golden State Pit Bull Club in Southern California. In 1975, they asked the United Kennel Club to sponsor a pit bull terrier show. When this agency objected, the group approached the American Dog Breeders Association, and they agreed to sanction conformation shows. First, a standard was needed, and the ADBA set one up in a very organized way, looking at photographs of dogs known to be good ring dogs and analyzing them carefully. Other aspects, such as strong bite and intelligence, were not considered because there were no compliance aspects to these quirks. However, these shows became very popular and now the American Dog Breeders Association has chapters across the country. While most of the participants are merely interested in the conformation, it has been fun to see the arena dog breeder also take part in it and get involved with them. Recently, weight pullers, like sled dogs, have become a popular component of conformation competitions, and many bulldogs have broken the record for sled pullers. Some may worry that exposures will lead to the deterioration of the breed. Are today's competitors following the same path that staff's creators followed many years ago? Well, there is a definite difference in attitudes today. Devotees of the original staff, just as today's competitors are, were an amalgamation of pit breeders, reformed, or retired, pit breeders, and just plain breed breeders. In any case, the course of action was entirely different. It was decided, in part by pressure from the American Kennel Club, to completely disapprove of dog fighting and to speak loudly and persistently about it. All of this was designed to increase the public's acceptance of the breed and to throw off the superstition of staff devotees. No goals were reached. 
Even today the public swallows the creators of staff where the pit breeders, why else would they want the dogs, and the underhanded staff breeders approach the breed never did much to promote it. Today's American Dog Breeders Association shows dog enthusiasts reciprocally respect a good hunting dog. They are fascinated by the history of the pit dog and would not even consider breeding a dog simply because it has good conformation. Rather, their interests are in perpetuating the essence of the race, not just one's fellow man. In hands like these, the race is well served. Some crazy politician in San Francisco wants to ban the race. Before the proposal comes before the Board of Supervisors, these people have mobilized the opposition to include even the human maniacs. Enact an anti-race law in Hollywood, Florida. That's fine, but be prepared to be booked into a civil lawsuit by these people in which they've ordered a battalion of connoisseurs, some of them biologists and doctors who own pit bulls. Although these things are an expensive undertaking, they serve as warnings to other demagogues who panic the public and, pandering to votes, come up with various discriminatory laws against the American pit bull terrier breed. They will, however, be held responsible in the final analysis for the unnecessary expense they allege on their constituents for arbitrary and idle minds pushing for discriminatory, and thus unconstitutional, legislation. I have referred to these last few years as the era in which American pit bull terrier breeders were put to the test. While these were difficult and discouraging times, it was also one of the less serious unions among devoted owners. The breed will likely be better off for it. One of the beneficial effects I've noticed is that it has what was called before natural enemies working together. So pit dog breeders, ADBA people, UKC people, staff breeders, Stafford breeders, and even bull terrier breeders are working side by side on certain projects, truly a sight to warm the valve of an old cynical heart. I think medicine is worse than illness. Beaumont and Fletcher Humanist society and animal control groups are, to the general public, one and the same. In reality, it's not that simple. There are various animal welfare groups, and there are different organizational services for animal control operations, as well. The easiest way to keep these somewhat separate groups is to remember that the goal of animal welfare groups is to protect animals from people, while the goal of animal control is to protect the public from animals and their annoyances. Generally, animal control is financed by the municipality or city, while the various human groups depend on private donations. With so many animal welfare groups, it's impossible to name them all, but I thought I'd take the time to pick a few for you. Reportedly, the first animal welfare organization was the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, created in Britain in 1824 by the Reverend Arthur Boone. Later, in 1866, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was created in New York. Obviously, there was enough money coming in that the American Humanist Association was founded around 1870. A new organization called the National Humanist Association was promptly sued by the American Humanist Association for name similarity, so the name was changed to the Humanist Society of the United States. There are many other animal welfare groups, too, but delineating them all will be an unnecessary tedious exercise. When I was a boy in Colorado, there was a heavily painted picture of a fat woman who used to ride her horse in front of our house every day. In exactly what capacity, I'm not sure, but she was linked in some way with the local humanist society. One of the reasons I remember this is because the running joke was that there was no one crueler to animals than she was to her horse for riding it. 
The city situation with the humanist society was one of those instances where the difference between the humanist society and the animal control society was considerably strained by the fact that the humanist society was commissioned to run an animal transport and control service. Indeed, humanist society kennels were even rented out to the public as dog hotels. Although animal control services are sometimes contracted out to human groups, they are usually separate, in fact, different human groups have taken animal control organizations to court for cruelty to them. To be honest, grand juries have also nominated humanist societies for the same charge. Sometimes different animal welfare groups clash, accusing each other of cruelty, usually with respect to the shelter keeping the animals penned up or the method of euthanasia used. Now, admitting that human groups have more than their share of chips, we must also recognize that many decent and sincere people are involved in the movement. Although we think of bull terrier breeders locked in mortal combat with humanists, such is not always the case. For example, Bloodlines Journal, in its old pro-dog fighting days, went hand in hand with humanist groups against vivisectionists. Cynics, I suppose, will conclude that the pit bull breeders were merely trying to help their image. The truth, however, is that pit bull breeders are no less animal lovers than humanists. Anyway, humanist societies in general have done a tremendous job with the image. Indeed, the impression with the general public is that they are a government agency. Of course, they had an easy job in that regard because they had everything going for them. Despite everything, almost everyone loved animals and is against cruelty to them. However, were the humanist groups really so good and so affectionate? I have my doubts. And I am very concerned about your general tendencies to favor extremely oppressive legislation. I also resent the fact that they ignore the plight of wildlife whose habitat is constantly being destroyed by the population of good old Homo sapiens. Humanist groups have rightly been at the forefront of advocating for the sterilization of domestic animals to curb the population explosion. If they care about all animals, for example wildlife, shouldn't they also keep the human population in check? While I feel there should be general anti-cruelty laws, I have some sincere doubts about how effective the legislation is on animal cruelty. After all, the most common cruelty is simply neglect, and few people see it. In any case, the most effective force for anti-cruelty is pressure, and I think people have always been concerned about animals and have used various measures of persuasion to get their friends to take care of their animals. This attitude of respect and care for animals is reflected even in ancient writings. Anyway, certain things seem to have an impetus on themselves. Legislation does not eliminate, or even has little effect on, cruelty and humanistic societies have only managed to have legislation against the sports of the common man or the little known. They have been singularly ineffective against any cruelty that has to do with fattening our stomachs. Readers may be interested in the sociological circumstances that accompanied the growth of humanist groups and the subsequent legislation that resulted. Do you remember that it was Reverend Boone who founded the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals? Well, the church was antagonistic to many animal sports but not always for the reason you might think. This was during an age of protection from the denial of the pleasures of this world. In this way, animal sports were antagonized more by the pleasure given to viewers than by any presumed suffering on the part of the animals. This denial of worldly pleasure pervaded many religions at the time, and some clergy were scandalized when the secret of their chess games was discovered. Henry Berg, who founded the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in the United States, 
has been variously described as a fop and a phony. He wore spats and a top hat, and he was obviously vocal about the cruelty of animals. However, he did not stop eating meat out of custom, but he did at least push for a more humane slaughter. His compassion had its limits, as he favored pillorying those who were cruel to animals. He was also in favor of the death penalty. Based in New York, he traveled extensively across the country, lecturing and leaving an overabundance of SPCA. My first memory of information about one of the humanist societies was when I was 14, and the information was about a dog ring that was supposedly raided by police in New York City. According to the news, a number of sophisticated New Yorkers were attending the event and not only were they taken aback and embarrassed by a night in jail, but they were also nauseated by the sight of a bull terrier leisurely chewing on the leg of the other. Well, even at that young age, I knew enough about pit bulls and their fights to know that this story was pretty unusual and couldn't possibly be true. The legs are surprisingly solid, and furthermore, a dog would not allow its opponent to stand on its leg for so long, usually snapping it off by biting its muzzle. I would later learn that the veracity of these reports by aid agencies was questionable to say the least. Incidentally, the article was illustrated by a photograph of an American Kennel Club white bull terrier. My next revelation was of a lauded review of an upcoming dogfighting movie starring Joe E. Brown. I don't remember the name of the movie, but the magazine warned that pit dog owners wouldn't like it because it revealed the so-called sport for what it really was. At the time, I worked at a movie theater as a placeholder and after-school usher, so I saw this pompous film several times. The movie was so cloying and misleading that I'll spare the reader the plot, but it did involve a fighting dog trainer and one arena dog in particular. Just to show you how authentic the movie was, the arena dog was a boxer. And the arena dog trainer's training method was to whip the dog with a bullwhip, to make it ferocious, the humanist society had no reservations in applauding its authenticity. The real rubbish about pit dog activities started to take flight in the early 1970s. That's when stories using puppies and kittens as lures to train a pit dog started to surface. All the other nonsense about prostitution, drugs, and violence that was part of the arena dog scene gained new prominent coverage about this time, too. Why such a lie? Can't an honest argument be made against dog fighting based on the truth? The big question for me was, where did the stories start? Were they a figment of some overactive humanist's imagination? To be honest, and I'm always being partial to seeing the other side of the view, a Chicago reporter supposedly got an interview with a supposed dogfighting promoter who spoke of using kittens in onion bags as bait for fighting dogs. He even talked about clipping the kittens' nails so they wouldn't hurt or discourage the arena dogs. You have to meet these dogs to appreciate how ridiculous this story is. Here you have dogs that will kill a porcupine, absolutely disdaining the thorn, and yet we have to cut the kitten's nail so that the dogs are not afraid to attack them. At this point, I'll digress for just a moment to talk about the characteristics of pit bulls that make the story of puppies and kittens as bait more absurd. A friend of mine once bred different types of mastiff but converted to the pit bull, however, he retained a favorite mastiff. Over the course of several years, he'd had three or four bulldogs let loose, and each time they'd just run past other pit bulls to grab, and manhandle, the mastiff. Since he wasn't understanding what was going on, I explained to him that since the mastiff was such a huge brute, he represented a super stimulus that bulldogs could not resist. While it is true that some bulldogs will kill puppies and kittens, 
and so will dogs of other breeds, most of them will not. I have been in more than one breeder's kennel where puppies were allowed to run wild and where they ran back and forth within reach of champions who merely played with them or tolerated their abuse grudgingly. This is because most pit bulldogs are stimulated by larger dogs and other animals. Now, to be honest, many bulldogs will go after anything that isn't human, that's exactly their ancient hunting heritage, but if any animal has immunity, so will puppies and kittens. One night I was talking to a legitimate dog breeder who told me that he would have nothing to do with a dog that killed puppies or kittens, as he considered it a weakness, even a symptom of cowardice. In most cases, I'm afraid, our humanists made up their own scare stories or, rather, they used isolated examples and made it sound as if they were representatives of all competitions. This doesn't seem like humanists trying to be sure their stories were true. The nonsense about prostitution and drugs was obviously a cynical attempt to trick law enforcement officials into taking dogfighting more seriously. The truth of the matter is that drug dealers and prostitutes are no more a part of the dog scene than they would be in a baseball game. This is not to say that no prostitutes or dealers have ever been present at a dog show, or a baseball league, but it is certainly not representative. However, armed with their stories of stealing the dogs, puppies, and kittens for training the arena dogs, along with the stories of prostitution and drugs, and even more ridiculous stories about such things as the use of electroshock devices to provoke dogs to fight and disembowel dogs whose handlers characteristically wouldn't even mercifully put them down with a shot to the head. Humanist groups were able to enforce a law making dog fighting a crime in California. Later they followed what I call absurd crime proliferation in various states. In each case, the approach was the same, the same story we told earlier was told, to which was added that certain states had very effective laws. This was misinformation because severe is not necessarily the same thing as effective. Dot. Each state was assured that it was the center of dogfighting in America, and wasn't that a shameful honor? Much media controversy preceded any attempt at legislation. In some states, sentences of more than 10 years in prison have been established. Shadows of Henry Berg and his pillory. One thing all laws have in common however, they were all equally useless. There are few people I know who love animals and are more devoted to them than I am. My wife would be one of them and my father's wife, my stepmother, would be another I might suddenly think of. If I am such a sentimental animal lover, should be able to communicate on more or less the same level as humanists, but somehow I doubt this is possible. If this were possible, and humanists would be just as willing and make the same effort as I do to see the other side's point of view, I would like to point out that their efforts have been greatly counterproductive if they have the well-being of others. Arena dogs in mind. Even if they're thinking about other animals and don't care about our dogs, your supply of absurd stories has been detrimental to them, too, as your bait stories have inspired certain low-level newcomers to the breed to get into this sort of thing. Their stories, however, become self-fulfilling to a certain extent. If humanist groups are really interested in the welfare of dogs, they should work towards the legalization, and regulation, of dog fighting. That way they can make a contribution towards improving animal welfare instead of making it worse, as they have done in the past, with their efforts to stop it, but they will never stop, so why not make it better, to stop it. The welfare of the animal. There's a moral to every story if you just look for it. Lewis Carroll. More fisherman stories. Believe it or not, I regularly receive a steady stream of correspondence from all over the world, praising my books, 
I am personable enough to take pleasure in any generous praise of my books, feeding my ego, and making me feel that I have made a difference. Right thing for the dogs I love writing the books. There are, unfortunately, times when I had my doubts about this. A substantial number of the senders and people I talk to say that their favorite part of the books has been the chapters in which I relate stories I've heard about the individuality of the breeds. Apparently, the nature and personality of the dog shines through more in the stories than throughout my pontifications in other sections of the book. Well, I like stories, too, and I'm happy to introduce a few more. There may be fishermen stories, and they certainly sound that way, especially to someone who doesn't know these dogs all that well, but, unbeliever by nature as I am, I am inclined to believe them. A point of view. One of the many annoyances that American pit bull terrier owners must put up with is the people who inevitably knock on their door, wanting to borrow their dog. Since no one in their right mind will let their dog get involved in a fight without being there to supervise, and separate the dog, this means borrowing both the owner and the dog. Usually the situation is that a certain dog has been either threatening the neighborhood or biting children, and an irresponsible owner is completely undisciplined about controlling his pet. Your friend doesn't want the responsibility of owning a bulldog, but he would certainly like to take advantage of him just for the occasion. In almost all cases, it is best to be polite but firmly decline to use your dog. Very little good can happen, and a lot of bad is always a possibility. But the flesh is weak, and so is the mind, consequently, most of us have succumbed to the desires of a good friend on at least one occasion. This happened to Maury Rootberg when Booger, father of Going Light Barney, was eight years old. It seems that an arrogant member of the upper class used to take his Chesapeake Bay Retriever out to an empty lot on the outskirts of town to exercise him. If a stray dog passed by, a break was given for him to mistreat or kill. The Unfortunate Animal Unlike other hound owners, this person felt very proud of his dog's fighting skills. Strangely enough, one of today's Chesapeake ancestors was reputed to have never lost a duck, or a fight. This giant dog is rumored to have killed a number of dogs, both small and large, and victims' owners tried to convince Maury to take Booger out into the field and let him loose. To Maury's credit he resisted the idea for a while, but as the record of mutilations increased, he finally relented. Accompanied by two of the other dog owners, Maury took Booger out to the lot, and sure enough, there was the owner of the Chesapeake with his boots, hat, whistle, and whip, working on his dog. Maury slowed his car to a stop and opened the door. Booger had already seen his victim. It was later noted that Booger's only injuries were the raw soles of his feet which he made by quickly getting out of the car to attack the victim as quickly as possible. Like a guided missile, Booger shot in front of Chesapeake, but he was so silent that it was only at the last minute that the big dog became aware of his approach. The cheese peak turned with delight, opened its mouth to snatch the impudent, if reckless, visitor. Booger flew straight into those huge gaping jaws, as if he were going straight down the throat. Booger impetuously threw himself under his massive opponent and out of sight. The Chesapeake's head moved down as Booger slid under him. Now, from the Cheesepeake owner's point of view, some small dog was stupid enough to go straight to destruction. The owner was unable to hide his pride and satisfaction. The huge rust-colored body hid Booger. Completely. No sound came from the two dogs, and Chesapeake's head, apparently holding its opponent, occasionally shook or rotated. 
The owner walked over to Mori, tapping his whip with satisfaction. Sir, he said, you just lost your dog. Saying nothing, Mori studied the situation for a few more moments. Then he walked over and looked under the retriever. There was Booger, all four paws hugged against the giant body that loomed over him. He was gripping that massive jaw and pulling it so wide open that the Chesapeake couldn't make a sound. Eyes shining, Booger shook his prey for a few seconds, causing his head to move from side to side. Blood from the retriever's mouth was dripping from its mouth down the sides of Booger's head. Look down from here, Maury said quietly. It's amazing what a different perspective can do to a person's point of view. Suddenly, the owner of the Chesapeake, who had been so prim and arrogantly happy before, was now apoplectic, threatening and ordering Maury to get his killer away from his dog. And this was one of those rare instances when it was worth the hustle and bustle to pit a bulldog against another breed. The owner of the Chesapeake got a taste of what it was like to be on the other side of a pet being abused. He lost his pride in his dog's fighting ability and, perhaps, gained a little compassion. And his dog never again attacked other dogs, regardless of size. Maybe he's had enough of fights. More likely, he got scared running after another dog like Booger. The fighting dog lover and the dog lover. Not all dog breeders are angels, of course, but I have been blessed to know some of the most decent and honorable ones, and they compare favorably in dog knowledge and compassion with any breeder. Of course, Wallace was primarily concerned with the perpetuation of the dog lineage and would only occasionally breed a dog to test the value of his breed against others. However, he referred to himself as a lover of dogfighting, and he lived in a time when a person could be somewhat more open about the activities of an arena dog than they are today. In his youth and middle age, Wallace was an enthusiastic bird hunter, and one of his hunting companions was the county judge. Indeed, they often used the judge's dog, a pointer, on their raids. Occasionally, conversations would revolve around the bulldogs and inevitably evoke the same response from the judge, Bob, I just don't understand how you can put those dogs into a fight. I'm a lover of them, I can't understand such a thing. There is nothing I love more than a dog. Bob, without the gift of infinite patience, would swallow his anger and try to explain the arena dog competition that even a dog lover can participate in, but not a practitioner. Like so many other people, the judge's mind was not open to new or different ideas. Despite false criticism from the judge, the friendship between the two men endured and they remained hunting companions. One day the judge showed up with a new hunting dog, and naturally Bob asked about the old one. Oh, old Jack was getting too old to hunt, so I gave him away. When Bob asked who had kept the dog, the judge replied that he didn't know the person's name, it was just someone he had met on the street. This inflamed Wallace considerably, but at least for a while, he said nothing. However, the next time his friend started babbling about Bob taking his dogs to fight and as a dog lover himself couldn't understand it, Wallace exploded. Yes, you are a dog lover, fine. Said Wallace in a voice that shook the trees. His natural voice was low anyway low in pitch and unintentionally ominous. Here Jack spent all these years valiantly working his hardest for you, at your signal and call, and slave to your whims. And how do you repay him in exchange for that love? When he grows old to hunt beyond your expectations, you discard him like an old shoe. And you haven't even bothered to find him a good home. No, 
You just gave it to some stranger, and you have no idea what kind of treatment he's getting. Well, if that's what being a dog lover is, I'm glad I'm a sponsor of fighting dogs. Perplexed was the judge at Wallace's reproach that he had spent many weeks trying to locate his old dog. And he never said anything about Bob being a fighting dog sponsor again. Jocko and Lion One of my all-time favorite stories was the one told to me by two businessmen in Boulder, Colorado, when I was about 14 years old and just couldn't help but hear enough about the American Pit Bull Terrier. One of the two men owned a restaurant called Howard Steakhouse, and he had been a professional boxer in his youth. His career has recorded only two losses, both by points decision, one was a welterweight world title fight and the other was a welterweight crown. The other man owned a lot of property, including a tea and coffee company that I later worked for. My greatest pleasure was getting these two together and listening to them tell stories of dogs from the past. I've mentioned Jocko before. He was a small piebald dog weighing 14 kilos, small but indestructible and hard as a rock. At the time of this story, Jocko was in the possession of Ed, the property owner, who kept him on a stake with a cable mounted in his luxurious home. Later, Lion was brought into Jocko's domain, a large pit bulldog weighing 30 kilos with a color that gave rise to his name. His physique was also that of a lion, with his large head and strong neck, not to mention his enormous size. Lion was attached to a chain mounted about 200 feet away from Jocko, who was casually looking around to find a way to free himself so he could pummel this impetuous newcomer. You see, Jocko was like most bulldogs in that he felt he could beat anything regardless of size, even a lion. Only in Jocko's case, you weren't sure if he could. Well, Jocko never found a way to break free of the chain, but he was occasionally taken inside the house, and that's where he somehow made his escape. Nobody was sure what happened. He was left alone in a room on the third floor and the door was securely locked. The seventeen-year-old daughter was the one who discovered that Jocko had escaped the room. She also noticed, terrified, that the window was open. Surely the dog wouldn't have enough intelligence to jump out the window from that height. In Jocko's case you never knew, of course, and the girl looked down at the grass expecting to see a broken body. Anything. In that time, Ed joined his daughter and he learned of Jocko's disappearance. He, too, looked down confused. No broken piebald bodies on the floor. There was a tree outside the window, but there was no dog in it. Yet, Ed wondered, could it be possible that the dog jumped onto the tree branch, then climbed a branch onto the roof? Once on the roof, the dog could merely follow the slope and descend to the porch roof, and from there jump to the ground safely. Well, if Jocko made it to the ground, he probably went straight after Lion. That way, he could just as well have jumped from the three floors, as his death would just as well have been inevitable. When Ed and his daughter reached the backyard, they stopped involuntarily in great surprise. There was Lion, with his chain wrapped around him like a cocoon, being dragged around by Jocko who had him by the muzzle and completely helpless, with the help of the chain. Jocko looked at them and wagged his tail as he gave the lion's huge head another twist, then a shake. Jocko, as usual, was without a scratch. Jocko strikes again. In hindsight, it's hard to separate the wheat from the chaff in the stories I hear about Jocko. Some of them just seemed impossible. The same people who told the stories about Jocko had stories about Denver, Lion, and other dogs that seemed more believable 
but they increased the most eloquent and laughed as hard as they could when they talked about Jocko. Apparently, he was something special, an absolute dynamo, smart, playful, talented, full of personality, and utterly devoid of conscience. He had a real penchant for causing trouble for his owners and getting them into trouble. An example of this was the time Ed began letting his 14-year-old son Jimmy take Jocko for walks. Things went well for a while, but one day an Airedale Terrier managed to get within range of Jocko who unceremoniously caught its muzzle like a bear trap. The Terrier's screams could be heard in the distance, and Jimmy was having a hard time getting Jocko free. A mob soon formed, and each person had their own system for breaking up a dogfight. Water was thrown over the dogs, a match was lit under Jocko's tail, and a firecracker was lit under the dogs, all to no avail, as Jocko held on tight, and the terrier's screams rose to a crescendo. Finally, the terrier managed to escape and disappeared, running towards the horizon. Now this little episode created a lot of talk in town, because Airedale Terriers were considered tough dogs, and one being attacked by a dog half his size became a small-town topic of worthwhile conversation. Unfortunately, Ed, as a businessman, didn't want to talk, so he had a muzzle made for Jocko which he wore from that day forward during walks with Jimmy. Things went well for a while afterwards, and Jocko enjoyed the rides even though he had to put up with the muzzle. But one day a giant stray, apparently descended from the Terra Nova, took the whale's appearance the wrong way and unceremoniously pounced on him. The giant dog caught its opponent helpless and almost suffocated. Of course, Jocko was completely at ease. So what if he was gagged? He was exactly happy to be in a fight. Grabbing what he could of his opponent's body with his powerful forepaws, he pushed the muzzle across his neck. The most he could take were the little bites, a bit of skin and a tuft of hair, but he held on tight and worked that small grip with all the enthusiasm he would have if he was actually accomplishing something. The big dog, meanwhile, was losing some of his enthusiasm after about five minutes of throwing his best punches at the helpless little dog, only to have Jocko exulting in all he had given and begging for more. When the big dog's confidence gave way, his tail went between his legs. He walked away a little, undecided on what to do, and in doing so, Jocko hugged him tighter with his front paws and buried his head with the muzzle around his neck, looking at everyone as if he were whispering in his ear, perhaps telling him what he was about to do. With him. The giant beast turned and ran through the city as fast as it could, with its small muzzled opponent in hot pursuit. You can imagine how that looked in the eyes of the townspeople. Here Jocko two months earlier had beaten a bully Airedale Terrier twice his size, now he's obviously spanked a dog three times his size, and he's done it with a muzzle. Half an hour later, Ed, quietly working in the store, was surprised when a customer entered the store exclaiming, Ed, you'll never believe what I just saw on the street. Dusty and the German Shepherd Readers may remember Dusty from my first book appearing in the Fancy Stories section, and a photograph of him appeared in the second book. It belonged to a man I referred to as, Pete the Plaster. In this story, Pete recorded Dusty to get some idea of his courage, as it was his desire to breed the dog, as he was very fond of him. Well, if there's anything cruel about dogfighting, it's the recovery period later on, and poor old Dusty was really hurt. It was the day after the fight, it was freezing cold outside, the ground was covered in snow, and poor old Dusty could barely walk. Peter would normally put Dusty on a leash before taking him out for a walk, 
as it was customary in those days for people to let their dogs loose, but what was the need to put a leash on poor Dusty who was in such a state of pity he could hardly walk? When they left, Pete and Dusty proceeded at a snail's pace up the steps to the backyard. Each step was a bigger obstacle for Dusty who had his injured front leg raised and was staggering on his back too. Finally, Pete carefully picked Dusty up and carried him down the steps. So intent was Pete on putting his dog gently down that he didn't notice the German shepherd in the alley behind the coal ash. But Dusty saw. As soon as his paws hit the ground, he rocketed straight towards the strange dog who had the nerve to be alive and breathing, and on his land, too. Now, Dusty was a small dog, and Shepard was an unusually large dog. The big dog got up and, as a result, batted Dusty away like he was a fly. Pete stepped back to see the small dog fall in front of him, the same small dog that only a moment before was too stiff and sore to move. But as soon as Pete reached out to grab Dusty, his arm slammed into the air, because Dusty got his paws back and lunged at the shepherd. This time he managed to penetrate the thick fur just behind the ear, but the big dog shook him out and again sent him somersaulting towards Pete. Dusty was back in a second and, simulating a head attack, he grabbed a front paw. The small dog blurred as he shook off his prey, and the big dog roared in anger and pain. At this point Pete could see the need for a sturdy pole and hurried to get one. When he returned, he found that Dusty had placed the big dog on its back. Grabbing him by the ear, Dusty dragged the shepherd in a circle. When Pete released Dusty with the pole, it was his opponent twice his size who limped away. Pete put the leash on Dusty, who continued to do somersaults like a puppy. Having taken care of business, he then ran up the steps he had to carry five minutes earlier. Moral, never trust a bulldog not to fight, regardless of its condition. Babe and the Lawnmower Biologists have noticed that the more intelligent the animals are, the more likely they are to participate in play activities. Thus, while the most primitive of animals are basically an eating and breeding mechanism, with whatever reserve time to spend on free time, for example sleeping, the most efficient and intelligent of animals are more likely to be given over to play. Indeed, the greatest advances in Homo sapiens wealth come as a byproduct of play, because science originally was strictly recreational and certainly not treated with respect simply as an intrusion into experiment to satisfy mere idle curiosity. Well, anyway, it's certainly true that play is anything but unknown in invertebrates, fish, amphibians, but in birds and mammals, particularly the latter, we begin to notice increased incidence of play activity, especially in the species generally considered to be intelligent. And, most assuredly, dogs are an example of playful and intelligent animals. Some individuals, including one of the most well-known dog trainers, will dispute the idea that dogs are intelligent, in fact, they think it's an abuse of the term when applied to any animal other than humans. Well, maybe so, but ethnologists, those scientists who have studied animal behavior to the utmost, have no qualms about referring to even some of the lowest animals as being relatively intelligent. I think it is possible to go to extremes in two directions. For example, the general public attributes dogs an almost human intelligence and motivation, whereas, contrary to certain trainers, after years of experience, they may think of dogs as merely automatons guided by inherited instincts and whatever training has been imposed on them by humans. Of most ethnologists, now, if pit bulldogs are extraordinarily intelligent dogs, 
a concept my observations tend to support. AR, so she follows that they might be more inclined to banter. And, sure enough, they seem to be. Not only are they more playful than most dogs, but they are also more serious about their play, almost as bad as humans in this respect. That is, they will go to great lengths to invent pranks and will pursue them with extraordinary vigor. Give a puppy a stick to pick up and play with, and as he grows up, he picks up logs. A pit bull puppy might start out playing with bicycle tires and end up throwing truck tires. Some examples will help to illustrate the objective further. Many years ago, a man took his pit bull puppy out to sea for a swim. As Norton, the pup, grew up, his frequent trips to the sea and his enthusiasm for him enabled him to become an excellent swimmer, unsurpassed even in water dog competitions that I saw in action. When Norton was grown, he was an absolute wonder to behold on the coast. He will jump into the sea, bite the white foam of the waves, and will soon pass the break line. Then, just to change the course of the fun, he'll splash around restlessly as if he's looking for sharks to catch. I don't know how long he was able to stay there, but his owner always had to call him. I stared at him one day for 45 minutes, his head a mere speck in the distant waters, as I talked with his owner. When Norton was finally called, his swimming speed was impressive, and leaping over the crest of the wave, he reached the shore exhausted. As most pit bull devotees will guess, Norton would catch anything you were able to throw. My own pet dog will provide another example of how a pit bull becomes completely attractive in play. In her case, she took a step forward in playing with the ball. Since no one had the patience or strength to toss the ball to her for as long as she would like, she had long since learned to play lone ball. The game consisted of squeezing the ball very hard between her paws until it bounced across the room. She would then wait a moment to see if someone would pick it up and throw it back to her or not. If not, she would quickly catch the ball herself. Another game she invented was her own version of the steal the bacon game. She leaves the ball conspicuously in the room and retreats halfway down the hall and lies down, all the while keeping an eye on the ball and for us suspiciously. If nobody makes a move for the ball, it retreats further down the hall to give us one more chance. If someone makes a move for the ball, she charges for it and usually wins the race. She has developed so many variations to her ball game that they are numerous and very complex. To count them. In a word, pit bulls are toy dogs and will often surprise their owners with what they can do. Many pit bulls are seduced by mechanisms that move and or make noises. Thus, lawn mowers, electric or manual, are often the object of a pit bull's attention. My old Wallace's bad red was a dog attracted to lawn mowers. I had to chain it close to a side wall while I used the mower. I once got really close to it with a push mower, and red grabbed one of the wheels, lifted the heavy trimmer completely off the ground, and put it down with such force that it broke one of the iron wheels. And I almost had to use a stick to get the cutter away from him. In the same vein is the tale of the Peterbilt broodmare, Babe. As Babe's owner pointed out when he told me his story, most people who aren't familiar with these dogs are in awe of their capabilities. The incident took place at the time when Perry, Babe's owner, was renting a house and some properties. His dogs were tethered to cables with pulleys and will axles in a lot adjacent to the house. The lot owner was talking to Perry about using his new tractor-type lawn mower to cut the tall grass on the lot, 
and he wanted to know if he could safely work around the dogs. Perry assured that none of his dogs would bite anyone and only asked that the lawnmower be handled with care to avoid the engine causing any damage to them, skipping rocks or branches and so on. Convinced enough, Perry found out about a week later that the entire lot had been changed and cleaned. He noticed, however, that there was an area close to Babe that was poorly mown, but since the owner of the land was known to drink quite a bit, Perry attributed it to that. Later when he saw the man complimented him on his fine work. And he says. But that black bitch over there nearly took my leg off. I was just mowing around the area next to her, and the next thing I know she grabbed the mower by the rear wheel and dragged it towards her sideways. An engine weighing 200 kilos and my weight on top of that, and the little bitch dragging us aside. I was lucky to get out alive. Perry sweated to explain that Babe was after the lawnmower and not him. Fortunately, the driver of the lawnmower was able to pull off some dexterous maneuvers and get out of the dog's reach. Not to mention what she would have done to the lawnmower. The dog in the tree and the cat in the alley. Earlier I referred to the fact that there is a higher percentage of dogs that climb trees in our breed than in others. Some time ago in my city, an expert in martial arts and bodybuilding caught pit bull fever. Since he owned a gym, he influenced a number of other karate fighters and weightlifters, and thus there was a huge contingent of them who had pit bull dogs. And one of them ended up with a tree climber. If you've never owned a tree climber, they're a little difficult to handle. Somehow it doesn't seem right to see a dog up there in a tree. This dog, Chip, seemed to climb trees simply because he had a better view. Chip was kept in a yard surrounded by tall wooden fences, and he was certainly curious about what lay behind them. The first time Bill, Chip's owner, saw the dog in the tree, he was blown away. He was even more astonished to see the dog right at the top of the biggest tree in the yard. Chip apparently figured it was time for Bill to get home from work, so he climbed to the top of the tree to see over the house when Bill arrived. The only problem was, Bill was so stunned to see Chip so tall, he almost drove the car into the garage door. Although Bill eventually got used to seeing the animal in the tree all the time, visitors and neighbors alike had a hard time believing it with their own eyes. One of the branches of the huge tree swayed over the alley, and Chip used it to control the cats that loitered there among the garbage cans. We can only imagine the reaction of several cats to discovering a malevolent-eyed dog looking down at them from a tree branch twenty feet above them. One afternoon, however, Bill was talking to a friend in the alley when their conversation was interrupted by a high-pitched screech from a cat. A few feet away from them, there stood a cat, its tiger fur bristling, as it looked with defiance and terror at Chip on the branch high above. Well, said Bill's friend, I never thought I'd see a pit bull in trouble over a kitten. This world is a comedy for those who think, a tragedy for those who feel. Horace Walpole Experiences written by me, and some by other authors as well, that appeared in the last two years in the Sporting Dog Journal or the American Pit Bull Terrier Gazette, formerly called the American Pit Bull Gazette, and still called out of habit have been included in this chapter. In this collage of articles the impression of events over the last few years and the concern of creators in general can be seen. I've tried to include a variety of scenarios under the different aspects of the race, but I hate the overuse of others' writings, even though there are many quality articles I would be happy to include. I thought I'd include a few articles with opinions that would be at odds with mine, but I felt that doing so might be confusing for new creators, 
so most of what appears here is writing that's in line with what I think. But, to be honest, my positions are much more considerable in the habit of speaking of the general opinion of pit bull breeders. The reader will note that my dedication to this book includes, to the memory of Harvey Greenwood. I have good reason for including this dedication. First of all, the Greenwoods are good friends and good people. Their children, almost all grown up by now, are charming, forgiving, and thoughtful, everything you would want your offspring to be. All of this was not an accident, as Ralph and Renee are good, responsible parents, and they are family-based. This made Harvey's tragic death that much harder to accept. I originally planned to write a section about Harvey myself for this book as an explanation of the dedication, but I believe it could not be half as eloquent as the following article written by the Greenwoods themselves shortly after Harvey's death. He was a dog lover. All your life. Harvey Eugene Greenwood. Born March 4, 1961, died October 25, 1981. The Greenwood Family. Pit Bull Gazette, November 1981. Harvey loved life and lived it to the fullest. He loved children and his patience with them brought out the best in them. Several times the neighboring children would look for him to come out and play with them, even though he was a man. He loved a dog, any dog, and they played an important part in both his life and his death. Many times we would wake him up to go to school or work and find that he had gone to the kennel and brought some stray that was whining for love and attention. I'll never forget the night her chosen bed partner was an attack-trained CIA Doberman named Saber. As soon as I struck dawn that morning, Saber responded like a trained dog and only a hasty slam of the door between us and a command down with Saber. Calmed my nervous stomach. Harvey was excellent when dealing with any dog in or out of the ring. Whatever the dog's constitution, he treated it with love and compassion at the grooming place or in the kennel, demonstrating a dog, or in a drastic situation, with a cool head and a steady hand. He made it look easy. But it was Pit Bulldog that was special to him. He cleaned up a lot of dog messes like Jimmy Boots, Clem, C.H. Cobra, Doty Patch, Oki, Davis, and Black Sabbath, the latter two belonging to Maloney who proved to be be a problem for him in a Utah showing. He marched many miles, running alongside them, his physical strength matching the dogs. When the accident occurred, it was an injured dog that became the focus of Harvey's attention. He was taking care of a dog that had been injured that night. When he awoke in the early hours of the morning to see the dog again, a strong fire spewed violently from the bathroom and blocked the way to the door. He forced his way through and kicked the door open, but an afterthought about the dog made him hesitate more than he'd realized and the toxic smoke was too much for him. He managed to throw the dog out the door, but it landed a few feet away. And so it was that both in his death and in his life, dogs played an important part in his life. His life was short but full. He was loved and in return he loved. When thoughts of him wander to the dogs you love, remember Harvey and his smiling face. We will always love you, Harvey. Our hearts are broken. A Loaded Gun Richard Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, February 1980 a total buzz was caused in my town when a local veterinarian advised a customer that when he purchased his pit bull puppy, he had in effect purchased a loaded gun that could go off at any time, probably when he least expected it. Well, a mix of bull terrier, staff, Stafford, and pit bull devotees were all now ready to lynch the good doctor and run him out of town. 
Everyone was angry because they thought the vet was saying the pit bull was a wayward and unreliable dog. Since I knew the vet personally, I was pretty sure he meant no such thing, and I was right. All he was doing was warning his client to be careful with his dog around other dogs. I haven't discussed such a warning because I've always been stressed about the same thing. As a dog lover, it pains me deeply to see a pit bull go into battle with a stray, for example, not a pit bull. The mutt may start out full of confidence, but he soon becomes a beaten and terrified animal. No one can make a legitimate claim about the pit bull's congenital propensity to fight as long as its owners are responsible people and keep the dog confined or on a chain. As I've said before several times, this is the law for all dogs anyway. Our veterinarian was aware that many pit bulls will get along with other dogs, but he didn't want his client to be misled into letting his dog run free. The problem is that the urge to fight comes on in different pit bulls at different ages and when it does come, it can come on so suddenly and without warning. However, the pit bull with people has the most dependent and stable disposition of all dogs. In fact, I don't know of any other breed that can be severely injured, hit by a car, for example, and still be handled without fear of being bitten by it. It would be unrealistic, however, to say that no pit bull is a danger to any human. First, some of our dogs are attack trained by people who want to use them as guard dogs. Second, as with all races, there will be some who are misbehaving and therefore not trustworthy with humans. In such cases, let there be no mistakes, a pit bull is quite capable of fatally wounding a large, Early man. A good maxim to keep in mind is this, a pit bull is less likely to attack a human than probably any other dog, but if he does attack he is infinitely more dangerous. So let's not be disillusioned by serious newspaper reports of pit bulls attacking people. I checked many of these reports, and it usually turned out that it was not a pit bull at all. But none of them fooled us that such attacks never took place. Like Dr. Leon Whitney once pointed out, dogs of nearly every breed have been involved in attacks on people, many of them fatal, especially when the dogs are in packs. I well remember that a few years ago, three small Pekingese killed a baby. For some reason, even though the pit bull is not on the list of breeds that have bitten people the most, when a pit bull attack happens, the news is on the front page of the news, and the attitude is always, it seems, that the breed is created to be bad. In the wake of such publicity in Florida, some stunned lawmakers are currently proposing to ban procreation. There is an underlined lesson for us here. Never tolerate a pit bull that doesn't like humans. And this is not typical of the breed. Unfortunately, some of my good friends seem to consider their own pit bulls who don't like humans to be protectors. I'm thinking of one colleague in particular, who just became a halfback for one of the best teams in the National Football League. I did everything but punch him in the nose, but I'm not that stupid. To make him understand. Pit bulls are not Doberman pinchers. They're too formidable to let them stay like that. So, my friends, whatever it hurts, let's put you to sleep. They may be rare, but it only takes one attack from one to generate unbelievable publicity and, in effect, deliver a loaded gun to enemies of the race. Teaching a pit breed dog. Richard F. Stratton Sporting Dog Journal, January-February 1981 Oddly enough, the humanists, with their fanciful stories about training pit dogs using kittens, and small dogs as lures to taste the blood, probably caused more about cruelty than any other type of propaganda produced. 
There are more people on the periphery in the pit dog fraternity who apparently take this nonsense to heart and react accordingly. The stories thus become self-sufficient, at least to some extent. Recognizing that there are some newbies who subscribe to this journal, I would like, as a dog and cat lover, to describe the proper training of a young pit dog. To begin with, it must be understood that young pit bulls reach maturity in many ways and at different stages. Some are furious and will fight other pups at just a few weeks old. Others only when they are a few months old will even go up to older dogs. Dogs with a more normal threshold will not show any rush to fight until around one year of age. There were other dogs that didn't start until they were three or four or even five years old. As hard as it is to believe, courage seems to have little to do with how early a young dog gets the ball rolling. Some of the greatest dogs of all time started late. But there is no doubt that many of the good ones started at a very young age. Some breeders like to settle young dogs and not do anything with them until they are at least two years old. Others allow them to start at a younger age but don't give them any hard work until they reach maturity. Most of the best breeders I've known, Wallace, Leitner, and others, used a similar method to start young dogs. It's like that. When young dogs are at an age when they may be ready to start, an older dog is selected, usually a considerable fighter but not so talented that he will frighten a young dog and possibly stop him. The dog is walked alongside the young dogs daily. Some of them will flare up and want to fight right away. Others will try to play or just act like puppies. Whatever the reaction, the older dog is not allowed to make contact with the younger dogs. This routine can take days, even weeks, and all young dogs will be kept like this until they are itching to fight. Finally, one of the more aggressively acting young dogs will be allowed a contact and given short fights, three to five minutes, right there on the spot. If the suitor performs well and seems to enjoy it, he gets a chance for a short sparring match, possibly after a couple of fights in chains. These fights should be spaced at least a month apart to allow enough time for wounds to heal. The fight in the ring should again be short, and the young dog should probably be scratched a couple of times, very close. So a good way to cheat is to get the other dog out and then let the young dog loose so that he can search the other dog on the spot, all the while being praised for a great job done. This total series of fights can be called the trust structuring stage. Gradually the fights are extended, and a variety of opponents with various fighting styles are used. This is the learning phase of training young dogs. It is during this time that he gets an opportunity to develop a style that best suits him. After this phase, the next step is testing the games, or an inferior competition, but then, that's another story. In conclusion, some breeders will laugh at such a painstaking training program, feeling that either the dog has the sense to fight or not. Others may want to avoid excessive fighting, feeling that each fight takes its toll in various ways. However, short fights give the dog more than they take away. And those who protect this system feel that every little extra tissue scar that may be incurred is well compensated for by the tips and experience that the young dog will learn. The American Pit Bull bred to fight as a family guard and defense dog. Max Coates Pit Bull Gazette, May 1981. The American Pit Bull bred for fighting is by far the largest family guard and defense dog available. We base this statement after trying German Shepherds imported from Germany, Dobermans, Rottweilers and Mastiffs from famous American breeders, Neapolitan Mastiffs from Italy, 
American Staffordshire Terriers from the American Kennel Club Champions and American Pit Bull from the United Kennel Club Collection. While all of these breeds have many qualities none have as many of these as the American Pit Bull Terrier bred to fight. The type of dog we are looking for must have the following qualities. First he has to have the intelligence to learn and do obedience work, second, he has to have a high pain tolerance to withstand rough play by young children, third he must be physically sound without any concern of dysplasia or other weakened defects, fourth he has to be courageous as this will allow him to react with courage and without fear to the full attack of an aggressive armed man, without giving up, whatever mistreatment he may suffer. While all the breeds I mentioned earlier exhibit some of these qualities only the APBT breed bred for fighting will exhibit all of them. This brings us to a difficult problem. How do you get a fight APBT race? The only way to be sure of getting such an animal is to buy it from a breeder that has these types of dogs. These types of dogs are of course fighting or fighting dogs. To preserve the APBT fighting dog one should combine or at least register these dogs and then breed those that show the best courage. This is a problem, as dog fighting is a violation of state, local, and federal laws when it comes to the interstate. Let's see what these fighting dog breeders are producing. First of all they are producing the toughest fighting dog in the canine world the APBT. Let's look at this point more closely. After visiting as many as 50 kennels owned by Rottweiler, Doberman, German Shepherd, Akita and Mastiff breeders, I have heard them all bragging about some incident where one of their dogs hit another dog or talking about their dog's fighting ability. One of the world's greatest Rottweiler breeders lives near me in Chesapeake, Virginia and boasts that her dogs are the toughest biting dogs in the world and that no dog can resist her big, bad Rottweilers. In the Akita kennel I visited, the woman who owned it boasted about the fighting ability of her Akitas and how they were used in Japan for this purpose. She then went on to say that anyone who owned one would have the meanest dog around. Dog World magazine even wrote an article about an Akita that beat up a pit bull, must have been an American Staffordshire. These same people who brag about how tough their dogs are with other dogs, cringe when an APBT dogfight is mentioned. Well, what I'm saying, no matter what kind of dog you own, especially those who own guard or working dog breeds, they all want the toughest dog around whether he admits it or not. If my dog were to get into a fight I by God wouldn't want him to lose or get beaten up, so why not own a dog who if he gets into a fight will not only win but will certainly be less seriously hurt. The APBT's fighting breed is this type of dog. These fighting APBT breed dogs can be encouraged to tolerate and avoid fighting with other dogs. A good example of a fighting breed dog that is good with other dogs is my newest dog, C.H. Peturbuilt. For those of you who don't know him let me explain that he is a champion fighter and a five-time winner. Well, guess who's old Peturbuilt's best mate? None other than our four-year-old attack-trained German Shepherd, Cornbread. These two dogs did not grow up together as we just acquired Peturbuilt. This goes so far as to undermine the APBT's theory that the fighting breeds are crazy killers and will annihilate other dogs after they taste blood. In addition to producing the bravest fighting dog, let's see what else we can get when we create a fighting dog. First, we will have an intelligent dog that listens to its owner's voice and is responsive to it. This is important when fighting, as a good fighting dog should be responsive to its owner's voice of encouragement when in combat. Just think about it for a moment. 
If a dog in the middle of combat is responsive to his owner's voice, just think how responsive he will be to his owner's voice in simple obedience tasks. This responsiveness will allow you to train it more quickly and efficiently for any task. Second, the fighting dog has the highest pain tolerance of any animal in the world. When fighting they can withstand tremendous amounts of pain without so much as a whimper. It is this quality that makes him the dog best dog in the world for small children. While the pulling of the ears or a poke in the eye given by a child will cause great pain to another breed that is not predisposed to pain, an APBT fighting dog will take it lightly simply because it doesn't hurt that much. Third, a fighting dog is physically healthy. If he had poor bone formation, hip dysplasia or weakness in muscle tissue, he certainly would not have been used for fighting and thus would not have been included in any breeding program. When purchasing this type of dog you can be assured of getting a physically healthy dog. The same cannot be said for the other activity breeds, as hip dysplasia and other physical problems have excessive problems. The last and most important aspect of the breed is courage. Courage is the willingness to endure punishment and never give up the fight. Any fighting dog breeder will breed their best fighting dogs. Because if a dog abandons a fight, even if he is winning, he will be declared the loser and in this way you have lost the fight. Now one can see the importance of breeding hunting dogs to fight dogs. Courage is also a highly desirable trait for a guard and defense dog. While any of the aforementioned breeds can stop close to 90% of aggressive intruders, what about the other 10% of these attackers? They include people who aren't afraid of dogs and feel confident enough in their own physical abilities to beat up an aggressive dog. There is a need for a dog that will not give up no matter how badly he is hurt. When we look at the desirable qualities we want in a guard and defense dog they all point towards the fighting APBT breed. There are several versions of this dog. There is the AKC Staffordshire Terrier, which was the same breed but through selective breeding solely for conformation, they almost eliminated the qualities desired in a fighting dog and thus those necessary for the first class family guard and defense dog. Then we have another breed known as the UKC American Pit Bull Terrier Pet and Show Type. He was bred with American Staffordshire Terrier blood and or not bred to or from the fight bloodline for several generations. It is also being bred for conformation and in some cases for Schutzhund work. While this is fine, it will still not truly test the dog's physical condition, pain tolerance, or courage. While this is probably a better choice than the AKC Staffordshire Terrier, it is still far less desirable than the fighting American Pit Bull Terrier breed. While many people are criticizing the breeders of the fighting APBT breed and the dogs themselves, I would like to congratulate them for producing the most magnificent dog in the world. As it is now, its life may be shortened or its quality diminished by humanists who would rather destroy it than take time to learn more about them and their many productive uses. Japanese Tosa Dogs Sword Dancer Pitbull Gazette, May 1981 The interest of APBT breeders in the Tosa is because he is an intelligent, powerful, and relatively courageous dog. It is a species of the Mastiff breed, which is a descendant of the Molossos. He was a great warrior dog and known to the Egyptians. It is designed in the sculptures on its walls called friezes. For this reason, so are the fast dogs of the greyhound type. And there are Assyrian friezes which tend to support Richard Stratton's belief that the Japanese Tosa has long been a distinct breed. Although Tosas are adaptable and serve as watchdogs and companions, 
They are most famously known for being primarily native Japanese fighting dogs, who prefer the word Nipponese. The weight range of the Tosas is from 45 kilos for the little one up to almost double. They resemble the first bull mastiffs that were developed in England, but they are much less pouty. Tosas are valuable and they get better bed and board and medical care than most pit bulls. Their diet consists mostly of sea proteins, cooked with cereals and seaweed. Sea protein includes fish, squid, and clam chowder broth. Meat bones are not customarily supplied to them. Their training differs from the Anglo-American method. It includes simulated combat between carefully muzzled dogs. This is considered more vigorous than walking in the park. Tosa dog competitions take experience into account, so weight is not the only consideration. These competitions involve oriental ceremonies that are carefully observed. They are not applicable in tournaments involving a Tosa and some other race. A tournament between two Tosas usually ends when one combatant decides he is losing. He then quickly leaves the arena. The winner does not chase him. The loser is considered under the same example as a boxer when his trainer throws in the towel. The boxer is identified as a loser, but he is not exiled from the country, and there is always the expectation that he can try again on another date. Before dismissing a Tosa dog ritual, it's worth noting that courage comes in many forms. There are individuals who will fight in a bar, with many opponents, but have no interest in fighting in a ring for money. There are bikers who will ride their Harley Davidson recklessly over a cliff but won't quit the job they hate. There are dogs that are afraid of men but not at all afraid of other dogs, and so on. In competitions between a TOSA and an APBT, the ceremonial rules do not apply. Arrangements are tailor-made. The most predictable element is a practical function of time. Most TOSA's wins come between 15 to 18 minutes. They tend to lose the competition if the time exceeds this duration. The History of the Dog Louis Lutz, LMU Professor of Biology. Pitbull Gazette, February 1982. It is difficult to make a positive statement about the origin of the domestic dog, Canis familiaris, family dog. Dogs have a unique basic structure but can change greatly in appearance. Under the hands of man, the domestic dog has moved far from its ancestor of earlier origin. There is convincing evidence from fossils that carnivores, meat eaters, of many widely different types arose with certain others from a common ancestor during the Paleocene era, see geological time graph. Modern carnivores are relatively difficult to characterize. Certain features, however, seem to remain the same such as the number of incisors and well-developed canine teeth. The current missing branch of the different carnivores can be said to have started in the Oligocene period, C graph, but the line can be traced back through the carnivorous-type canine or dogs of the late Eocene era, C graph, to the carnivorous type of the weasel in the Paleocene era, all the way back to the credonto insectivore type which includes both meat-eating animals and insects than so many other animals originated. Until their extinction during the Paleocene, creodonts were the predominant carnivores. From the creodonts came what are known as the actoid carnivores, which were small animals primitive in structure with low skulls, small brains, and a complete set of teeth. The canine teeth, good for cutting close, were not yet developed. The limbs and body were long and slender with a long tail. The four limbs usually ended in five toes and they walked with the soles of their feet fully touching the ground. The first true physipeds, animals with feet apart, 
appeared in the Paleocene era, possibly from the Artoides carnivores. Thysipeds expanded during the Oligocene era. In contrast to creodonts, weasels appeared to have a larger, more developed brain and true canine teeth that were located further forward in the head. These features are exactly typical of fissipeds, and for this reason weasels are considered to be the most primitive fissipeds. The small, meat-eating weasel lived in the forest, preying on small animals that lived in dense undergrowth or in trees. Weasels and their relatives were the direct ancestors of modern carnivores or meat-eaters. The ancient artoid carnivores were like their ancestors, weasels in that they were probably forest dwellers who hunted small game that they could catch in the woods and trees. Two carnivorous animals, Cynodictus, found in the Eocene era, and Hesperocene, found later in the Oligocene era, were among the earliest canines. Although they still had many characteristics of their weasel ancestors, they did show certain aspects that would characterize them as dogs or canines. They showed some length in their legs and feet and the canines were more like blades than they are in weasels. From the Hesperocean, various stages of canine development later took place. In the Miocene era, C. Graf, were the carnivorous Cynodictus, followed by Tamarctus, found in the Pliocene era, C. Graf, and finally to modern dogs like Canis from the Pleistocene, C. Graf, and recent times. This sequence represents the main line of dog evolution. Man and dog have lived together and worked together since the Neolithic era. The variety of modern dog species is proof of how they can change genetically and the explanation of how they differed in appearance from their canine ancestors. However, certain basic primitive structures remained unchanged. Geological periods covering the development of carnivores and other animals. How to breed, train, and obtain an APBT for the purpose of a guard dog and family defense, and other short stories. Max Coates. Pit Bull Gazette, May 1980. Before getting started on how to train an APBT, let me first describe the type of situation my training method serves. Bear in mind that this method is not as good when compared to the work a trained professional will do if he takes your dog to be trained for you. This should, however, be good enough for most novices to do at home without damaging their dog or spending a fortune to have him trained. The situation that is most common for an owner of an APBT fighting breed is that the owner usually has a family and lives in a community, keeps the dog in his home and has an average number of visitors there. Fine person you described as a typical APBT owner to me, aren't you Mr. Humane Society? He needs a dog that will obey simple commands, be wonderful with the kids, know when it's right to fight and of course will stop an aggressor in his lane if need be. What he doesn't need is a dog that will litter the house with his needs, destroy the furniture, eat his neighbor's doberman, let him be released to relieve himself in his yard, or bite his daughter's boyfriend, even he deserves it. First of all, selection is important. Refer to my previous article on why you should insist on getting a fighting PBTA. You should visit anyone who has experience with fighting dogs that have been successful and were bred to be that way. Avoid kennels whose owners brag about how their dogs beat five German shepherds or six Akitas but never found a notable specimen other than their own breeding. Also avoid kennels whose fame about dogs is sustained by having good dogs for their grandparents. Spend time verifying that your prospective pup's parents did more than eat, sleep, and have sex. Now you can make a smart selection based on the following. When visiting a kennel, see how your puppy's parents react to you when you go to them with their owner. 
What I like to see a dog do is accept me and be friendly as it should be obvious to the dog that its owner has accepted me and a good dog should follow this process. Ask the owner if you can meet them yourself. A good dog should react by either barking or raising hell. Any reaction between these two will be acceptable. They shouldn't run into their doghouse and pray for help. It should be noted that some dogs are shy because of mistreatment or lack of socialization and they will not always pass this trait on to their offspring. Your puppy's parents should be impressive in appearance. By that I mean they must conform to ADBA, American Association of Dog Breeders, standards. The reason for this is simple. One of the biggest advantages to owning a dog is for a psychological deterrent to any potential troublemakers. If he comes across as tough then most people won't stand up to him. But if he looks like a cross between a mutt and a greyhound then the person might test him because he looks like a softy. As for the size, I really don't see any difference it makes to his power. The only advantage size has is deterring an attacker by its appearance. It seems that the bigger the dog is, the less the attacker attempts to attack him. Poppy, our lean and chiseled 40 kilo female could go through a man like a knife through butter, but then so could CH Roxy or CH Mama Sean and both females are only half that size. I guess this could be like a choice of getting shot by a 357 or 44 Magnum. One is bigger, but both will kill you. If you can find bigger dogs that are bred to fight and have the space to keep a big dog then I'll stick with one of those as long as he's less likely to prove his punch. But then again, I've never had an offer from any of the crazies I know to fight a few rounds with Roxy either. When selecting your puppy from a litter, take the boldest acting and most salient of the bunch. A simple test to do is to take a puppy that you like from the litter and place it in an unfamiliar place. If he walks around and still acts bold you've got a good pup there. For those who want a more detailed test, ATTS has a number of tests that can help you. Now that you've got your puppy, the most important thing to do is spend time with him and start training him to do his business outside, not to chew furniture, etc. Don't be afraid to talk to him a lot or take him everywhere you go. Those who know my female Katie understand how the attention she received as a little girl helped her in many situations. To educate him try the following ideas. Buy a large, airy kennel and line it with newspapers. This will leave him confined while you are away or unable to supervise him properly. Always let him outside when you go out, after eating, and as soon as you get home. Take some sheets of dirty newspaper and place them on top of the clean ones and leave them at the door and put some outside. When he's running wild and has to do his business he'll probably do it wherever his scent is. That is, of course, on the doorstep. When you see him or hear that he's at the door, let him out. Soon you will be able to take the newspaper from the door, as long as he is in the habit of going there to ask to leave. In the event of an accident on your carpet, Clean it thoroughly with a urine neutralizer to eliminate any odors. If you follow these steps you have already accomplished a lot in training your puppy. For toys, I give a tough, hard rubber ball. Never give away old shoes, as most puppies cannot tell the difference between an old shoe and a new one. Now that he's educated his next step is to start obedience training. Buy a good book on obedience training or take your pup to an obedience class when he's 6 to 8 months old, if he's still sociable and not ready to fight. The class will most likely be sponsored by the local humane society, so a word of wisdom is not to tell them he is an APBT. Tell them he's a staff, or a mixed race. 
I know of some classes here in Virginia that don't allow APBT and even if they do you will be subject to instructor bias. Besides, you might get in trouble with some of the simpletons, who would want to put a Siberian husky to fight with their pit bull while he gives them a lecture on how cruel dogfighting is. If his dog beats your dog in a fight, and you live in California, then get an order for your arrest with a dog fighting charge and also one for the Humane Society instructor on a charge of promoting fighting. Just think about how they will and you will be able to figure out a way to accuse you. But chances are, if you don't tell them he's an APBT, you won't have any problems. When you're spending time with your puppy, always use positive reinforcement for feats well done. Never call him out and then punish him, as he will link coming to you with the punishment. Always go to him and verbally scold him. If you've spent a lot of time with him, he'll know by the tone of his voice that he screwed up. Once your puppy knows his name, is well socialized, polite and obedience trained, you can now move on to the next phase. That is, conditioning him to be a guardian of you and your family without being a source of bad publicity or legal trouble. Getting started is relatively easy. When you hear someone at the door, say in a surprised voice, what's that pup, what's that? If the pup barks, give him plenty of praise, then put him in the back room and allow your visitor inside. Then bring back your pup and tell him, it's all right pup, and let the visitor pet him. Always do this and he will soon know that no one except family members can come and go through the door. And second, when you accept someone, he has to accept you too. The key again is his tone of voice. Never allow anyone to turn their back on him or tempt him to see if he bites. The only thing you can have is either a broken dog or a broken person. Repetition, consistency, and time spent with your puppy are keys to getting the most out of your puppy. If you plan on doing a reheated version of this method, then you will fail and are better off getting your pup out there on a chain, or better yet, not having one at all. My ideas may sound simple, but if you try you will find results that are more than satisfactory. If your drive drives you to do more, then put your energy into obedience training. Any agitation made by a novice or dog owner, this is a very bad idea, can turn your well-behaved fighting dog into the creature the Humane Society writes about in their propaganda-filled newsletters they send out to earn money. These ideas should allow a novice to have a dog that will be everything a man could ask for. After all, your dog is 100% a tried and true American pit bull terrier. The Nature of the Animal Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, August 1981 A pit bull is a killing machine with a trigger that responds to the slightest pressure, and you never know what will make it fire. I watched with surprise as one person said these words, for the person who was speaking was not simply a humanist bent on exterminating the bulldog race. No, he was an experienced and respected breeder, and more than that, I understood that there was only a grain of truth in what he was saying, hardly any, of course, but enough to lend legitimacy to his comment. Later, I received at least a few complaints from some breeders who said that I overreacted in saying that they are gentle and trustworthy dogs with respect to their attitudes towards people. On the other hand, I have heard from Europeans that they are disappointed with the dogs they have imported, apparently because they were not aggressive towards humans. Those breeders in Europe and Asia and new breeders in this country may be interested in knowing the true nature of the breed. To really understand our race, it is necessary to understand that in all races there is a certain variation in temperament. Many people will be surprised to learn that a fair percentage of pit bulldogs are mildly shy, sometimes very shy, around people. 
And that includes dogfight winners, dogs that were real dynamos in the dogfight. Circe Jeff, Art, Tonka, and Peterbilt were examples of good fighting dogs that were somewhat shy. Now, some owners are embarrassed by such dogs, feeling that they reflect unfavorably on the breed. Even fighting dog breeders are inclined to favor salient dogs over timid ones. I, too, have apprehension about shyness, as I have this image of bulldogs with fierce and firm temperaments. I think this image is mostly correct. Nevertheless, I did a Peterbilt cross and I intend to do a Tonka one eventually. The quality of the dogs is too great to ignore, and fortunately, they don't seem to produce a preponderance of shy dogs. On the other side of the spectrum are bulldogs, the ancients called them screwballs and usually euthanized them, that will attack people. In such a dog, my friends, we really have a real dangerous animal. These dogs are not only perfectly capable of killing a man, but they can also have the nerve to eat him too. Some of these matadors are good fighting dogs, Bully Sun and Pit General would be examples of this. However, they are in the minority, being far outnumbered by the occasional timid dog in the ring. The ancients believed that man-biters were prognosticated as non-fighting or mutts. I don't believe it, but I do think a people-biter fighting dog is a rare commodity. I've never owned even one in all the years I've bred dogs. Among them, we have the typical bulldog, easygoing and kind to people but mean to other dogs. Most of them are very nervous around other dogs. At dog shows they can be seen absolutely unruly among themselves. However, their handlers are able to place their hands inside the mouths of these impetuous demons and lift their lips so that the judge can see what the tooth structure looks like without any fear of being bitten. Because the typical bulldog is a good guard dog, I always say that they are not natural guard dogs as they are always barking and suspicious of strangers. However, they can be trained to guard and are trained to attack in which case they invariably make other races look pitiful in comparison. To add. 1. There is a small percentage of bulldogs that will bite people. Some are aggressive and not likely to make a sustained attack. Others are not afraid of humans and, in fact, are extremely dangerous to them. Fortunately, Bulldogs in this category are extremely rare. Unfortunately, some newbies are inclined to ignore this feature or even build for it. To be honest, even I wouldn't have the heart to kill a dog of the quality of Bully Sun or Pit General, however, I am generally in favor of euthanizing pit bulls that dislike people. 2. An even higher percentage of bulldogs are shy of people, and sometimes, but not always, shy of noise as well, such as squeaks or gunshots. These dogs are normally fearless with other dogs and are often quarrelsome. Although these dogs are often very intelligent, it's hard not to develop a special rapport with them. However, there are two reasons to avoid this trait, except in the case of excellent individuals. One is for the sake of the dogs, as it must not be nice to be painfully shy. The other is that the trait doesn't fit the mystique of the pit bull. Three, so we are left with the vast majority of bulldogs who are completely friendly with people and pose no danger to them. Apple of Discord Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, February 1982 like most of you, I read my gazette cover to cover, and I usually find articles interesting and provocative. Occasionally, a letter or article contains something I disagree with, but I usually don't care, as they are normally matters of little consequence, and after all, there is room for diversity of opinion. Indeed, 
such diversity stimulates thought and even study and research. However, in the latest issue of the Gazette, there were some items that either reflect very poorly on the breed or will mislead novices. For this reason, I'd like to take some time to talk about this particular bone of contention. First, Mr. Well David in the viewpoint section bemoans the breed's present popularity and blames it on the rumors. Well, I have to admit that I prefer the days when race was unknown and not the subject of continual sensationalist presentations through the electronic and print news media. I would never have written my two books on the APBT if the cat hadn't been out of the bag, so to speak. But it was inevitable that the pit bull would become popular in these turbulent times. Simply pick up any dog show magazine, and you will find that the breeds that are featured are the Rottweiler, Doberman, Great Dane, etc. People who own these dogs are really looking for a pit bull, but they never knew anything about them until recently. Mr. David makes the mistake of putting all the cats in the bag. While it is true that some sellers have been detrimental to the breed, so too have some breeders of fighting dogs. I really resent the characterization of Mr. David of John P. Colby, as he was an honest breeder and an asset to the breed. And Mr. David is far from principled when he concludes that those who put their reputations on the line to defend the APBT are doing so for their own benefit. Sandra Keller has never in her life sold a dog, and those who know me know that I don't normally sell dogs. But anyway, there are many breeders who sell dogs on a regular basis to the general public who are assets to the breed. I admit that I belong to the school which is inclined to regard the general race of dog sellers with suspicion, but I am not so stupid as to paint them all with a single brush or blame the publicity aimed at the actions of the humanists on them. Finally, any man would be a fool to try to make money from any breed of dog. Some have succeeded, but frankly speaking, it's a bad proposition. There is a lot of amateur competition, and dogs are like rabbits in that they breed so prolifically that they can fill any demand in a relatively short time. So let's not be quick to condemn the motives of others aimed at profit. In another letter, Mr. R.M. Ank made a case for the breeder's infusion of outside blood into the breed, utilizing Armitage's assessment of the first fight he had ever seen. In that fight, a half pit bull and half Boston Terrier defeated a pure pit bull. What did Mr. What Ank didn't say is that, according to Armitage, this same dog was thrown in the towel in his next fight over a pure pit bull. As I said before several times, there were undoubtedly other races crossed with other races, but they were very rare because the profound courage was always lost. Where does everyone think the word, mutt, came from? In any case, the APBT is pure and not weak, perhaps more so than any other breed of dog. Finally, I'd like to make a few comments about Vince Cooper's provocative idea article. I don't know Mr. Cooper, but his article shows him to be a very perceptive man. I will turn my nose up though at his article that most pit bulls are not brave, even though I know what he means. Truly, most pit bulls are not courageous enough to die, but I prefer to think in degrees of courage. If it were possible to test the mettle of all the races individually, we would theoretically end up with a nice bell-shaped bend for each race. There is no way of knowing for sure, of course, as there is no way of experiencing such a study, however, I think the average courage of other breeds is light years from that of the pit bull. Also, novices should be aware that the Doberman that Mr. Cooper wrote is one of those excellent exceptions to the rule. 
Dogs of other breeds that can beat the pit bull in its own fight are rare, and even these excellent exceptions usually go down quickly when competing with good dogs. While I agree with Mr. Cooper that courage does not equate to intelligence, however, I think there was a selection process for intelligence in the ring because, all else being equal, intelligence was a definite asset, I most certainly do not like the statement that dogs fighting skills range from intelligent to stupid in combat. It may not be rational, but it's not stupidity. A dog's instinct is not simply related to intelligence. Thus, it is not rational for a retriever to signal the game, for a retriever to become so obsessed with catching game, or for a bloodhound to track when given the signal but it is not stupid either. It is simply a powerful instinct not linked to intelligence. To get the point across, let's consider the sexual attitude in humans. Now, is this rational? No, it gets us into all sorts of trouble. But intelligent men are not less affected than fools. A few fighting dogs are really little babies when being examined by the veterinarian, but as a breed, they have a courage that allows them to even cooperate in his treatment. More than any other race, they seem to realize that we humans are trying to help them. Most veterinarians are especially fond of pit bulls precisely because of this particularity and because they are usually not afraid of being bitten by their patient, if he is a pit bull. While most pit bulls are not naturally aggressive towards people and are not inclined to bark, they are psychologically intimidating to would-be intruders because of their imposing appearance. I have also observed that the pit bull that has been trained for Schutz hunt work without fail exceeds all competitions in the attack phase because of the intensity of his attack and the way he literally explodes at his opponent. The challenge here is to train the dog to abort the attack on command. Finally, some fighting dogs may not be interested in fighting other animals, but a sizable proportion may be, and believe me, they can be terrible, putting all other races to shame in that regard. Watching a good pit bull doing a good job on a bad bull or a wild boar is an unbelievable sight. I sincerely hope that Mr. Cooper don't be offended by my minutiae, as I enjoyed his article very much, and I wouldn't want to enjoy it. As Mr. Cooper, I can appreciate other races, too. But, also like Mr. Cooper, I have enough experience with other breeds that I cannot be satisfied with anything less than a fighting pit bull. Improving the Breed Richard F. Stratton Pitbull Gazette, August 1982 Pitbull devotees are a huge number, ranging from breeders and aficionados to a tiny number who actually compete with their animals. Without breeders, we wouldn't have dogs, without the devoted aficionados, we may not have the general public tolerance that the breed now has and without pit bull owners, we would have no way of knowing which dogs are the right dogs to breed. I get asked a lot, what I consider the best trait or the best dog to breed. I inevitably answer that it is very difficult to determine which is the best trait or the best dog. However, I will make an effort to list a few dogs that I think are good male candidates for anyone who has a good bitch and wants the best breeding. Of course, there will be many worthy dogs that will be excluded for a variety of reasons, including the fact that I honestly don't know everything about them for a variety of reasons. Some will question the advisability of selecting the male without worrying about the trait, and it's certainly true that you really do maintain better uniform results by staying within reach of one. However, a very high penalty is paid for blindly taking a trait and thus avoiding males that are candidates for best in the country status. 
Almost all dogs that are in the public stud farm are owned by people who obtain them after they have completed their careers in the ring. I have seen all but one of the dogs I am recommending, and they have all the traits that are a credit to the breed. These traits include personal characteristics such as disposition, intelligence, and charm, as well as distinguished immediate ancestors, and, of course, they all have a good fighting record which helps to ensure that we are perpetuating skill, tolerance, and courage, as well as countless desirable traits. I am being hypercritical in my selections and I have therefore left experienced dogs such as Peterbilt and Tonka off my list, even though they have an excellent record in the ring and have produced good dogs, because they are shy dogs themselves. But, to be honest, both produced a large percentage of non-shy litters. For that reason, readers should not back off these dogs simply because I haven't listed them. Another dog worthy of consideration is Sorel Preacher, as he leaves nothing to be desired. Dogs like Going Light Barney, Luke, and a legion of other greats have been left out because they are not in public breeding. In selecting a stallion, I consider the dog and its immediate ancestors. The qualities I want are courage, ability to fight, indestructibility or toughness, intelligence, stable disposition, and longevity. In other words, I expect my stallion to be a super dog in every way, including looks, but that would be a minor consideration. However, when looking for a stallion, we can afford to choose from all categories. Since I put fighting qualities first, I will be accused of breeding dogs for the purpose of fighting, but this is not a valid censure. Naturally, we want to perpetuate the essence of the breed, and if we breed for these traits, everything else, for example stable disposition, falls away. Anyway, taking it at random, here are a few selections. Obviously, only dogs that are open for breeding are listed. Henry belonging to Patrick. Henry certainly meets the requirements for longevity, as he is 14 years old and still siring young. A strong fighting dog, his parents were of equal quality. Both Henry and his father, Tater, won the classic two-hour fights over good opponents. Sooner. This dog is the classic pit bull in appearance and temperament, at least in my opinion. He apparently left nothing to be desired as a fighting dog, and his relatives weren't ineffective either, not to mention his great-grandfather, the immortal Jimmy Boots. Thor. I've never seen this dog, but I've heard a lot about him and his relatives. You couldn't pick a better pedigree, as his sire was Snooty the dog, a consummate show dog and great stud dog, and his dam was the immortal Miss Pool Hall Red, a great show dog and stud dog, and not many bitches are. Both. Pool Hall Red came from Boomerang which I have expressed my admiration for many times. Ace of Sherwood. This dog, and all the others listed, too, has a carefree disposition that I like in pit bulldogs, and he is a handsome animal descended from such greats as Red Baron, his father, and the great dog Alvin, his grandfather. Assassin. The only doubt about this dog is that he can take what he can give, as he demolished three opponents in short order, his longest fight lasted 38 minutes, and then there were no more challenges. He has since been sold and is now open for public breeding. He was sired by Hank out of Red Baby, out of Bolio, one of the greatest of all time, so his breed leaves nothing to be desired. He is calm as a rock, a beautiful dog that I would certainly consider an asset to any breeding program. Boots. This dog was bred by Hank, too, and comes from Sassy of Greenwood, who came from Jimmy Boots. This dog, 
like his father, is a big dog, but he has an absolutely mature disposition and, like all the other dogs mentioned, is an absolutely calm dog, not given to levity and annoying barking. He is a three-time champion and went beyond his two-hour mark. So there you have it, a partial list of breeders who, in addition to being great fighting dogs with all the necessary traits, have the added bonus of having all that individual pit bull quality that helps the breed to be so great that people become absolutely fanatical about her. Crocodile Tears Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, November 1981 Since so many dogs have been called alligator, or gator, and it was common practice to refer to a stormy fighting dog as an alligator, it may be instructive on at least two considerations to look more closely at near the animal that inspired such respect. And indeed, there are some similarities between that ancient reptile and our beloved race. For one thing, they were most evil out of ignorance, and both had their legends perpetuated about them, legends that persisted through thousands of years in the case of crocodiles. Sometime after 1793, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington commissioned a French botanist to explore the area west of the Mississippi River. The man turned out to be not only an excellent botanist but also a spy for the French government. However, in the course of his exploration and espionage, Michaud, the botanist, obtained a small specimen of alligator from the banks of the Mississippi River, and he preserved it and sent it back to France to his friend F.M. Dauden so that he could examine the animal and give it a scientific name. Years later, Dauden presented a two-volume work on reptiles and amphibians to the French Academy of Science and officially dubbed the alligator Crocodilus mississippiensis. To this day the alligator is known scientifically as Alligator Mississippiensis, Dauden, 1801. Note that the generic name Crocodilus was changed to alligator, by later scientists, and for that reason, Dauden's name is placed in parentheses. December 17, 1801, was the date Dauden published his work, and Mississippi was spelled with a P. There's also a Chinese alligator, but I'm afraid I've already told readers more than they'd like to know about alligators. There are several legends that were perpetuated about crocodiles and later they were applied to the alligator as it was considered a kind of crocodile by ancient explorers. One of the legends was that the alligator used its tail as an offensive weapon. Another was that you could tell females from males by the glare reflected in their eyes in the dark. There were many others, but one of the most intriguing was that crocodiles would cry on several occasions. This legend persisted for hundreds of years without any basis in fact. And the only question was the reason for the behavior. Some said they were crying because they ate a Christian. Others reported that they wept because they had no more Christians to eat. In any case, they were all taken, and the explorers added details about their travels to the legends. For example, Thomas Ashe, who explored the Mississippi in 1806, wrote, I heard sobs, sighs, tears, and groans of unexpressed agony in length. And after going into more detail about the whaling, he revealed that it was a crowd of alligators that was the source. Such nonsense, with submission repeated and recorded by a number of writers and explorers, is a graphic demonstration of how unreliable eyewitness accounts are and for that reason are generally discounted in scientific circles. It is for this reason that I disregard accounts of how the ancient bulldog was crossed with a terrier to produce our breed. There is simply too little supporting evidence, and too much evidence to dispute it. Finally, did the fighting dog breeder really have to worry about other breeders, 
as the old saying goes, cutting off the alligator's tails and bringing them into the ring? Well, not really. First, the alligator is a predator and not a fighter. Second, although crocodilians, including alligators, are unique and have a heart with four sections, other reptiles have three, their circulatory system is less efficient than that of mammals in general and certainly far less efficient than that of a bulldog. Third, if you compare an alligator that weighs the same as a bulldog, they don't look anywhere near as imposing. However, the alligator is a magnificent reptile worthy of respect and study and, yes, even worthy of naming our dogs after it. Untamed, A Little History Richard F. Stratton Pitbull Gazette, May 1980 The first time I saw Bob Wallace he was crying. Mrs. Leo Kennard I'll have a lot to say later about the recent exploitation of the American Pit Bull Terrier breed and the slander of their owners. All Bulldog owners are being subjected to Blitzkrieg, war blitz, with attacks coming from all sides. The motives behind the attacks are repugnant in nature, mostly developed to line the pockets of promoters. The geographical magazine issue of the Pit Bull quickly sold out, and the Humane Society has made so much money, I truly believe they would be saddened if the sport were annihilated. The hypocrisy of the humanists is incredible, because they should know that they will never annihilate dogfighting, and they must further be aware that their efforts are counterproductive, tending to target the most reputable people while in fact they are piquing the interest of the troublemakers. Meanwhile, with the humanists flexing their newfound muscle for the power given to them by recent legislation, the world truly took on the air of an asylum taken over by the inhabitants. These are truly times that try the soul of man. And it is a time to decide whether to stand still or fight, a time to decide whether to abandon a valiant race or resist tyranny. Personally, I would rather fight oppression than be a part of it. It is also a time to put our own house in order. Regardless, GEO managed to get a picture of a dead cat on a training machine, something I've never seen in 35 years of association with some of the best fighting dog trainers of all time. Ironically, the clowns who did this to the cat probably got the idea from those same humanists who have been spreading the ridiculous, bait, stories for decades. However, it may also be time for a break. A time to draw strength from the example of our valiant race. Time for a true story about one of the bravest competitions ever witnessed. A story of a big dog, unarmed, almost destroyed, but absolutely indomitable. The dog was Tony, note the bold-fashioned spelling acquired by Bob Wallace early in his career. Tony was a great-grandson of Circe Jeff, and when later bred to Madam Queen, a daughter of Circe Jeff, Tony sired King Cotton, an ace who, along with Tony, became a cornerstone of the Wallace lineage. Tony won previous competitions, and after this he was retired to a life of luxury as a stud. Tony won his previous competitions by heart, as he wasn't blessed with more than average talent in any category. No one ever dreamed, though, how much heart this little dog actually had. At least, not until the competition in Rulesville, Mississippi, in the 1940s. Tony competed with Slim Emerson's Ted, a giant who would later become famous in marathon competition with Curvino's Thunder. When the dogs were released, Ted immediately went to Tony's shoulder. For those who aren't aware, a broken bone is a rarity in dogfighting because fighting dogs are tough to hurt. Bob had no way of knowing that the shoulder was broken and not just temporarily incapacitated. 
Tony made no hint of this, his tail was erect and wagging, and he always managed to have support somewhere. But because of his difficulty, Ted was always ahead. Tony occasionally got a lead, but it was always short-lived, however, her enthusiasm for the fight never faltered. Finally, Ted went to Tony's other shoulder, and by that time there was no doubt that the shoulder was broken. At one hour and forty minutes, Bob caught Tony, thereby losing the competition. Overcome with emotion and worried that he had let his dog down for too long, Bob nevertheless put him down for a seemingly impossible courtesy fight. In fact, Bob just wanted to see if he was interested in trying to fight. Who could have dreamed that he actually succeeded? Slowly and awkwardly, but with an intensity and determination that lifted the crowd, Tony began his arduous journey through the ring. Inching forward, both front legs completely unusable. Tony lunged with his hind legs. Two or three times he rolled completely onto his back in order to correct his course on his opponent when his obstinate front part obstructed it. When after two minutes Tony caught up with his opponent, he had to be separated with a baton. Bob, tears streaming down his face, picked Tony up and wrapped him in a blanket. The audience stood up and applauded for ten minutes. And Bob Wallace wasn't the only one crying. Profits and Sensationalism Richard Stratton Pitbull Gazette, August 1980 Get your facts first, and then you can twist them however you like. Mark Twain A new high of hypocrisy was reached by staff members of GEO magazine when they published their articles on fighting dogs. As any casual observer knows, tabloid magazines are moneymakers. Serious magazines, many of them highly regarded, have become a rare breed, and those that remain are a compromised species, because almost all of them are in financial jeopardy. It is a sad but true comment that sensationalist periodicals may lack prestige, but they are awash in cash. GEO would like the prestige and the money, so this makes a small undercover attempt to hide their sensational motives for claiming publication of the fighting dog's story for the delight of readers. For further camouflage, magazine ads contributed money to HSUS, $1,500. In any case, if the magazine were really sincere in its crusades, it would reveal the true identities of its people rather than giving them fictitious names. Bloody and inflammatory photographs are shown to the readers and predefined ideas are exposed throughout the text because words are used that control the reader's reaction. The writers thus make it appear that the dogs hate each other, will tear each other to pieces, and will crawl across the ring on command to attack. It's hard to imagine many activities that could come well under the scrutiny of a hostile approach. Just think of the hay fever that could be made by football journalists. Bloody close-ups could be shown, and some photos could be taken at the training ground of seriously, and sometimes permanently, injured players. The comment could be inserted that total paralysis was not uncommon. Also, any photographer could catch some pretty good shots of the crowd screaming for blood. Scenes of substantial amounts of money changing hands may also be shown, and the writers may allude to the fact that those winnings were not declared. In the text, the writers could discuss how every player who tears his knee is unable to suppress terrible screams and how 400 players a year, on average, lose their lives. Of course, given their tendency to cram everything connected in the most remote milieu with the activity, writers will naturally cite statistics about all the children who are killed playing football, 
some in a dispute and even being hit by cars which they ignore because of the his desire to play football even in the streets. Taking this absurdity even further, as our writers will surely do, it will even be mentioned that football players have been known to attack and even kill people. Also, of course, brawls and murders are known to occur among the bloodthirsty mob, which is perfectly natural to understand, since we know that violence breeds violence. Prominently embedded will be the fact that prostitution and drugs are a dominant part of the football scene. Even the players use drugs, and, my God, the San Diego Charges, football team, were the focus of a drug scandal a few years ago. Yes, a really sensationalist article can be written, but it won't be, because the public knows football and likes it. They also know something about it, so reporters will have to avoid distorting the facts more than just a trifle. And that the negative facts they give will be taken into perspective and thus disregarded. Unfortunately, the public doesn't know anything about the pit bulls or the fighting in the ring, so they swallow the whole circus, everything anyone wants. Magazine with sensationalist mind or newspaper or television if you want to show. As for the Lou Grant show, American television show, the less said, the better. It wouldn't hurt so much if it weren't for the fact that this happens to be one of my favorite shows, and I'm not much of a television person. It was a sad spectacle to see the writers of a quality program being led by the nose, completely believing the facts given by cowardly humanists who couldn't stomach writing a debate about me, under any public meeting. The challenge was posed many months ago, and until now, not a single humanist has had the courage to fight. Such experts are surely a poor source of information, and it was truly a tragic sight to see the Lou Grant show sink to the level of those who place profit and sensationalism above truth and honesty. Who speaks for the animals? Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, May 1981 Contrary to the opinion of my friends who think I am too old to have living parents, I have a father who is not only alive but, at the ripe old age of 71, is also an ardent swimmer and unicycle rider. He can pull the bar and make so many stops on it that I can hardly keep count. Unlike his only son, my father was a womanizer in his current marriage to his third wife, Martha Jane has recently retired from teaching. My father, on his part, retired many years ago from his job as chief of security force at the University of Colorado, where I received one of my degrees. Since my father's third marriage lasted more than 30 years, and I lived at home for a few years after I was discharged from the military, poor Martha Jane had to put up with me like a stepchild at home. However, we got along really well, and she introduced me to some things that I still enjoy, such as opera and stories of Archie and Mehitabel. One subject we didn't agree on and still haven't discussed was pit bulldogs. My stepmother is one of the most compassionate people I've ever known, besides my wife, about animals and people, too, but especially about animals. She easily falls prey to the professional humanists who babysit people like her for financial contributions. Although she never said anything, I'm sure Martha Jane feels that I encouraged dogfighting with my articles and thereby contributed to the cruel treatment of animals. Not being totally unaware, I have mulled over this possibility to some extent. Here are my conclusions. First, I defended the breed of the pit bull terrier because I thought he was worthy of defense for his supremacy, character, courage, and intelligence. Second, I have defended dogfighting because I am impatient with the enactment of nonsense, especially outright nonsense. 
I also championed dogfighting because I knew that if the public were spoiled with stories that made dogfighting seem worse than it currently is then a push will be given for laws that will make it risky in fact for the very race. Such laws have certainly passed in some areas of the country. In other articles, I have consistently emphasized the proper treatment of animals. So do other creators, but right now I'm simply comparing myself to the humanists. I, 1, advocated proper dog housing, 2, urged that pit bulls be kept on chains and taken every precaution that they would not kill or harm other dogs of other breeds, 3, stressed that there is absolutely no reason in, bleeding, a humanistic term, a dog by the use of cats, 4, encouraged a respectful attitude toward all dogs, 5, stressed the proper treatment of a dog injured in fighting, and, 6, showed examples of great fighting dog breeders who, although they could stand to see a fighting dog take a beating in a fight, were generally sentimental about animals and quite vocal about their proper treatment. Now, conversely, Let's take a look at what some of the spokespersons for humanist organizations have done. Well, first, they made little impact on actual cruelty, either because they are unable to do so or because they run into opposition from people of influence. But dogfighting has been a big deal for them. They have almost zero opposition and have a huge amount of publicity and public response. They, 1. Preach that proper training for a fighting dog is to tempt it with a kitten in a potato sack and let it finally kill it. 2. Promulgated the falsehood that it was good for fighting dogs. Fighting dogs being bled by allowing them to kill cats and small dogs, I wonder if such sick minds would believe that some of the biggest fighting dogs won't even molest kittens or small dogs. 3 claimed that electrical appliances were good for encouraged dogs to fight, and, for, legislation sponsored by some states that requires veterinarians to report any dog they suspect may have been in a dogfight, and who knows how many dogs suffered because of APBT breeders, not dog owners. Fighting dogs, being scared to take their dogs to the vet after an accidental fight? Now, of course, the breeders of the fighting dog are not going to pay attention to the humanists, however, published nonsense may be the only source of information for certain novices. For this reason the ravings of humanists have become self-fulfilling, at least to some extent. Thus, we find that the propaganda of humanist groups is almost often counterproductive, it induces cruelty before preventing it. On the contrary, I hope that my articles have created a humane attitude in the creators who would not in all cases be there. Further, the motivation behind my articles has been strictly the love of race. Humanist organizations, however, promulgated their stories for the simple purpose of inflaming the public and soliciting funds. With these facts in mind, who really cares about the welfare of the animal? Who really speaks for the animals? Beasts. Gary J. Hammonds. Pit Bull Gazette, May 1982. Over the years, beasts have been of special interest to me since, in theory, most are not expected to be brave. Simple observation tells me that there are as many tough dogs that bite humans, as a percentage, as there are tough dogs in the pit bull family. Most veterans felt that man biters should be destroyed and most definitely never used in a breeding program. I believe that a deeper look inside these dogs would be a lucrative project. Through my research and observation, I have concluded that there are many types of people biters, each of which deserves recognition and comment. The most acceptable of people biters are those who are both protective and territorial. 
Most bulldogs have this treatment to varying degrees and the beauty of it is that it can be encouraged or discouraged depending on the owner's needs. These dogs are normally the most intelligent of bulldogs and while they are generally gentle with people, they will become a terror to the suspected intruder and literally inhale a direct threat to their owner or their property. The second most acceptable people biter is the territorial scrapyard dog. This dog happily accepts its owners but all others are not welcome in its domain. Away from his estate, he is nowhere near as aggressive except when directly challenged. These dogs are not for novices but they can be kept and are definitely a problem for dog thieves and various strays. The last acceptable type is the junkyard dog that will bite anyone at any time, just for the fun of it. Many of these dogs actually have to have their food thrown to them even by their owners. These dogs are for professionals only, and most are likely good candidates for execution. There are also excitable dogs that will bite you to get free and get another dog, cat, horse, or whatever. These dogs are definitely not for hobbyists and should be kept away from these types of situations as much as possible. Bully Sun, Andersons, C.H. Spade, and Mesquite Sam were dogs of this type. To me the most dangerous is the latent people biter that just goes bad without provocation. These dogs should always be destroyed as their unpredictable nature makes them an extremely lethal object. This recessive tendency surfaces in other breeds so why should the pit bull be any different? The percentage of malicious people biters in the pit bull family is extremely low. I believe that through the use of proper breeding methods we can lessen this. Most of the attacks that give newspapers so much coverage are usually done by stray dogs. Check the records, in most cases where a bulldog mistreats or kills someone, they are dogs that were bred by amateur breeders and usually passed down through several generations of individual frustrated breeds, most of which are equally bad breeds. So in many cases the creator is wrong in all but a few instances, human error enters into the disaster. There is a lot to be said about people biters but for the sake of good judgment everyone who owns one, just like all pit bull owners, should be very aware. Only one case of neglect can mean an anti-breed law in your area and change public support for our dogs. This is exactly what we don't need at this point. People biters, keep one if you have to, but take care of it if you do. Letter to the Gazette TSGT David L. Mills Pitbull Gazette, November 1980 Gazette I arrived here in Japan almost two months ago for a three-year tour. I'm based at an air base near Tokyo. I have been a pit bull fan for many years and I have had the privilege of owning two of them in the last two years. Soon I will ship the first one here from Louisiana and the second one in a few months. Dogs used in competitions in Japan are often called Tosa's dogs after a small town on one of the southern islands where they supposedly originated. Although I have yet to see one in person, photographs depict them as beige, mastiff-like dogs. Although competitions often take place on the island where Tosa, Japan is located, I found that driving directly 10 hours north from here is an area where competitions are popular during the winter months. The Japanese call them tournaments. I read a story about how pit bulls fought in the ring against Japanese Akita dogs and the giant Tosa and were always victorious. So far around here, I haven't found anything that indicates that an Akita is bred to be a fighting dog. I'll check on that. As for Tosa, I'm tempted to put my APBT up against any of them, 
because dogfighting is a legal and accepted sport in many areas of Japan. A friend of mine has watched some of these competitions over the last three years. He said the dogs are all different sizes and colors which makes me wonder if there aren't some pit bulls living in northern Japan. Before I left the US, I heard that some pit bulls were shipped to Japan from time to time. This brings me to why I am writing this message to people who are as enthusiastic about the breed as I am. If any PBTA breeders or enthusiasts know of any APBTs that have been shipped to Japan, I would appreciate it if you would send me a note leaving me know who, what, when and where. I'll even write back. I'm alive and eager. TSGT David L. Mills Box 2318 APO San Francisco 96328 Letter to the Gazette TSGT David L. Mills Pitbull Gazette, May 1981 From what I've read in the Gazette lately, the humanists are really hitting us pit bull admirers hard in America. I'm protected from it here in Japan, but it will affect me as much as any APBT admirers when I return to the States. We'll have to try and educate the public about our dogs, refute political opportunists, and then perhaps in the end act in secret. I know that the Gazette wisely does not publish any material that conflicts with the Animal Welfare Act 1976 and that it does not necessarily agree with letters and articles that it publishes. But since the Animal Welfare Act doesn't apply here in Japan and the Gazette doesn't have to agree with me, I would like other breeders to hear about my dog's latest exploits. Buster arrived here in Tokyo in early February after having to drop him off in Louisiana until I saved up enough to ship him. You know the military doesn't make that much money. Buster is not a special pit bull. Their ancestors include some brave and famous dogs, just like most other pit bulls. He's just a really big baby. Once in Louisiana he jumped the fence and chased the mail truck for almost an hour. Convinced that he had lost my dog to thieves, the postman finally brought him back to me and assured me that Buster would never make a good guard dog. I bought Richard Stratton's first book long before I knew I was going to Japan, but I was intrigued when he wrote about how the Mongol king fought and defeated all other dogs, including a 60-pound Tosa from Japan. Mr. Stratton didn't elaborate much on this and I got little credibility from the Mongol king, who didn't look like he weighed more than 30 kilos. At that time, the limited information given by Mr. Stratton matched my shall we say limited knowledge of our race. Before Buster arrived in Japan, I knew a Japanese man who owned a few Tosas. Through many sign language, photos, and pictures drawn on the ground, we decided that I would be shipping a pit bull to Japan. When he arrived, I was supposed to take him here and there. Mr. Togai has three large male Tosas, a 60-pound female, and a calf. Their oldest dog, 13 years old, is a three-time champion and is now used primarily as a trainer for the younger dogs. Being such an old dog, his teeth are pretty worn down, but he still has a lot of fight in him. The old warrior weighed well over 60 kilos, but Buster at 30 kilos managed to get on top of the bigger dog. Once he figured out what he was doing, I think he was super happy I was allowing him to mix it up a bit, he climbed on top and stayed there until I pulled him away. This Tosa had big folds of skin hanging from his jaw and Buster was really shaking. It wasn't hurting the old dog as much as he just lay there, sort of wishing Buster would go away. 
The next time I took Buster into town, I teamed him up with two large Tosas. Both weighed over 50 kilos. One was brought for the occasion by one of Mr. Toga. In both meetings, Buster was so much faster and appeared to be just as strong, if not the strongest, of the big dogs. All these Tosas could do everything defensively as Buster was super offensive all the time. Reminds me of some kind of happy alligator in a duck farm. Both meetings took almost 20 minutes each. The Tosas don't want this happy American pit bull anymore. I don't think the Tosa is bred for courage, if the six or seven I've seen in action are representatives of the breed. They seem to have a push-slash-pull competition, so if one makes a turn or yelps, he loses. The relatively bloodless brawl, coupled with the short duration, doesn't seem to lend itself to making a brave breed. And finally, they are not as good-looking as pit bulls. That must be the end of Buster's illustrious fighting career. He has always been a family dog and will remain so. I wish I knew really what he would do and now I do. It just goes to show that a not-so-special pit bull is happy and eager to pick up other dogs twice his size and beat them all up. So long for now from the land of the rising sun. Before I go though, I would like to recommend Mr. Stratton, The Book of the American Pit Bull Terrier. It should be required reading for everyone at the Humanist Society, lawmakers, and anyone who thinks we feed our puppies, 90 puppies and kittens to give them the lust for blood. What a joke. I welcome mail from pit bull breeders anywhere in the world. Alive and eagerly. TSGT. Dave Mills. Box 2318. APO San Francisco 96328. Conditioning. Don Carter. Sporting Dog Journal, May June 1982. I'm not an expert nor do I expect to be one when I have to feature a dog. However, some common sense rules and some established rules will often prevail. Everyone has their own trick or trick about conditioning and I don't want to open myself up for a public meeting but if anyone wants to ask me a question or two they can send them to the magazine. The first and foremost aspect of shaping the dog is to get him as healthy as possible. I don't want to get too scientific other than to say that to keep your dog breathing properly, his red blood cells that carry oxygen in his blood must be functioning well. A trip to your local vet will suffice and a complete blood test is of the utmost importance. Once this blood test is done, it will also check for heartworms, the dog then needs to be checked for heartworms. This is easily accomplished by taking fresh feces to your veterinarian. If your dog's blood is normal and the stool is negative, then the work can proceed, slowly. More if a good dog was ruined with hard work while the dog was not ready. I personally like to put a dog on a cable at least 30 meters long for 30 days minimum and 60 days if it's a very fat dog, this will help the dog to lose some weight. I have always emphasized walking the dog on a leash. I know some people will disagree but walking the dog not only helps the dog physically and emotionally but helps me solve any problems that may arise. Walking can never mistreat a dog. So after I've walked my dog the required distance, and I'll talk about that in another article, I make sure he's exhausted before putting him on the treadmill, a device that gets the dog running. At the place. I like the type that has free rotation, the type that a dog can easily pull. The work must be done with extreme care as overworking is so easy. 
What every breeder hopes to accomplish is work the dog almost to exhaustion but stop while the dog still has an interest in what he is doing. This is a key to conditioning, stopping before the dog is exhausted. If a dog doesn't start on the mat, place him on it and speak gently with encouraging words, he will eventually gain your trust and get the job done. Patience is the key here. Screaming and yelling or, even worse, hitting the dog will never accomplish anything. Start work slowly and don't be afraid to let your dog rest a day or two every week or more depending on the dog. Again, without getting too scientific, all muscles must recover and regenerate to become strong. And remember, what we're looking for is a rocked athlete, not a bunch of muscle. A good rule of thumb to follow for a dog on the treadmill, so you can see if you are hurting him or not, is to keep an eye on his tongue. If your tongue sticks out and curls at the tip and sticks out, then stop. It might be time to get him off the treadmill and walk him for 10 minutes and clean his mouth with some cool water. Basically, what I have to say might seem silly to most breeders who already know all of this, but we're so paranoid about newbies that maybe this stuff can help. Simply remember, a dog builds attitude and muscles the same way we do, extensive progression from slow paces to harder, longer-lasting workouts. Think about it, and always talk to your dog and praise him during his exercises. It's also important to have a nice, clean bed, free of bugs, for your dog to get its own rest. Sunshine should never be neglected, and all fresh, clean water you can drink. I like to work, without dieting, to take a pound a week off my dog. I work my dog to maintain his weight, while some people cut their dog's weight below his ideal weight and then work from there. It should be easy, by now, to see that working a dog is a fluid situation. One of the biggest mysteries, and there really aren't any, in working a dog is finding what kind of work he likes best. This isn't always easy, but it's worth the effort if you have a good dog. Some of them like the treadmill, others a turntable, and some like to exercise outside while you pedal your bike. You must be willing to learn, and it doesn't hurt to vary your exercise from time to time. Last but not least for this article is to never let your dog get too skinny. For years breeders thought that a skinny dog was a cut dog. Bah! A good rule of thumb would be to pay attention to your backbone, try to keep a good coat over it and maintain it. If you think your dog is fine at 21 pounds, it won't hurt him if he goes to 22 pounds it will be risky to go to 20 pounds. I'll say more about that later, but in my opinion, I like to throw in an extra pound to get you ready for later. How many times have you heard a breeder say, he used to be so much better in fights? If any of you are boxing fans just remember what happened to Tommy Hearns. He had to dry himself out to reach 70 kilos, he made it to weight but in the process lost his devastating punch and power, and the fight? Sound familiar? Dogs are equal and I defy anyone to prove otherwise. One veteran, Ham Morris, used to have his dogs look almost fat. It worked for him because he won against Tudor and Curvino types and this was never an easy task. Of course, we all want to remove as much fat as possible without getting into muscle tissue. Sound hard? You bet it is. In short, let me say this. Your dog must be healthy and you must be willing to exercise extensively, hard hours and try to remember. Patience is key. Conditioning, Part 2 Don Carter Sporting Dog Journal, July-August 1982 As I mentioned in my last article, 
Conditioning your dog is an extremely time-consuming and extremely slow and fluid situation. Long hours of hard, dedicated exercise are demanded of both the dog and the handler. For this reason, as I said in my last article, it is very important to know what type of exercise your dog likes to do the most. Most bulldogs are very active and athletic and enjoy exercise, and with this type of dog conditioning can prove to be easier and less strenuous. However, there are some dogs that are simply lazy and refuse to work. I start my dogs walking and since most people can associate with the treadmill, we will use it. On the first day, I like to walk my dog in a strong harness and a 6-inch leash. Meters Always carry a pole with you in case of an accident. Walk the dog for 3 kilometers in a relatively quiet place, free of cars, pollution, etc. I personally like to go up and down a few hills during the tour. Put a few pebbles in your pocket and every 200 meters throw one into the bushes to keep the dog's interest. Remember that dogs, like humans, suffer from boredom. After your two-mile walk, your dog must have run out, then the mat can be applied. A minute or two will be enough. While I'm on the subject of the treadmill, let me put it this way, as Bill Anderson used to say, I never trusted putting a dog on the treadmill for more than 20 minutes. It is my own opinion that too much exercise on the treadmill, accompanied by a lack of walks, will ruin the dog. After your dog has done his required time on the treadmill, clean his mouth, praise him and walk him until he cools off. Then 5 to 10 minutes of hand rubbing to help prevent inflammation. Then plenty of fresh water and it's time to eat. We'll talk more about feeding in another issue, but it's important to always feed him at the same time each day, within half an hour. At this stage of training the dog must be isolated from other dogs. In general, I'm talking about 30 days of training if the dog isn't 10 kilos overweight. Some prefer the 45 days training, others 60 days, and still others 90 days. Excessive training though can be equally devastating as it can be the opposite. Keep in mind that every dog is different. To summarize this article, I increase walking distance to no more than 800 meters per day for a day or two, and then gradually increase until I reach 14 to 20 kilometers per day walking. I purposely didn't include the treadmill exercise because I can just safely say, increase the treadmill exercise a minute or two every day until the dog does 40 to 60 minutes at the end of his training. Gradually, towards the end of training, five to seven days, cut treadmill work in half, each day for five days. In other words, if your dog is doing 45 minutes on the 24th day, the next day cut it to 27 minutes, the next day to 14 minutes, the next 7, and the next 3 minutes. This will take your dog to a peak. For a few variations, I personally like to take my dog out to this 160-acre farm behind me and let him loose. It's more natural and much less tedious for the dog. Vary this exercise and always remember that a day off, or even two, won't hurt your dog. Some conditioners will panic an injured foot or a dog in pain. All I can say is stay cool. I also understood that not everyone lives in the countryside, however, no matter where you live, you can get a dog on good terms. I again want to reinforce that this is all basic knowledge, however, fundamental foundations are sometimes overlooked. None of us want to reinvent the wheel, but there's nothing wrong with going back to basics. If we can only remember that the dog needs strength, stamina, air, good rest, good food, 
clean water and lots of love, we will all go far. I have no nasty secrets to keep, and I lose as much as I win. Strange as it may seem, I don't know anyone who has beaten them all. I personally believe that many dogs are conditioned on chemicals and stimulants, but nothing can take the place of good natural food and exercise. Ask Pat. Pat Patrick. Pitbull Gazette, November-December 1982. I have been studying the different methods used to breed winning dogs for 15 years. I also read everything I could find about past breeding methods and ideas. I'm sure many of your readers have done the same study. I think most successful breeders agreed that deep courage was the main asset a dog needed to win. Some creators even said that courage was the only thing to create. They said bite and talent didn't come across consistently, but guts did. In fact if a dog had too much skill, they wanted no part of it in breeding. He was considered to bite harder out of fear. I've been raising my own dogs long enough to have some ideas of my own. I think courage is the most important thing to breed if you want your dog to consistently win. I think other assets are important and they are passed down simply as courage. Next to courage, I could consider tolerance, strength, natural air, or whatever you want to call it, the most important asset a dog can have. Two dogs can both be in equally excellent condition and one will simply outlast the other. If a dog loses courage, he loses. If a dog runs out of gas, he loses. After courage and strength, I consider skill next in importance. By total skill, I mean the dog that can hold your clings while avoiding self-punishment. Wrestling skill helps the dog tie, cling, what he wants or get out of a tie. A smart fighter knows when he should save energy or when to go on offense or defense. He can also change his style if he has to. A strong bite can help any dog win. In some cases, that's all he needs to win. However, I will place the strong bite behind the courage, energy and all-around skill in the mean of importance. I don't believe an extra strong biter is biting hard out of fear. Many strong biters like C.H. Marcel have proven a lot of courage when they couldn't win. A strong biter is just as likely to have as much guts as a light biter. I have noticed that any brute dogs of a breed other than the pit bull seem to have more bite and skill than they look. The reason for this is that they don't save energy. They use all the power and strength they have and after 20 or 30 minutes they slow down and then give up. If you see a dog like this for a short time, they are very impressive. A fighting dog with the same ability won't show you everything he can in 20 minutes. He will save something for the last part as Alex Arguello. I believe that all of these assets, courage, strength, skill, and bite, are genetically passed on to puppies. The dog's genetic makeup is a product of the dogs from which he came. Tombstone was a fighting dog with a medium bite, but he sired exceptional biting dogs like C.H. Snubby, C.H. Reno, The Big, C.H. Hope, and C.H. Tonka. Why? Its progenitor was Toot by Maloney, one of the strongest biters of all time. Toot was the son of Spike by Tudor and Black Widow by Carver, both of whom had very strong bites. Another son of Toot, Davis by Maloney, was a fighting dog with an average bite. Davis sired the famous female C.H.R. Gal Sunday, as well as other strong biters. A dog can bite very hard, but if none of the litters and some of your ancestors bit hard, 
then your pups probably won't bite hard on average. If a dog is a strong biter from a lineage of strong biting puppies, then he will likely produce several strong biting puppies. This would be true for the other goods as well. The bravest usually wins, but sometimes not. There were times when a competitive dog was beaten by a less courageous dog. He's been winning from the start and he's competitive enough not to give up when things are going his way. I cannot agree on creation for courage alone. A fighting dog with little skill will usually beat an aggressive dog of another breed. But what happens when a fighting dog with little skill meets a dog who is almost as competitive with a lot more skill? I think you know what happens. Creating for a strong bite over all things becomes popular occasionally. This theory says that if you keep creating super biters together you will have dogs that easily destroy their opponents. Competitiveness is secondary in this theory. It's more popular recently than it was let's say 20 years ago. Some breeders claim that they developed these super biters. They call these fearsome dogs. They are too much for simple competition dogs and winning their fights in 20 minutes or less, so they say. These breeders are almost always new to the competition or not as smart if they've had the dogs for a while. They have little respect for a dog that needs more than an hour to win. Any dog that needs two, three or four hours to win is harmless according to them. If one of their dogs wins a long run, though, they say it proves their dogs are brave. These guys never have a winning record to prove their theories. In fact, no really successful breeder who breeds large numbers of winners has ever bred their dogs with a strong bite as the main target. Yes, there is some truth to the theory of fearful dogs winning without courage. But it never works on a large scale over a period of time. Here are some reasons why this doesn't work. First, the strongest bites are freaks who bite harder than any of their ancestors. They almost never take down dogs that bite as hard as they do. Did Jimmy Boots ever take down a dog that bit as hard as he did? No. Mangrum's Shorty was the toughest biter I've ever seen, but none of her puppies bite like she does. How many children of Art bite like him? None. Usually these super dogs take down stronger than average biters, but no super biters or freaks quite like them. Second, no dog, no matter how fearful, can always count on an easy victory. Jimmy Boots and Benny Bob squashed their opponents in advance like flies. When they met, they fought for over two hours. Courage, strength, and conditioning played a bigger role than biting. Benny Bob did more damage, but he lost on the course. A hard bite is like a boxer's hard punch and must be landed on target for an advantage. Sometimes the hardest dogs to beat are dogs like the little Braddock or Bolio, who never let the strong biters bite anything but air. Dogs like Chingling, Bolio, Strider, and Braddock are not going to win many fights in 20 minutes or less. But they can beat dogs who have a long line of quick wins in their favor. Cracker and Nigger were terrible biters, but when they faced each other, they faced each other for almost three hours. When two high-quality dogs meet, it usually takes a while no matter how many inferior dogs they destroy in a short period. A strong biter can easily win local fights. When he improves in class and finds a truly good dog, he's going to need all the courage, strength, and skill he's got. Hard biting alone just doesn't make for good competition. I have five dogs that I use a lot as breeding dogs. 
only two of them bite exceptionally hard. The other three are just average biters. All five dogs have extreme courage and strength, and come from a lineage of dogs with these attributes. When I look into my own backyard for a breeding dog, I am more impressed by a dead competitive, high-breathing dog like Jeep or Homer than a wrecker like Panama Red or Pit General. Maybe Panama Red can take three hours if it has to. You know Jeep and Homer can do it and that's good to know. When a breeder tries too hard to get strong biters, courage will suffer. Of course, if you can find a well-bred, well-breathed, competitive dog that bites like hell, you're in business. I breed my dogs for courage, strength and style first and foremost, and if I can add bite to my dogs without losing the first three assets, sure, I do. Terrible biters constantly seem to come out of nowhere and don't deliver their bites consistently. When you hear about an extremely competitive dog with a lot of stamina it usually comes from dogs like these. Courage and strength will put your dogs in the winner's circle more consistently than will the hard-biting ones. The female is equal in importance to the male for producing quality dogs. I want the same grit and strength in a sire that I want in a male. There are many breeders who feel that only the dog's pedigree is important and not her courage or skill. They will show that Jack Dempsey's mother or Joe Lewis never fought. This comparison is invalid. People are not created to fight. Maybe Dempsey's dad never had a fight either. We all know that there are many brave competition bitches. Certainly a competition bitch will produce more competitive dogs than her crossbred sister. The best dogs of today are probably more punished than the dogs of the past, but courage and strength are just as important today as they were then. Pitbull, a dog for you. Joe Placer. Pitbull Gazette, February 1982. After more than 20 years of active involvement in Schutz Hunt sport and efforts to breed dogs eminently for policing work, mainly during my time in Europe, I came to a surprising conclusion, the American Pit Bull is the best dog that the true sportsman can have. This is what happened. One Sunday of that memorable spring of 1980, my friend Ed Wagner brought a dog he named Bim Firehand to our training session and told him he wanted to join the sport. I looked at the small piebald dog reminding me at that moment of a mutt and smiled with a disguised disdain. But I quickly changed my opinion. As green as he was, Bim was dynamite when I donned the sleeve. We started Bim training and I learned my first lesson. Never train a breed with pit bull behavior like you would train your shepherd or doberman. A good pit bull is a do or die that just needs some polishing in technique to excel in protective drills. Early on I learned my second lesson. If a pit bull does not come from a lineage of behavior, he or she is most certainly not a true pit bull. My friend was looking for a good, healthy young dog to show his parents standard of over 30 pounds in weight, we thought at the time that in pit bulls, bigger is better. We found out the hard way, it cost us a lot of money, what it's like in real life. Staffordshire's and pit bulls are only as good or as bad as our shepherds and dobermans for being competition dogs, and because there is no significant difference, we will be much better off sticking with our regular breeds. Until then we have placed flatterings within the proper perspective of such dogs, also pit bulls, which have been intermittently continued in respective magazines. I personally have always felt that such dogs were more in line with funny rarities than being taken seriously as competitors for experienced Schutzhund. On the other hand, 
there seems to be a demand for Staffordshires and pit bulls bred to be docile and as a general rule breeders of such puppies are now demanding a very high price for their products. Finally, we got the real animal and now you can say in the light of experience pit bulls bred as fighting dogs are something else. In them you have over 100 years of American breeding wisdom for courage, athletic ability and hard bite driven by some of the most dedicated people the dog world has ever known. Considering the sport of the Schutzhund, translate these pit bull traits to toughness, an enthusiastic attitude to work and intelligence and you can get a reward with a stable temperament, a friendly attitude towards people. But, never make a mistake and underestimate the magnificent pit bull. True pit bulls can be relentless fighters, they are fight or die dogs. You want to make sure your pit bull doesn't take his guarding work too seriously. Therein lies the main difference between a true pit bull and another guard dog. When training your shepherd, in most cases, you are building confidence and developing courage. Never admitting it, European, for example German, methods of training, duly imported into North America, assume that the cowardly animal is being educated to fight man. A good pit bull has more courage, confidence and enthusiasm than you've ever seen. You better make him or her a strictly mango dog who will smack hard and hang from the mango for sheer pleasure and tail wagging, regardless of whether it is used by you, a stranger or hung from a tree. It may sound sacrilegious to you, but it's simply a blunt warning, if you don't take it seriously, you could be in a lot of trouble. And don't worry, your pit bull won't turn its back on a stirrer and will always and will do better when working with the mango than any other dog. But not everything is roses. When you're talking about a pit bull bred as a fighting dog, you should keep in mind that dog fighting is against the law everywhere. The media has done more than enough to portray fighting dogs as unruly and unruly and their owners as callous criminals. This is an image you must face if you, as a serious shuts hunter, start looking for a true pit bull. You will be tempted to also look for a, two, pit bull or even a Staffordshire more likely to end up with a dog bred for show and pet quality. Think of similar performances being done to our shepherds and dobermans, not to mention boxers and other breeds once known as excellent service dogs. Don't take it the wrong way for SCH command in the past from a primarily show dog or family pet. Your shepherd probably has a better pedigree for this. If you take the time to educate yourself and find the truth, you should be rewarded with a dog whose dream came true. Just be on the lookout for pretenders and rumor mongers, they're in pit bulls too. There is only one opportunity for every sincere sportsman, in North America we preserve, in all their vitality, dog breeds developed and maintained especially for performance and competition. As they are not yet spoiled by the institution as show and pet dogs or completely exterminated by the hysteria, malice or envy of particular groups trying to manipulate public opinion. These dogs have better potential than you might expect from the high import price of common Schutzhunder dogs. But, these performance dogs need legitimate guardians to be preserved as performance dogs in the future. Remember, they are dogs that were selected in the past by American history to represent the American spirit as friends in arms to bulldogs who stood for the tenacious image of the British people. It's up to you to make the pit bulls champions of our species. These good old American fighters definitely have the necessary qualities. Government is not reason, it is not eloquent, it is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. George Washington Chapter 6 The Approach 
Scientific. Even though I like people, I really do. I sometimes find myself impatient to the point of apoplexy as to the natural immunity of reason which is an integral part of human nature. It is apparently easier to deal with our built-in biases than it is to open our minds to a scientific approach, that is, to examine the evidence that will trigger our pre-programmed reactions. And it's not just pit bulls that this particular, vexing aspect of human nature takes hold, but it's certainly at its worst. Every fighting dog breeder has said to me, in effect, you can't say that dogfighting is a good thing. The public simply won't accept it. Well, I never went that route. With my characteristic patience, which Job envies, I repeatedly explain that I am concerned only that the dogfighting is not represented as being excessively horrible, resulting in an outcome that is harmful to the American pit bull terrier. But is there a good aspect to dogfighting? Well, of course, there's the APBT race, which won't be around without the fiery sport that forges its existence. But I suppose there are some poor troubled individuals who think we could do without the race and still survive. Others might psychologically argue that the end does not justify the means. But are there other beneficial effects? I personally think so. I once received a letter, actually an article but written for me, from a guy who was presumably from a low socioeconomic background, but obviously with a high native intelligence. In this short epistle, he spoke at length about basically a dull life and that of his other youth group directed before his interests in fighting dogs. They worked during the day and spent nights and weekends in bars. On a good night, they might be involved in two or three bar fights. But once one of them became interested in pit bulls, the enthusiasm became contagious, and soon they had at least one pit bull each. They started wasting less time because now they had their dogs to lean on, books to read, and to study about lineage. Soon, they were engaging their dogs in amateur fights, and some of them were sticking them in dog fights. Now they didn't have time to go to the bars because they were too busy working with their dogs, and a good way to get yourself in good physical condition is to work a dog. They became more health and diet conscious and completely changed their lifestyles. His involvements with dogs not only had a good effect on them, but also helped the community by calming, in his own words, one of the most problematic elements. Now, of course, some will say that any hobby or other intense interest would do just as well. However, there are few hobbies that attract people of this type. They are not plausible to relate amateurishly to archaeology or astronomy, it just wouldn't seem relevant to them. But a fighting dog, that's really something else. Fighting is a respected part of such men's lifestyles, and they can appreciate skill and courage in a dog, too. In this way, they become fully involved in possibly the only activity that will provoke their intellects. It is for this reason, perhaps, that the pit bull has an appeal with minorities. Consequently, the Irish are an important part of the history of the pit bull. And the tremendous influx of immigrants into the country now probably accounts for a good part of the pit bull's growth in popularity. Now I can imagine humanists smirking at all this, but I think there is validity to it. Either way, I never want to get stuck with the controversy that there is absolutely nothing wrong with dogfighting. My interest is focused more on dogs than on their fights. Still, I have to admit that there were times when I was absolutely aroused by the heroic acts of a dog in a dogfight, usually a small, smart fighting dog who managed to neutralize a show by biting down hard on his opponent and throwing him far enough away 
or even an impressive scratch by a loser dog in bad condition to lick the blood or touch the heart to the point of moving you to tears. However, there were many things that I saw in dogfighting competitions that I normally would not have seen and would rather had never happened. But with almost equal regularity, I've seen examples of cruelty to show dogs, sheepdog trials, retriever trials, and coon hunts, too, so the dogfighting brotherhood certainly is. Does not have a monopoly on cruelty. And if everyone did everything right, there would be no cruelty at all. So an important task for us all is to educate and influence wrongdoers. Even if I had no interest in pit bulls, if they were somehow surgically eliminated, for example. I would still feel that the best way to improve the fate of dogs would be to work from within, not by applying negative pressure from without. In one of the Asian countries dogfighting competitions are legal, and the analogy of these countries to the AKC. American Kennel Club appoints the judges. In fact, judges are usually conformation judges, too. Now, in which country do you think dogs have a better destiny in life, there or here? In the meantime, as the humanists babble their nonsense about the fighting dog breeder, the competitions, and the dogs, they don't always come away completely unscathed, as the occasional reporter will display a bit of healthy skepticism and even make a joke or two. Appropriate Questions For example, the field representative for the Humanist Society of the United States, who is a self-appointed expert on dog fighting and an extremely vocal noise maker about oppression and legislation against the sport, was once asked if he wasn't giving too much importance to animal welfare over that of humans. His response was that he felt he was helping humans by directing our society about this objectionable practice. He was also deducing that this vicious activity was a bad influence on America's youth and on the incidence of crime. Well, first of all, the HSUS. It has not been singularly successful in annihilating this vicious practice. As for the effect of dogfighting on morale or crime, I would say there is little or none. However, I would welcome a comparison of the incident or crime in our country with that in Japan. In Japan, dogfighting is legal and open. In Japan, too, there is a tiny fraction of crime that abounds in the United States. Finally, I will further respond to this field representatively, I don't want to name them, because these people thrive on publicity, saying that we feel we are doing people a favor, too, by fighting oppressive legislation. Oppression in whatever form and for whatever good reasons should be avoided, because it is right against this group, which everyone despises, tomorrow will include another group. And unfortunately, their existence tends to be their only justification. The reader will note that I have avoided mentioning the Asian country in which conformation judges also judge competition dogs. I was concerned that animal welfare groups would direct their energies towards improving the situation there. I wasn't bothered to mention Japan because a number of articles have already appeared with pictures of legalized dogfighting. Surprisingly, the coverage I have seen has not been negative in any way, as it has been emphasized that the dogs do not get hurt and that they are revered and treated like prize racehorses. For some reason, it's easy to be objective and tolerant of an outside culture rather than a subculture within our own country. Still, I hope humanist groups step up the pressure and we may eventually see the time when legalized dogfighting finds an end in Japan, too. Such things are called progress by humanists. An example of similar progress occurred in Thailand, formerly Siam. 
The peasants of that country developed a sport of putting to fight a domesticated species of wild fish indigenous to that country called betta splendens, the well-known betta, or Siamese fighting fish. Well, of course, humanists were horrified. Never mind that fish farming professionals assure the public that very little cruelty was involved. Fights end when one of the competitors suspends hostilities, and the most damage usually consists of shredding the fins. And anyway, how could any of this compare to the way fish are devastated in fisheries? Against all reason and common sense, the humanists prevailed, and now the poor peasants of Thailand are, in theory at least, forbidden to have one of their few amusements. Of course, passing laws against activities doesn't necessarily stop anything or even lessen it. Naturally, criminals can no longer be free about anything, and all procedures must be enforced. So if dogfighting becomes illegal in Japan, it will simply remain a secret. It turns out that the dogs will not have a negotiation at the height, and that the level of people would fall. As it is now, some of the finest people participate, and it is an honor to own a good fighting dog. Dogs do not fight for money, but merely for the honor of winning similar to exhibitions or field trials in that country. For many years, the Japanese were hampered by not having a line of fighting dogs as pure as the APBT. That is, they had to fight the Tosas, who were good enough and certainly big and impressive, but they weren't practically a match for Pit Bulldog. Recently, however, the Japanese have become aware of the quality of our dogs and have started to import them. Some breeders confidently claim that in five years they will have better pit bulls than we have. It may not be an idle boast, because the Japanese have made tremendous progress in all areas of modern technology using a scientific approach. How ironic if at some future date we will have to import good dogs from Japan. He grew into a steel muscle, child of war, that runs, tapering, from a heavy chest and head to a tapered tail. John Tainter Foot Most beginners, unfortunately, have become interested in creating a line. I say unfortunately because they usually do things poorly and release a bunch of dogs that are a disgrace to the breed. There are, of course, one procedure cases where a novice gets lucky, but they are the exception, not the rule. Another factor is that people who know and care about dogs of all breeds are aware and concerned that there is an overpopulation of dogs a euro of all breeds. In those cases where prices for puppies of a particular breed remain high, it is because the breeders are few and far between and thus cooperate in letting prices inflate, thereby increasing the prestige of the breed. Purebred dogs of nearly every breed can be found in a large impounded dog warehouse, and we can't blame animal control or the humane society for euthanizing such animals, better a dead human than a miserable existence, roaming the streets and starving. Knowledgeable breeders of all breeds feel that a breed should only be done when it is likely to maintain or, even better, improve the quality of the breed. The reason a beginner has so much trouble breeding good dogs is not because he requires extensive genetic knowledge to do so, but rather because he has not learned to be selective enough in the dogs he breeds. He needs to select the best bitch he can buy and have her breed the best stallion. We must not diminish the quality of the bitch, as she contributes half of the chromosomes to each puppy. However, we can be more selective when targeting the stallion, as a prime stallion could conceivably be bred almost as close to the real good bitches in the country. Another factor to keep in mind is the quality of the potential parent's immediate ancestors. All I care about in a pedigree is the quality of the first three generations, 
and if there aren't any question marks among those 14 dogs, I'm happy, as even good dogs tend to have straw tails. Staying within the line is an advantage and increases the uniformity of your results, but this is not as important as selection. Contrary to the popular saying, like does not produce like, since genes are tweaked differently in each puppy from the same litter, but you certainly get more good dogs from a good family than poor ones. Sometimes a pair of mutts makes a fighting dog or two, but they are the exception to the rule and certainly not an indication that it's okay to breed mutts. But why all this fuss about breeding good fighting dogs if we're only interested in breeding good dogs here and there? Well, for one thing, courage and fighting ability has been the hallmark of the race from the dark mists of antiquity. And, also, there is another thing about profound courage that is connected to a steady, panic-free disposition. Another problem a beginner has with good breeding is that he just doesn't know who the superior dogs are. It is for this reason that I am called into the round of some recent top dogs. I'm leaving the dogs I described in the Rogues Gallery chapter of my last book, but that's not to say that I still don't admire dogs like Art and Boomerang, far from it. It's just that I want to avoid repeating myself, and almost all of the dogs I'm covering this time around are still alive. Some of them are quite old, but even if they were not available as stallions now, they would be of interest to the reader because of the possibility of their presence in the pedigree of a dog in which they are interested. Triple S Sooner Sooner is the ideal bulldog in every way, looks, temperament, intelligence, and fighting ability. Although Sooner has the perfect display conformation that makes him a winner and must mean he's good at fighting, he didn't even try to fight in his dogfighting days, as his style was to go to the bottom in order to get his prize. Favorite action of holding the thorax under the hind legs. He won three contests against some good dogs, in fact, he beat Blackie, the dog that killed his father Mordecai. He also beat a five-time champion. Mordecai's was a fighting dog who had won competitions before meeting Blackie, and he fought him for two hours, in fact, he was left overpowered for too long and died after the fight. Sooner's mother was Miss Kitty, a daughter of Jimmy Boots. She is a fighting bitch and despite being over ten years old she will still produce puppies. So Sooner had it all, pedigree, style, courage, and the perfect pit bull temperament, meaning the perfect temperament. In fact, Sooner's only vice was drinking beer. Every night his owner comes out to spend some time with him and to serve him some beer to drink. Mike Sugar Ray Mike is another dog close to perfect conformation, and his pedigree leaves little to be desired. He is by Art, a seven-time champion, and by Candy, a three-time champion and a sister to Buddy of Stubblefield. Mike, a five-time champion himself, won a match after breaking his leg within the first ten minutes. Mike has won his fights at the hands of three different people a Euro, the knowledgeable breeder will discern that being able to outrun three different owners is a sign of class. Another sign of class was the dog's ability to come back and win a tough fight after being inactive for two years at the age of six. In that fight, he made 27 scratches under a broken leg. Mike wasn't ineffective, as he had what a fighting dog had, strong bite, fighting ability, good defense, a front, and the intelligence of a fighting dog. Obviously, he had guts. Turtle Buster This dog with the odd name is the essence of courage and everything else that is good about a bulldog, including excellent temperament. He was an eager worker and easily conditioned. He apparently saw movies of his opponent's fights and went into the fight with a plan. 
Turtle Buster was sired by Brutus, who in turn was sired by the large kingfish that sired so many good pit bulls, including Mike's mother, and Gain's game and grit. Fargo This dog is a Turtle Buster offspring and one of the strongest biting dogs you've seen in years. He is one of those very rare dogs that can break the bones of another pit bull. Perhaps the only issue about Fargo is his courage because no dog has been able to give him enough opposition to test his mettle. As the ancients used to say, I wish I had seen a dog that I could check if he was brave. Perhaps the greatest tribute to Fargo was paid by a protector of his losing opponent who said, he beat what I always consider to be an unbeatable dog. Bolt I mentioned Bolio in my last book, but since so many good dogs seem to be coming from him, I thought I'd elaborate a bit on the dog. Here was a dog that won only one fight and was retired as a stud. The reason was that his quality was so formidable that he was considered too valuable to continue fighting. Aside from that, he well proved it in his only fight, going up against a two-time champion, a dog many people considered an ace, and making the dog look so clumsy he conveniently couldn't get his way. What made Bolio so wonderful was that he had stamina that was all out of proportion to his size, and he wasn't a small dog, and in rolls, he would take down a dog twice his size and work him hard. He was also a smart fighter, able to hold a dog and stay out of trouble. But one of the greatest assets was that he just liked to fight a lot, and that pleasure was not diminished by fatigue or a feeling of being defeated. In fact, this is a good definition of the pit bull trait that people call courage. Bolio came from Zeke, of whom Bob Wallace once said, Few dogs could withstand the storm he unleashed on them. Luke of Farb This little dog is another art child from Fanny, who was Kingfish's daughter like Mike's mother. This dog is a lot smaller than the other dogs so far, around a few pounds, but he gives the impression of being able to take care of himself despite his size, as he appears to be absolutely indestructible. He is agile and bully, but with an unflappable calm disposition. Even at mealtime, when the other dogs are making noise, he calmly waits for food to come to him. He won three fights with dogs that themselves won three fights. Luke Sugar Ray This is also another of Art's children, this time from Priscilla. In order to appreciate Art as a stud dog we have to understand that he was the only stud dog for eight months. Many dogs have been studded for many years and never produced as many wonderful dogs as Art, and I'm not even mentioning all the dogs that Art produced. Luke won several matches until he lost to Fargo. Yes. He was the one I was referring to when his owner said that Fargo beat what he thought was an unstoppable dog. Luke displayed unbelievable courage going up against an opponent who was capable of simply biting him where he was vulnerable. Bad Billy This is another dog that is one of those rare ones with bone-shattering power. He had an unusual style. Rather than trying to forcibly extort a dog and tackle him to the ground to get the better of him, Billy would get underneath the dog, grab him in the chest area just behind the front paws, and lift him in the air and, at the at the same time deliver a crushing bite to the chest area. Unlike the other bone crushers, Billy's courage is not an issue, as he once fought a large dog under conditions that put him at a disadvantage because of his odd fighting style. Instead of a rug, the pit was covered with a smooth tarpaulin, and whenever Billy went for his assault and tried to lift the dog into the air, his legs would spread out like an eagle with its wings spread. So Billy got the worst of that fight, but when his owner picked him up to save him at the hour and a half mark, he scratched courtesy like a bazooka. After that match, 
Billy promptly won another one, giving him five wins and one loss. Indian Bloomers This is a bitch I would rank as the best I have ever seen in terms of skill. I understand she was a fighter, too, but the only way they were to check on it was to put one dog after another in her to tire her out, because no dog she ever met in the ring was capable of being with her for more than 24 minutes. And she had some classic opponents, too. She had speed, a shattering bite, and a violence she had to be seen to believe. However, like so many fighting dogs, she was completely happy in her crate and could actually be let out with the other dogs. Bloomers came from a dog named Crusher who was bred by Curvino, and she had a daughter by Bolio. Adam from Queenie This bitch is a three-time champion and a daughter of art. The reader will notice that I have not listed many bitches. The reason is not that I don't consider female dogs important in the breed, because I consider them absolutely as important as dogs. However, you can pay a reasonable price for a stud and mate to any top dog candidates in the country, in fact, only a few of them are in reproduction. With the biggest bitches in the country, unfortunately, it's almost impossible to get the puppies they produce, and it's certainly impossible to get them, even when money is no object. So my recommendation of the two bitches was mainly for academic reasons and so the reader will know who they are when looking at them in pedigrees. Oh yes, Queenie came from the little bitch named Spider. Pool Hall Red this bitch was pregnant enough and her litters were so well spent that people often speak of those pool hall red hounds. She was an excellent dog, by all accounts a Euro, talented and a fighter. She came from the immortal boomerang and meanie of Hyde. Now I haven't, by any means, listed anywhere near all of the relatively recent well-regarded dogs, but if I continued on endlessly, it would certainly become monotonous. The idea was to provide the reader with some dog names that will be candidates for the best dog in the country. There is always someone somewhere who will say something unkind to even the biggest of dogs, although the basis for doing so is only in their mind. Despite being relatively unflappable, I get a little upset when I hear that a four or five time winner is referred to as a mutt. First of all, I think we use that term loosely. Second, the term likely stemmed from a lack of courage arising from a dog not being a purebred pit bull, but I don't think the term should be thrown around occasionally. It was a 30-pound fighting machine that was finally going into action. John Tainter Foot Chapter 8 Classic Tournaments Current accounts of the fights that were written for my use are included in this chapter. Naturally, I refrain from mentioning names to protect the culprits. The people who wrote these accounts for me weren't after personal gain or even self-aggrandizement, because in almost all cases the dogs involved no longer belonged to their original owners, but people wanted the dogs to get the credit. The situation reminds me of an angler fishing out of season who caught a record-sized largemouth bass and left it on the dock with a note on it so the fish could take the record. The guy shouldn't be fishing out of season of course, but you have to admire his fisherman's spirit. In the fights described here, we have some elites, or creme de la creme, meeting, and such encounters made for classic confrontations and for deadlier fights. But even so, I think the reader will get a sense that the fights are not the cruel things they've been led to believe, brutal perhaps, but not cruel. Katie vs. Clamp Females a Euro, 25 kilos Reported by MC MC was relatively new to dogs when he joined us, using his dog Clamp. She was champion having won in 42 minutes and was champion because of her victory over terror, 
a granddaughter of Going Light Barney. Clamp was a terribly rough, hard bite that could kill a dog if you knocked him to the ground. We were using Katie, a champion weighing in at 20 pounds. She, too, was a tempestuous one, as she beat LH in 13 minutes. We tried to compete her in kilos, but we couldn't compete her in that weight, so we decided to go ahead and compete her in 22 kilos with Clamp. Katie was the favorite bet, as not many people knew Clamp. Clamp weighed 23 pounds and Katie 22 pounds. But still money was married to Katie. When the bitches were released, no one else was betting on her because Clamp came like a dragon. She bit terribly hard and was winning over Katie. The only thing that saved Katie was her ability to stay out of serious trouble and hurt Clamp while she did it. After an hour, the bitches were still fighting decidedly, with Clamp driving and pushing the entire time. Meanwhile, Katie was hurting Clamp with her defensive tying. After an hour and five minutes, one lap in Clamp's favor, and she scratched slowly but steadily. At one hour and seven minutes, Katie rocketed forward. At one hour and ten minutes, Clamp started to go slower. At one hour and twelve minutes, Katie advanced wide open and had her first chance to go on the offensive. She inched in deeply squelching Clamp's strength, and Clamp had the count at one hour and seventeen minutes. Everyone who watched the fight watched a classic. Both bitches were violent, biting hard, and in excellent condition. Although Clamp gave up, she actually turned out to be a reasonably brave dog. Katie was fathered by the great breeder, and great dog himself. Wood Snooty, aka Snoopy, and mother by Hannah patched a coat. Clamp was fathered by Ernie the Snakeman and mother Linda de Ernie, a great granddaughter of Snooty. That fight was the best I've ever seen. Katie was tired, hurt and frustrated, but so far, she has shown no sign of giving up. She is a fantastic bulldog. Spike vs. Harry Males a euro, 16 kilos. Reported by MC This fight was the second time that HH had met AB and his dog Spike. Spike beat him earlier by 38 minutes. Spike is a son of Snooty and is a devastating, strong biter. No dog has ever lost to Spike. HH knew this and brought in a Jeep and Charlie half-brother. His dog was known for a superb head and muzzle that could keep a rough, hard-biting dog away from him. The fight was in Harry's favor, as Spike couldn't do his usual chest thrust. But around the 22-minute mark, Spike charged in and did the damage, however, Harry charged in with a good snout grab. Then at the 52-minute mark, Spike rolled Harry into the corner and punished him so badly that he went into shock. HH withdrew from the fight immediately as his dog had no chance of winning and was in terrible condition. This made Spike a very impressive two-time champion dog. Bucky vs. Geronimo Males a Euro, 22 kilos Reported by R.G. Ryle was using his two-time champion Geronimo, a grandson of Boomerang. Geronimo had just beaten four-time champion Luke, a son of Art. Geronimo was known as a terrible punisher who could take one out in a matter of minutes. Chavis was using his champion Bucky, who was only 20 months old at the time. Bucky's style was to keep his opponent out until he could exhaust him and then finish him off. His big body was out of the ordinary, and when I first saw him, I thought he was going to fight at 25 kilos, as he was a big dog for his 22 kilos. 
This fight went somewhat in his favor as Bucky kept Geronimo out and wore him out. At the 1 hour and 47 minute mark, the fight was called off and to everyone's surprise, Geronimo made a nice scratch. This was one of those fights in which a perfect defensive dog was able to defeat a rough, biting dog. Bucky had four-time champion Jocko as a father and a Trump red bitch as a mother. Geronimo was fathered by Zeb de Johnson, a two-time champion whose father was Boomerang. Tater vs. Rastus Males a Euro, 26 kilos Reported by PP Tater crushed the toughest, biggest dogs around with ease and at least ten times in fights. Even with his upper canines broken, Tater was considered unstoppable by those who saw him fight. Tater was a brutal fighter. He was a powerful brawler and would smash dogs to the ground and against the walls of the pit. Even with his broken canines, he was a strong biter, and no dog ever spent more than 15 minutes with him. Rastus was known as the most violent of the dogs in Carver's backyard. He has broken dog legs in fights several times. Tater came in at 25 pounds in excellent condition. Rastus came in at 26 kilos, also in excellent condition. Both were at his best weight. For the first 15 minutes, Tater was in control. He stayed over his ear and prevented Rastus from making any good lunges. Fifteen minutes in, Rastus made his first lunge at Tater's leg, and the damage was substantial. For the next twenty minutes, Rastus continued to work on the leg he was holding, and Tater couldn't leave. Tater went for the chest and throat, but Rastus was paralyzing him. By forty minutes, Tater had little use of his front legs and had to fight from that point on. A lap was made by Rastus at the 35-minute mark. He was doing 35th that night, and both stopped short after 45 minutes. Over the next hour though, Rastus beat Tater brutally with Tater biting hard from the bottom when he had a chance. Ten scratches were made by each dog. It would take Tater 10 seconds to get through, falling and getting up again to push his way through. At around 1 hour and 45 minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably, and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. At 2 hours and 6 minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. Over the next hour though, Rastus beat Tater brutally with Tater biting hard from the bottom when he had a chance. Ten scratches were made by each dog. It would take Tater ten seconds to get through, falling and getting up again to push his way through. At around one hour and forty-five minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. At two hours and six minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. Over the next hour though, Rastus beat Tater brutally with Tater biting hard from the bottom when he had a chance. Ten scratches were made by each dog. It would take Tater ten seconds to get through, falling and getting up again to push his way through. At around one hour and forty-five minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably, and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. At two hours and six minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. At around one hour and forty-five minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably, and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. 
At two hours and six minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. At around one hour and forty-five minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably, and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. At two hours and six minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. During the fight, Rastus showed two unusual techniques. He would shake Tater so hard he would fly through the air. Every time Tater tried to snout Rastus, Rastus would shake him and make him miss. Rastus would catch Tater's legs at unusual angles, making it difficult for Tater to catch his snout. Tater and Rastus were two of the best and most powerful dogs that ever lived, I'm sure. They had it all, strength, power, courage, strong bite, and skill. It's just too bad they had to meet, but if they hadn't, I would have missed the best fight I've ever seen. Rastus was very well bred, and I would have loved to have owned him. He was one of the best fighting machines I ever saw. Tater's Courage, Durability Henry vs. Red Jack Males a Euro, 23 kilos Reported by P.P. Red Jack is by Stu Fowler out of Goldie by Curvino. Henry is from Tater out of Faith from Patrick. Red Jack came in at 50 pounds, trained to perfection. Henry came in at 50 pounds, a little light. His conditioning was favorable, at his peak, and he wasn't at his full power due to his low weight. For the first hour, Red Jack was a hurricane, throwing Henry around the ring. Red Jack was beating Henry by a wide margin and completely dominating the contest. He worked on the head, forepaws, chest, and sometimes even suffocation. Henry fought back and retaliated from the bottom with head and chest grabbing. He was the strongest biter, and he occasionally hurt. Even though Jack dominated the fight, he was using more energy than Henry because he was conserving his strength. From an hour to an hour and a half, Red Jack was still well ahead, but he started to slow down noticeably. Henry came up a few times. The first scratch was 30 minutes into a called lap for Henry. Each made eight hard scratches until the two-hour mark. The fight was evenly matched at the two-hour mark and from that point on Henry started to win. He came in to finish off Red Jack with an incredible display of determination and reserve strength. A handle was made at 2 hours and 10 minutes, it was Red Jack's turn to scratch, Henry scratched like a rocket at the 2 hour mark. Red Jack slowly got within 3 feet of Henry and then turned and slowly walked to the side of the ring and he took the count. The first scratch was 30 minutes into a called lap for Henry. Each made 8 hard scratches until the 2 hour mark. The fight was evenly matched at the two-hour mark and from that point on Henry started to win. He came in to finish off Red Jack with an incredible display of determination and reserve strength. A handle was made at two hours and ten minutes, it was Red Jack's turn to scratch, Henry scratched like a rocket at the two-hour mark. Red Jack slowly got within three feet of Henry and then turned and slowly walked to the side of the ring and he took the count. The first scratch was 30 minutes into a called lap for Henry. Each made eight hard scratches until the two-hour mark. The fight was evenly matched at the two-hour mark and from that point on Henry started to win. He came in to finish off Red Jack with an incredible display of determination and reserve strength. A handle was made at 2 hours and 10 minutes, it was Red Jack's turn to scratch, 
Henry scratched like a rocket at the two-hour mark. Red Jack slowly got within three feet of Henry and then turned and slowly walked to the side of the ring and he took the count. Zebo vs. Greaser Males a euro, 22 kilos Reported by MC The Fastenaws got tired of hearing about Hudson's texts, Maurice Carves Dog from Bully Son out of Arts Missy. Everyone was continually talking about how terrible Tex was and how nothing could stop him. So the Fastenaz brothers went looking for the best 50-pound dog they could find and bought the champion greaser. This dog won four fights out of three for the best breeder in the competition. He was considered to be one of the best of his weight in the country. The Fastenaz and Houston, Tex's owner, agreed to the match, but Tex fell ill towards the end of his feeding. In order not to be penalized Houston asked David West to take over the fight. West agreed to use Zebo, but since he only had two weeks to work with Zebo, he would concede the fight if the dog didn't win in 30 minutes. Until then, Fastenaz thought Houston was using Texas Houston and West had no idea what the Fastinas were bringing. Zebo weighed two kilos less. The Fastenaz were trying to raise the stakes and mask their fear for Zebo when they saw him. Ayuroa, this is the killer dog Ayuro they went on to say, referring to Zebo's last four wins. There were quite a few fans on both sides. The fight was filmed, and the footage showed West bossing Zebo around from the start. Zebo was all attack, attacking Greaser from all directions and working the chest and shoulders. Greaser was going crazy and pushing around, trying to get rid of Zebo. Zebo punters, unfamiliar with Greaser's style, were betting heavily on Zebo. It looked like Zebo was going to destroy one more unless Greaser backed into the corner of the pit. But pushing and pushing and turning was part of Greaser's style, and he still had no intention of stopping. One breeder thought he had seen the strange piebald dog before, and when the handler called him Greaser, his suspicions were confirmed. So West withdrew, and cut him down. But Greaser was already badly wounded at the front. The tide turned several times. When Greaser was in front, he kept Zebo spinning in the center of the line. Greaser would be on one side of Zebo, working his muzzle and head, with Zebo trying to get a hold. Occasionally, Zebo would catch Greaser in the corners and go back to the chest. Zebo was very fast and if he saw an opening, he would immediately make a hold. As usual, however, Greaser forced Zebo's head down and pulled his body out of harm's way, moving in circles. The film was filmed from a position above the ring, so the scene was looking straight down. One cut scene showed Zebo throwing Greaser upside down, and you could see Greaser's chest. It looked as if someone had discharged a shotgun inside it. But at one point it looked like Greaser had beaten Zebo. Zebo looked like he had given it all he had and could do no more. He was in the center of the pit, the one where Greaser was always trying to keep him, breathing hard as Greaser held him by the side of the head and punished him severely. But Zebo caught his breath and trapped Greaser in a corner. Every time he scratched at the chest, Greaser would bend further to the ground. The film shows the Fastenaz pacing back and forth, shaking their heads, where Zebo had brought Greaser to the ground. They shook hands with the other coach and assistant and conceded defeat. Greaser was an incredibly brave and smart dog. If Zebo hadn't hit him so hard in the beginning, he might have won as he kept Zebo in serious trouble for a good part of the fight. Both dogs took their scratches like bullets, 
but Greaser was the one who was badly hurt. Thanks to Fastenau's medical skill, he managed to survive, and he was retired as a stud. The third competition of 35. Almost as an afterthought, I decided to include an account of this struggle sent to me via letter by the dog's owner. One reason for including the fight is that it is an excellent example of how a handler can properly work with their dog in a dog fight. First, a few words about the dog and its owner. We'll call his owner, Perry, and I've known him since before he was bred with fighting dogs. Prior to his interest in fighting dogs, he did obedience work with a variety of breeds and was primarily interested in retrievers. In fact, he was quite a good trainer of retrievers, and no doubt all this experience with other breeds put him in good shape later with fighting dogs. Once he became interested in the bulldogs he was a loser and there was nothing to save him as he caught the fever. I really doubted he would ever go to the pits though, as he was always in awe of anyone who could be cold-headed enough to put their dogs in the pits. He has been pitting dogs for nearly ten years and has won more than he has lost. But he never lost a dog in a fight, winning or losing. This helps to explain the rather chivalrous attitude on his part to let 35 be tested for courage himself. You see, Perry got 35 from an addict for $35, 35, hence the name and he did it more as a favor to the dog than anything else, since the guy wasn't taking good care of him and the young dog's parentage was unknown. Perry thought he might at least be able to use the dog as an amateur fighting dog to train other better breed dogs. But as it turned out, once 35 started fighting, he had more talent than the other a euro good a euro dogs he was training. In fact, he was simply too rough for a training dog. Because of that, Perry decided to try to get him into competitions. Surprisingly, he won two in a row, completely overwhelming his opponents, however, he won in such a way that his courage was never tested. Perry was beginning to suspect that even if the breed was unknown, the dog must have been well-bred. The proof of his courage, if he had it, would be in his ability as a stud dog producing good dogs of courage. None of his descendants are old enough to know the answer to the second question, but the first was answered in the struggle that is described in the following section of Perry's letter, even though the breed was unknown, the dog must have been well bred. The proof of his courage, if he had it, would be in his ability as a stud dog producing good dogs of courage. None of his descendants are old enough to know the answer to the second question, but the first was answered in the struggle that is described in the following section of Perry's letter, even though the breed was unknown, the dog must have been well bred. The proof of his courage, if he had it, would be in his ability as a stud dog producing good dogs of courage. None of his descendants are old enough to know the answer to the second question, but the first was answered in the struggle that is described in the following section of Perry's letter. As far as the dogs are concerned, there isn't much new except the story of 35's third fight, which I'm sure you've heard by now, but I thought I could provide some interesting details and observations. The fight was organized with the help of a very kind man named Dan Wylands. The other group was upper class, and there was virtually no bone of contention in the arrangement. Our training went well, and we were to meet in Oklahoma. We arrived in Reagan just in time to learn of the recent law passed on the new criminal law. In case you've been listening in detail, I'll relate some of the main points a fine of $25,000, 3 to 10 years in prison, going to look is a misdemeanor, but taking a spectator to the pit or selling beer, etc., it's a crime. In Oklahoma, dog fighting has been elevated to armed robbery status. 
I shuddered all over when I learned that the governor signed the document as an emergency measure so it wouldn't have to wait the usual 90 days to become effective. I almost turned around and went back home. What really surprised me was Reagan's attitude about this. Rather than get rid of the evidence and paraphernalia, he said he would just wait and see if they enforce the law or not. Anyway, even on the verge of a nervous breakdown, I wanted to go through with the fight and so we stayed, though, I might add, against a feeling that we should get out of there. The fight was close to 21 kilos, which we consider the minimum for 35. Each side got its own scales, and Reagan used his too. We took cover and brought with us a 25 kilo weight used to test elevators with which the scale would be reset if there was controversy. Well, when we put the dogs on the scales, there was a, a one half kilo difference, with us being the heaviest. We were overweight on their scale but on ours it was fine. So we went to test weight. Then a heated debate ensued about how to reset the balance. Well, after spinning our wheels for nearly an hour, the judge decided that we should use the Reagan scale as a neutral solution. By our test, Reagan's scale was 1 slash 2 pound lighter, but we stuck to it. We washed the dogs and put him in the ring without further ado and the battle was on. 35 charged ahead but their dog, a two-time champion too, jumped completely on ours and caught him in the back of the back, and stabbed him near the tail sharply, causing an alarming amount of blood flow. I've never seen anything like this before and neither have anyone who was present. I remained confident, of course, that the blood would dry, but the dogs were hitting each other so hard and fast that the force of the battle left the wound open. It didn't dry for a good ten minutes, and I knew he'd lost a dangerous amount of blood. Friday Five was doing the best he could, but it became apparent almost immediately that he didn't have the punishing bite he had shown in his previous fights. And as time went on, he was weakening from blood loss. It was decision time, and I decided that if 35 was going to stop, I would give him a chance to do it now and thereby eliminate the possibility of creating him with the mistaken opinion that he was brave. By that time my skin should have been as pale as if I'd lost all that blood, but I tried to get my head together and help the dog if I could. By the 30 minute mark, our dog was so weak he could barely break free of the tether and was failing. I knew our only hope was to change the momentum of the fight by starting with a scratch. Our dog was desperately fighting now to get a hold, and he did a rolling maneuver to try to get the other dog out of his ears so he could catch him. It didn't work as the other dog was still holding him, but I asked the judge for a turn on my dog, and he consented to it. At this point I didn't know if Friday Five could or would scratch, as he was so weak. But when I turned him to the corner he kept looking around my leg trying to see the other dog. When I let him go he took off on the other dog. I said to myself, we haven't lost yet. Up to this point, I had already given up to test 35's metal. I wanted to see what mood the red dog was in under scratching also wanted to give Friday Five as much time to recover in the corner as possible, so I grabbed him again and guess what? The red dog hesitated for about three seconds before he scratched hard at us. Face, this caught the audience's attention. And slowly Friday Five started to give some ear holds and start to balance a little bit. The red dog was starting to get tired and lay down but scrambled to his feet to get 35, only to claw his way back to the top. I continued treating 35 whenever possible, and the rest helped him far more than they did the red dog. The difference, of course, was that while 35 was low on blood and strength, the other was low on heart. 
He continued with the scratch though, and he improved over his hesitation on the first scratch, but he still wasn't readily starting when released. I knew then that we must make him abandon the fight. He was brave enough to continue as long as he was ahead. I knew we had to do something about it, and I started looking for opportunities to send 35 in. Finally he dropped the red one and took on a stifle but wasn't really doing anything with it. I thought, it's now or never, and jumped up there yelling encouragement at him. He recovered and shook the stifle a little, and I just kept yelling, now show him who the bulldog is. And he did. There were two more scratches, but the red was fading fast, and 35 was doing a good scratch. Finally, the stifle binding in the red was up for the count. We won. Now all we had to do was save our dog and get him home. It took one hour and thirty-two minutes, by the way, and we saved him and got him home safely. Dick, honestly speaking 35 is the best fighting dog I ever saw. When he is well he can make most dogs look like idiots in comparison, and when he is not well he can win with sheer determination and courage. By the way, the red dog could have won if he had the heart. He was still the strongest dog physically. He was an excellent fighting dog, just not that brave deep down. The clock is always more important in this type of balanced fight. They will stay ahead, of course. In his last fight before ours, the red dog had come from 1,600 kilometers to beat a four-time champion. Reagan said the red dog was ahead the entire time and won with just over an hour. Later in the fight when I was holding 35 in the corner, he felt almost limp and would hang his head down, making me wonder at every scratch if he had the strength to go. But I let him loose, and he went straight for the red dog in his corner. He really is a classic example of what a bulldog can and should be, and we are all proud of him. I plan to breed him to all the females in my city. Whatever was his offspring, she produced it. And I have faith in him. Author's note, in the book of the American Pit Bull Terrier, I had a chapter on a convention consisting of common dog fights for two reasons. One was to give the reader an idea of a euro a euro what a dogfight was really like. And the other was to establish that dogfights didn't normally end in death. In fact, none of the dogs at that convention died. Here we have absolute war machines in these classic tournaments. Such fights are more likely to end in the death of one, or both, participants. Fortunately, such encounters are rare. But in the tournaments we describe for us here, only one dog died, Red Jack. How can such a thing be true when you have the latest in destruction machines employed with each other? Well, there are three reasons actually. One is that the breeder involved was responsible and acknowledged responsibility for his charges. They gave up fights when the dogs' lives were in danger. Second, they all developed expertise in medically treating dogs injured in combat, or having them receive competent care. And finally, big dogs, in addition to being formidable, are also indestructible. They are strong, shock-resistant, hard to hurt, and hard to kill. Breeding dogs like these is what keeps the American Pit Bull Terrier a unique animal that it is. They are also indestructible. They are strong, shock-resistant, hard to hurt, and hard to kill. Breeding dogs like these is what keeps the American Pit Bull Terrier a unique animal that it is. They are also indestructible. They are strong, shock-resistant, hard to hurt, and hard to kill. 
Breeding dogs like these is what keeps the American Pit Bull Terrier a unique animal that it is. To punish me for my disdain for authority, fate made me one. Albert Einstein It's strange how much you have to learn before you know how little you know. Unknown Author Chapter 9 Training Your Dog Scratch Method before I begin the subject in this chapter, an explanation and caveat are in order. First, why should I write a chapter like this? Why throw more fuel on the fire of Stratton is a dog keeper camp? Well, everything I write is done with the welfare of the breed in mind. But other people write about dogs, 2A Euro, specifically journalists or magazine writers who get their information from animal welfare officials. Such employees typically know very little, so they let their imaginations run wild. Unfortunately, his words are accepted as Bible and dutifully recorded. Such nonsense is pernicious for two reasons. First, it hardens the public's attitude toward pit bull owners. Second, and even more important, it gives novice creators ideas they would normally never have. One example will suffice. One particularly ridiculous fact posed by humanist groups was the common practice of fighting dog breeders amputating their front legs. The purpose of this atrocity was supposedly to enable the dog with the short front legs to get under his opponent and rip his stomach. Now, nobody knows better than a typical fighting dog breeder exactly what incredible nonsense this is. But a fighting dog's game is hard to break. Newcomers are not welcomed with open arms, as is the case with any other pastime. For good reason breeders are wary of outsiders looking for information and are more likely to turn them away. Where do newbies get their information from? Good, the greatest available source is the media. If the media says that dogs must be trained by cats and small dogs, newbies may subconsciously enough lean towards such atrocities. However, I don't think anyone would be stupid or cruel enough to amputate their dog's front legs. Sadly, I was wrong, dogs with little leather boots on where their paws once were, limping along the other end of the leash. Now, in a case like this, who deserves our hate, the animal welfare officers who made up this story or the poor sick idiot who took the story seriously? I don't think anyone would be so stupid or cruel enough to amputate their dog's front legs. Sadly, I was wrong, dogs with little leather boots on where their paws once were, limping along the other end of the leash. Now, in a case like this, who deserves our hate, the animal welfare officers who made up this story or the poor sick idiot who took the story seriously? I don't think anyone would be so stupid or cruel enough to amputate their dog's front legs. Sadly, I was wrong, dogs with little leather boots on where their paws once were, limping along the other end of the leash. Now, in a case like this, who deserves our hate, the animal welfare officers who made up this story or the poor sick idiot who took the story seriously. Well, anyway, it's my hope that I can help prevent many maiming-inspired atrocities by giving the true version of how to breed your dog for the purpose of fighting. But first, the caveat I mentioned earlier. Are you sure you want to do this? Every aspect of a dog show is hard work, and no one has ever made a profit from it. Worse, you risk breaking the law. And even if you've never broken another law in your life, you could even be sentenced to custodial terms. But why should this be? How can perpetrators of violent crimes receive lesser sentences than those accused of racing their dogs? For example, Simple assault is a lesser crime in many states than dogfighting. The first is a vicious attack on a person, 
the latter merely an assault on the sensibilities of those who know nothing of fighting dogs and, perhaps, grow faint-hearted from any strenuous activity. The incongruity of the legal system in this regard is evidently absurd. However, I have a theory that explains its existence. With the reader's indulgence, I will now break down my speech to a few paragraphs. Although the general public seems to be blithely ignoring the situation, scientists have the grim knowledge that the world has been on a course of destruction for the past two centuries. To be brief, the problem is overpopulation. Part of the world's population has been living on the verge of starvation. With the advancement of technology, however, our population has been supplied with more food and thereby doubled at ever-increasing rates, and the number of people going hungry has increased astronomically. But this is only part of the problem. For every kilogram of human flesh, a kilogram of non-human flesh must be sacrificed. Hence, animal and plant species are being driven towards extermination at an alarming rate. The extinction pattern during the great dinosaur, of dinosaurs, mainly, in the Cretaceous period was approximately one species per hundred years. Now it's almost one species a day. Our humanists who beat their chests, and pass laws, about the imaginary cruelty of dogfighting must consider what happens to wild animals whenever land is cleared for a new mall or housing development. If our humanists are really concerned about animals, they will join in trying to bring our population under control. Biologists lament the loss of species, animal and plant, because they haven't had a chance to study them, in fact, some species became extinct before they were even discovered. However, there are other reasons for concern. We do not yet understand the mutual relationship of species. We humans are part of the fabric of life, and we are abysmally ignorant of our possible dependence on one or more species becoming extinct. Not only that, but many of our most important medicines come from plants. Who knows? The cure for cancer may be contained in one of the plant species currently being extirpated in the Amazon rainforest. But let's be optimistic and assume that there is no unknown essential relationship for any endangered species. Yet you want a world in which only people, algae, and perhaps little animal food left. Maybe we will have zoos where we can see real-life cats and dogs. Other problems include accelerating deforestation in South America's forests. Such tremendous loss of fauna and flora is destined to alter our atmosphere with unpredictable consequences. Part of the problem with all of this is that there's an inherent retard reaction to all our craziness. Once we start to experience this, it will probably be too late for anything to be done about it. Even the great oceans, perhaps the only real place, are being polluted to such an extent that the algal population must be endangered. If it does, so will a large part of our oxygen supply. Overpopulation is a factor in almost every major modern problem. More people care less and less about everything and everyone, thus, everything becomes more valuable due to its scarcity a euro, and economists try to illustrate why we cannot stop inflation. War becomes more and more inevitable. Third world people don't like to go hungry. Riches diminish. We haven't seen the end of the gas lines. Pollution increases. We will end up poisoned with our own leftovers. Ah, well, my intention is not to depress anyone or even recruit members for the zero population increase, although I wouldn't be unhappy with the second result. I proceeded to explain the notoriety of dog fighting laws. The problem, as I see it, lies in people's psychology. 
Precious metals and minerals are made like that, because of their scarcity. If diamonds were as common as granite, they would have the same value. Can it be, that the superabundance of human results, callous attitude towards each other? Is this why a person can be systematically murdered in the big city, and bystanders don't want to be involved? And is this why crimes involving animals are elevated to greater importance than those involving humans? Whatever the case, you are stuck with the fact that the law can deal more severely with fighting dog breeders than with burglars. If you get arrested a euro, and keep in mind that you were wrongly arrested a euro, you won't be able to take much solace in knowing that the laws are bad. The laws have been put on the books by politicians who know nothing about fighting dogs and have been pressured by ignorant others who are looking out for their own private interests. An additional vexation of dog racing is that because of the illicit nature of the activity, there is very little reward in the normal sense. Up to success. If your dog wins once, twice or even fifty times, you won't be able to tell many people about it. You can report your dog's competitions in a trade magazine, but for your benefit use a pseudonym when doing so. It makes even more sense not to report anything. So there is little glory in fighting. There will be no news in the papers, and no dog food producer will give their dog an award for Best Pit Dog of the Year. Although, surely, there could be no greater ceremonial given to a dog ration than to say that it was used successfully in training a pit dog for the most demanding of competitions. Starting There are two ways to get a dog that will become a fighting dog. One way is to buy an experienced dog, one that has won a fight or two. Unfortunately, you'll need contacts you don't have to do this. Also, you can expect to pay a very high premium for such a dog, because the owner may have waited a long time and raised a kennel full of dogs to get a dog of that caliber. A more promising approach is to acquire a well-bred female dog. Information elsewhere in this book will help you determine whether or not the puppy is good breeding. Keep in mind that it is important for parents and grandparents to be fighting dogs. Anything less involves compromise, and you pay too high a price for compromise in the long run. Assuming you've managed to find the appropriate female, or more accurately, a litter that is properly bred, how do you choose the pup? There's no secret to choosing a good puppy. Simply get the puppy that is the healthiest and catches your eye, as each puppy has a chance to become good. Well, actually, they won't be given equal chances, but the determination of such things, the genes, is not subject to significant scrutiny. Either way, the plan is for it to be your base bitch. You will use it to get a line of starting dogs. For that reason, it's not as important as she appears to be, as you will be building on the breeding that is upon her and the selection of an appropriate sire to serve as the foundation for your dogs. Another short-term route, albeit a much more expensive one, is to buy a well-bred adult female dog. In that case, it would be good to have one that is tested in courage, but then again, it's likely to be an expensive proposition to buy one. It's better to have a bitch deficient in courage that comes from solid fighting dog breeding than the other way around. However, it is only at this point, when you are just starting out, that you should allow yourself the luxury of compromise, for example, in this case, mating a non-game bitch. Either way, whether you get a puppy or an adult female dog, take her to a vet and get her health checked. If there is a problem, an honorable breeder will refund your money or discreetly make a replacement. If you've got an adult dog, you'll want to have everything ready for him, or her, at home. Even if you plan to keep your dog as a pet, 
have an enclosure ready set up outside. Get him used to it, and bring him indoors for a short, supervised period. If these sessions were well designed, gradually increase them. The reason I suggest such cautions here is not that the pit bull is such an untrustworthy animal but because any kennel is more likely to have a hard time adjusting to life than a pet dog and is likely to commit serious indiscretions. In addition to the obvious dirt on the carpet, your dog might gnaw on the furniture or jump on the kitchen table. Whatever the affront, the punishment must be the same. Don't show too much anger, simply say no and take the dog outside to its kennel or chain. The idea is to avoid making the punishment too severe that it will cloud the outcome. And, believe it or not, pit bulls are sensitive dogs that don't like to be in trouble. For this reason, they are usually easily trained. Shaft and Chain Installation for outdoor installation, you need to make a choice between installing a kennel or chain. The kennel has the advantage of being more compact, taking up less space than most chains, and the dog does not have to wear a collar. It is for the latter reason that show dog breeders prefer kennels, as they do not want matted neck hair. However, a dog is less accessible in a kennel, and you will likely have to keep him cemented which can be unpleasant for bones and joints. An alternative is to use gravel leveling, but this type of foundation is difficult to clean. I have known people with various dog breeds who used both kennels and chains, and, unless they were devoted to show dogs, they invariably preferred chains. I also noticed a recent article in the hunting dogs section of field and stream that advocated chain installation as being superior to kennel. It would be advantageous, however, to have at least one kennel for the bitch in heat or about to give birth. The simplest installation of chain is the ring and o-ring type. You need two large, heavy harness rings, two support links, and two spinners. Attach the rings and spinners to the end of the chain, and simply drive a pin through the euro euro of the larger ring. Leave the head of the pin at least 6 inches above floor level so that there is plenty of room for free movement of the o-ring. The main danger with this type of installation is that the chain will become tangled and the dog will wrap tightly around the pin, unable to reach shade or water. For this reason, you should check the dog frequently to make sure it is not tangled up. This problem lessens considerably after current movement has bypassed the area. You can prevent the problem by clearing the area of a euro a euro rocks, sticks, and so on and leveling off any high spots near the stud that the chain might snag. Chain size is an important consideration, too, because a dog can break a surprisingly heavy chain if he gets excited and starts lunging for it. Fortunately, most dogs become chain aware and will not repeatedly slash the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. Chain size is an important consideration, too, because a dog can break a surprisingly heavy chain if he gets excited and starts lunging for it. Fortunately, most dogs become chain aware and will not repeatedly slash the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. Chain size is an important consideration, too, 
because a dog can break a surprisingly heavy chain if he gets excited and starts lunging for it. Fortunately, most dogs become chain aware and will not repeatedly slash the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. Most dogs become a euro o chain a wary euro and will not repeatedly strike the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. Most dogs become a euro o chain a wary euro and will not repeatedly strike the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. The pulley and chain system. This type of system works best where there is plenty of space and lots of trees, and is by far the best way to keep large numbers of dogs. Unfortunately, it is more difficult to erect and maintain a simple pin and chain system. First, you need to decide where your cables will run. Select an area as flat as possible and one that is free of large irremovable rocks in which the chain could snag. The tree will need some cable protection, otherwise it will gradually penetrate the bark of the tree and when it enters the vascular system of the tree, it will kill the tree. A thick strip of flat tire will do the job, at least for a while, but a better solution is to use a lightweight metal sheet that can be bent around the tree and nailed into place. The cable can be securely placed over the sheet metal with a cable clamp. Before you can put the cable on the other tree, you need to put the pulleys on the cable. It's a good idea to include extra pulleys. That way, if one breaks, you don't have to pull the cable out to reattach it. The length of chain attached to the pulley must be at least long enough to reach the ground. The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. Attach a spinner to one link, then another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. You need to put the pulleys on the cable. It's a good idea to include extra pulleys. That way, if one breaks, you don't have to pull the cable out to reattach it. The length of chain attached to the pulley must be at least long enough to reach the ground. The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. Attach a spinner to one link, then another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. You need to put the pulleys on the cable. It's a good idea to include extra pulleys. That way, if one breaks, you don't have to pull the cable out to reattach it. The length of chain attached to the pulley must be at least long enough to reach the ground. The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. Attach a spinner to one link, then another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. 
The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. He attaches a spinner to one link, then to another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. He attaches a spinner to one link, then to another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. The most important items for a pulley assembly are the stops. They are to prevent the dog from reaching the tree, in case he is inclined to gnaw, or having his chain wrapped around it. It also prevents wear and breakage of pulleys. Measure the chain distance from the tree. At the point you chose for your stopper, place a U-bolt clamp. Make sure extra pulleys are between the tree and the U-bolt clamp. Now wrap the U-bolt clamps with layers of coarse fabric. Of cotton wool until you have a round shape the size of a baseball. Cover with good quality plastic tape, and you have a nice padded stopper for your pulley system. Don't forget to put one on each end, too. Be sure to clear anything that can catch on the chain, such as twigs. Kennels. It's hard to beat the professional builders in kennel construction. You might want to take care of the base yourself, though, if you're used to working with cement. As mentioned earlier, cement can be unpleasant for a dog's joints, so you may only want to cement the edges of the walkway to prevent the dog from digging. Dirt, plain and simple, is the best foundation, and if a puppy is kennel raised, he probably won't try to dig. In this case, you can go unnoticed with the dirt background without any cement work. The dog's house. If you live in a cold place, you're obviously going to need a more substantial and better insulated dog house than if you reside in a warm climate. In this case, professionals do not always do a good job, because they often place the entrance flush with the floor, and also make it too large. What is needed in cold climates is a small, just big enough for the dog to conserve body heat, double insulated house with an opening wide enough for the dog to enter, and it's amazing how the dog can squeeze through. The opening should be well above the ground so that the house will retain a lot of straw, and the dog can snuggle up into it, with only his nose out. The opening can also be covered with a burlap tip. Diet Everyone has their favorite dog food, but most of the popular dog foods are well balanced and adequate. Unlike people, dogs prefer to eat the same food every day, in fact, they are susceptible to runaways from a simple change of food. Select a good ration, and stick to it. I add hot water and some canned dog food, along with a liquid skin and coat supplement. One argument in giving kibble is that in its dry form the food helps to clean the dog's teeth. Also, if a dog doesn't finish his food, the kibble won't attract flies like wet foods will. Raising the pup. Whether you chose a male or a female, your animal's training and care should be the same. Training will mainly consist of introducing the dog to activities that will go with exercise. Thus, playing with your pup and encouraging him to play tug-of-war with some artifact will eventually lead him to stretch work. The younger the dog is started on the treadmill, the better he will work on it when mature. Most dogs will run around in the walker for the sheer pleasure of it. There is a rare exception where a chicken needs to be put in a cage or a dog in front of him to excite him enough to work. You may want to start your puppy off with slow steps daily and gradually build up the distance. 
The young dog will look forward to your jogging sessions, and unless you're a marathon runner, he'll soon be at the point where you won't be able to give him enough exercise that way. A love of exercise is the very essence of a pit bull, and it's fun to watch one enjoying himself in the walker or spring pole, a device for exercising the dog, it consists of a pole or tree branch with a sturdy piece of cloth on the tip to encourage the dog to jump and grab the cloth. This can also be done with a pole and the exerciser holds the pole and raises and lowers it like a spring. If you are going to put your dog in conformation shows, the dogs that have been working are more likely to capture the attention of the judges due to the superior muscle combination in evidence. Also, with the advent of weight pulling competitions becoming more popular, the dog with a little conditioning will obviously have the upper hand. And don't get carried away by talk of taking your dog to fights if you're not inclined to do so. An acre of performance is worth more than all the promises in the world. James Howell Chapter 10 The Proving Ground Contrary to the legend perpetuated by animal welfare groups about using puppies and small dogs as baits to train a fighting dog, one who is truly familiar with fighting dogs will not allow any contact with mutts. For one reason, it's not good for the young dog to fight a mutt, big or small, as the snarling, yelping, and other, odd, behavior of the mutt will be a puzzle to him, and certainly will. It will do him no good. One of the reasons for this is that the mutt, for example, not pit bull, fights out of fear or authority, whereas the pit bull fights for the sheer pleasure of it like the hound dog that stalks for the sheer pleasure of it. In any case, the best experience for a suitor fighting dog is to go up against another pit bull, preferably one of age and experience who is not as rough, you don't want a puppy who is forced and loses confidence in himself, but be astute to teach the pup a few tricks of the trade. A good question is when to start raising a puppy, and it's not an easy question to answer. Some of the old ones made it a rule never to do anything with young dogs until they were two years old. However, there were dogs that won several competitions at this age. Here's what you should consider, some dogs won't start until they're close to two years old, or older, and others rarely will when they're less than three months old. The age at which they start fighting seems to have very little to do with how they turn out. Even if your young dog is dying to fight at a young age, it would be better not even against other puppies, because at a young age they could lose their canine teeth. Apparently, the jaw bone has not yet become strengthened. If you put him in a sparring match when your dog is less than two years old, be sure to keep those fights short, a pleasurable experience for him. And remember that the vast majority of dogs never reach their potential until they're three years old. Because at a young age they may lose their canine teeth. Apparently, the jaw bone has not yet become strengthened. If you put him in a sparring match when your dog is less than two years old, be sure to keep those fights short, a pleasurable experience for him. And remember that the vast majority of dogs never reach their potential until they're three years old. Because at a young age they may lose their canine teeth. Apparently, the jaw bone has not yet become strengthened. If you put him in a sparring match when your dog is less than two years old, be sure to keep those fights short, a pleasurable experience for him. And remember that the vast majority of dogs never reach their potential until they're three years old. Sometimes, too, a young dog can deceive you by being full of fights, but when you put a dog in front of him he will squeal and carry on like a mutt or perhaps just bend over and let the dog chew him, all the while wagging his tail. In either case, get the dog off him, 
and don't allow your dog to have any other contact with dogs for a few months. There are three different views on how much training with other dogs a young dog should have before competing. It has been said that each fight takes its toll from the dog's psyche, as if he only had so much courage, and a little bit is used in each training fight. Well, I don't believe it, in fact, I think easy sparring actually builds a dog up and gives him confidence for whatever tough battles may be waiting ahead. The question is, should it be tried out in your game before competing? I suppose I belong to the school of concepts that believes that competition is the test of the game. This is where you can see how your dog stacks up against quality competition dogs. And the whole purpose of competing dogs is to find which dogs are the best, to know which dogs to breed. Presumably your young suitor did well in the sparring matches before you decided to compete him, because he will most likely have a much tougher journey because he will likely meet a much tougher opponent in this fight. That is, of course, because the other guys selected their suitors from the best of their lot, too. Once you've decided to race your dog, there are a number of things to consider. First, there's weight, and presumably, you've determined how heavy your dog is and how strong he is without fat. Remember, there are two reasons for dropping dog weight. One is that it doesn't carry unnecessary weight, like fat. The other is to prevent the dog from going to a bigger dog. It is certainly possible to err and bring your dog too light a weight in a weak condition. For that reason, it's good to keep in mind that if you're going to miss the weight, it's better to miss heavy than light. Getting the exact weight right takes experience and a certain amount of dog knowledge. Another consideration is the time of year for the competition because you'll want to avoid the heat, and for good reason. One of the reasons the dog is not stronger than we are is because of his ability to keep his body at a cool temperature, if his temperature reaches a certain level above, death is inevitable. Heat is responsible for many dog a euro a euro deaths a euro, and not just dog fighting ones. Since one of our goals is to avoid deaths, the first step is to avoid competing in hot weather. An additional consideration is how long to rest before competing. Generally speaking, the longer the better. However, the normal rest period is two months. You can be sure, however, that the other dog will go to the pen as soon as the competition is settled. You will want to make sure your dog is examined by a veterinarian to make sure he is healthy and free of parasites. A good vet, by the way, can be an ace, but they're not easy to get carried away, even if they're more understanding than the general public. The problem is that some states have laws subjecting a veterinarian to reporting any instances in which he thinks a dog was part of a fight, and even if the fight was staged where it is legal, you could run into trouble when you return home. House of course, many sensitive veterinarians will laugh at gossip for the absurdity of it, but it's understandable that some overly shy individuals will be concerned. After all, they don't want any rumors from their other clients about being fighting dog vets. Normally, if you are going to compete your dog, it is your responsibility to learn something about some medical care to help him after the fight. If you have an understanding veterinarian, abuse him by asking for information about this. Pay him extra if necessary, but learn all you can about caring for a sick dog in battle. Also, this is the time to find out if you can take your dog to him without him needing to report you to animal welfare personnel. It will make a big difference if you can convince your vet that you are taking good care of your dog that you really care for him. 
I have known more than one breeder who have become absolutely best friends with their vets, merely because they had an intense and sincere interest in canine medicine and spent much of their spare time helping veterinarians, learning a great deal in the process. Conversely, I know of at least two breeders who have taught their veterinarians something, such as ear trimming and little tricks on how to treat a dog in shock. Bob Wallace is one of the two men I'm talking about, and his vet isn't shy about admitting that he learned a few tricks from Bob Wallace, including how to trim his ears. One of the problems with a shelter is that it's hard to start easy, but it's essential that you do. Better to slow down a progression than too fast. If you weaken your dog with too much work, it's a much bigger setback than if you proceeded cautiously. One of the things you need to be very careful about is the dog's paws. They should gradually harden for the work they have to do. Some breeders have a homemade preparation that they put on the dog's paws, and others use commercially available preparations that are supposed to toughen the hunting dog's paws. Your training will consist of walking your dog, having him run on the treadmill, although some dogs were conditioned without it, or on the turntable, or even jogging with the dog. Now, I've heard many of the experts talk about working on the dog's bite and strength, as if that were a natural consequence of conditioning. Such a phenomenon is most likely a combination of circumstances. First, what appears to be an ace bone crusher just doesn't look as good when he goes up against a quality dog. Second, if your conditioning is focused on tolerance, you may neglect the dog's strength, and he may lose some of it. Third, if a dog is brought in very light or dehydrated, he will surely be the weakest. I have found that the most experienced and most successful of conditioners are those that are least likely to dry out your dogs or dehydrate them. The age-old physical reason behind drying the dog is that it reduces bleeding, which is true, and the dogs themselves reduce water intake later in the pen, which is also true. However, a dehydrated dog cannot afford to lose much blood, and its stamina is not as great as the stamina of a dog that has not been dehydrated. If the dog reduces its water intake under the influence of exercise work, our modern conditioner simply mixes a little water into its food. Also, today's successful trainers are aware of the fact that animals, including us, have slow twitch and fast twitch muscles. Slow contraction provides hardening but not strength and speed. Therefore, fast twitch muscles have to be developed as well. Exercises that require speed and strength will help to develop these. A little exercise from catching the cloth attached to a pole, fast runs on the treadmill, and pulling against resistance can help the conditioning aspect. Some conditioners approach the problem by having a hard workday with an emphasis on tolerance, alternating with a shorter workday that emphasizes intensity. Usually, when the agreement for the competition is reached, there is agreement on the spot as to the judge and the rules to be used. Cajun rules are the most common, and they allow for certain options. For example, the score on a scratch can vary, as can the count on out of holds. Since our goal is to shorten the fight as much as possible, try a 10 second scratch count. Similarly, Keep the count as low as you can for the out-of-hold time. The only people who argue against short counts are those who are always looking for the glory of no turns and no out-of-holds competition. I, too, am elated and pay homage to the dogs that endure such competitions. But if the out-of-holds count is ridiculously long, it takes some of the shine off the whole thing. As you enter the last week before the fight, start to cut back on the length and intensity of work. 24 hours before the fight, give your dog a quarter of the work, 
and in that time give him his last meal as well. Of course, you have been weighing your dog every day and adjusting the food accordingly. Keep track of the dog's weight over a 24-hour period. If his weight drops, give him a mixture of water and nutrients to bring him back down to weight, but not solid food. If your dog is even a few grams overweight, don't be mad if the other guy claims a ticket. This is the price you pay for getting the weight wrong. The other guy probably came in a few inches underweight just to leave him on the sidelines. A lot of people aren't claiming fines just to show their good sports. And, too, a man who has conditioned a dog for two months is reluctant not to go through with the fight, but he must remember his responsibility to his dog and, unless he has an unusual dog, he does not want him to go, further, against his opponent. Naturally, if you win the coin toss, you will be elected to wash first, as your dog will have much more time to rest in his crate while the other dog is being washed. When you wash the other dog, once again remember your responsibility to your dog. Don't let him down by doing a poor wash job. Harmfully rubbed tails are usually spread, but let's pretend they aren't. Even if you and your opponent are the best of friends, wash the dogs anyway just to get rid of the flea spray, and it will be better for both dogs to be clean anyway in case of any injuries they receive. If you miss the coin toss, your opponent will most certainly do the wash first. This leaves you with the choice of corners, which really isn't much. The most you can hope for is to receive the darkest corner, so your opponent's dog won't have a very good view of your dog in your scratches. But most fights are well lit and even, otherwise you could take the highest corner and make your opponent go up for a scratch, so the choice of corners is a sign of advantage. When dogs are fighting, keep a close eye on your dog's mouth to make sure he's not bitten. It rarely happens that a dog becomes bitten, for example, inserting a tooth into or through his own lip, but it's your job to make sure he isn't. If you think he is, let the judge know. Don't talk to your dog too much, he knows more about what he's doing than you do, but try to stay in your field so he knows you're there. When he does a particularly good trick or has a good hold, let him know he's doing a good job. Watch for an out by both dogs, and be sure to ask for it even if it's about your own dog, because you want the dogs to scratch as quickly as possible. Once the exit has been called, cooperates with the other handler in separating the dogs from the holes. If it's your dog's turn to scratch, talk to him in the corner, encouraging him and keeping him excited. If it's the other dog's turn, don't talk to your dog at all, simply try to lull your dog to sleep. You want it to have as little stimulation as possible for the scratching dog. Finally, if your dog is out of count or has thus lost the fight, take the first opportunity to congratulate your opponent and don't be afraid to praise your dog, because you both found what you wanted to know, which dog is braver. Finally, if your dog is losing but won't quit, or keep scratching, start thinking in terms of giving up the fight. If your dog is being beaten and still scratching, and the other dog is still scratching well, why let your dog get killed? If he's brave, he's worth keeping, and no one likes to see a dog left too long to be saved. I once saw a trainer completely humiliate his opponent by saying, if you don't get that brave little dog, I'll get mine, and you can take the win. The guy got his dog, too, because he knew the story would run fast on how he won his victory. Also, if you are any kind of breeder in any way, you will feel as close to him as you do to your family, especially after all the hours you spent together while on guard. So pick up your dog and remember the purpose of the ring. It is the proving ground that determines the best of bulldogs.
The race isn't always for the swift or the battle for the strong a euro, but that's the way to bet. Damon Runyon Genius does what it must, and talent does what it can. Bulwer Lytton Chapter 11 A Matter of Style Usually, fighting style is almost beside the point. That is, contests are usually win or lose despite the fighting style rather than because of it. Oh, it's true that most breeders prefer the dog's snout or ear while they back off to throw themselves at the dog's leg, but both dogs can win. The reason is that most competitions consist of a hammer and tong phase in which both dogs are throwing the works, here comes the inevitable slowness in which both dogs' metal, or enthusiasm to fight, is being tested. Usually this enthusiasm weakens one of the dogs slightly, and he ends up being counted when it is his turn to scratch. In this way, the style ends up being irrelevant to the result. However, there are dogs of unusual ability who completely surpass other dogs and will put them to the ground and out of action so quickly that the competition never reaches a weakening phase in which the dogs are warm, weak, and able to inflict little or no damage. These dogs of unusual ability, called aces, by breeders, will knock a mediocre dog out of action in an instant. The breeder has mixed sympathy for these aces. While the skill of these dogs is admirable, their deep courage is always suspect because they rarely meet a dog to match them, and therefore whether they have courage or not is determinable. Experienced breeders have come to worship courage above all else. Because, in usual competitions, it is the brave dog that wins. Additionally, Breeders have developed a special liking for the pit bull, and courage is the single most important characteristic of the breed. There is nothing more exciting to an experienced breeder than having your dog of guts go up against a barnstormer, hold on, and force the competition into the slow period where guts is essential, and then win by guts. But these aces are kind of annoying to the breeder because they will kill your brave dog if you are foolish enough to leave them in there too long. Many aces have often been bred, only to produce litter after litter of cowards. Most likely, many aces haven't had the guts to take what they're given, but no dog has ever come to prove the point. In any case, these aces can have a wide variety of styles. They have such extraordinary athletic ability that they can make their style work, whatever it may be. Generally speaking, however, most breeders prefer a dog that holds its opponent somewhere on the head, preferably the muzzle or ear. There are several advantages to a dog that can successively hold and utilize this hold. Because, he doesn't have to be a strong biter because he can control the other dog and wear him down, such a style is tailor-made for defense, as he holds the other dog, preventing himself from getting held or taking damage. Also, a snout and ear is particularly frustrating for your opponent because the opponent may not even have the satisfaction of making a hold himself, and the more he tolerates it, the faster he wears out. Further on, the harder he pushes, the more damage he does to himself. The snout and ear dog is like a martial arts expert using his opponent's strength against him. Or, if you prefer, the analogy can be taken further as a street fighter going up against an experienced boxer who won't stand by and fight. Going like Barney, Braddock de Curvino, and Boudreaux's ox are just a few examples of this type of fighter. Even though, for pragmatic reasons, the muzzle and ear fighter is preferred, sentimentally many breeders really like the dog that comes in fighting, that goes for the chest and shoulders, occasionally faking one side and then going the other, right down to the stifle, to the extinction of the other dog.
This is a dog ready or not here I come who is always delivering the final attack beforehand, burying his head in the other dog's chest, pushing so hard he lifts the other dog onto his front legs and constantly keeps him off balance. To the Puritan, a pit dog must always go forward, and that's exactly what dogs do, pushing their opponents around the pit. However, a dog using this style needs to have unusual biting power and preferably tolerance, because if he doesn't put his opponent out in a relatively short time, he will wear himself out and then be at his opponent's mercy. That this style can be successful, however, is proved by the fact that one of the greatest of all time has been its clinicians, dogs like White Rock, Zebo, Boomerang, and Jeremiah, to name just a few. Sometimes a type of dog that comes in fighting is called a straight back because they often don't shake a hold and they only have one gear, forward. A dog's leg, however, must continually jerk out of a hold to be successful with this style. Otherwise, the other dog will grab him by the muzzle, even if the other dog is not a de dog, and will immediately lift him out of his hold and severely injure him. There are actually two tactics that a leg dog can successfully use, and we're talking about front legs here, the hind leg or knee of the dog will be discussed later. One is to shake continuously so violently that the other dog cannot catch its muzzle, and the other is to lower the leg, down near the pastern or up to the foot, and drive with that, pushing back between the hind legs. This not only keeps the opponent from getting the dog's muzzle, but also leaves him very little to get. Like the chest and shoulder dog, the leg often needs to be a strong punisher to win. He, too, must expend considerable energy to be successful with his style. The extinguished dog must either be an artist to get back to his favorite hold or he must be profoundly patient. A third alternative is to be versatile enough to a euro e trade a euro holds in front until he has the opportunity to get back on the knee. For those unfamiliar with the term, the stifle is a point where the femur, or thigh bone, meets the two lower tibias, the tibia and fibula. In other words, the stifle is the dog's knee. In fact, Dog's hind legs would be a better term for dog's knee, as most of them show some variation in how they work the hold once back. Sometimes they go straight to the knee, usually from the front but sometimes from the back, and this can be even more punishing. Others head to the rib area, and normally this is put as highlighted on the knee. One of the problems with being a knee dog is that unless you're unusually cunning, you leave your own knee unprotected, and if your opponent can bite harder than you, then you're in hot water. Some dogs seem at a loss as to what to do when a dog lunges at their knee, but others are quite adept at reaching behind and catching them by the muzzle. Occasionally, a kneeling dog will go into the genital area and thereby gain a reputation as a dirty fighter. In my opinion though, this is normally an accident situation. Very few dogs have any idea what they have with such a hold. And the antidote for those who do is a good dog with a nose and ears. In fact, like all the dogs mentioned above, the kneeling dog is a perfect contrast to the ear and muzzle dog. Although, when I say that, the presumption is automatic that everything else apart from the style is equal, but this is rarely the case. Therefore, a very good dog on the knee, or leg or chest whatever the style, can beat a single dog on the ear. Another style that doesn't get talked about much is what I call the indestructible style. These are dogs that apparently can't be hurt. A dog can knock them down and overwork them, and those dogs come away with nothing more than a bruise. Such dogs are rare but highly prized because they almost always win. 
Sometimes their styles seem deliberate and obvious. Let the other dog wear itself out for nearly an hour and a half or so, and then when it is completely used and tired of continual fighting for the top and trying to punish from that position, come to the top yourself and proceed to spread the dog fight with a now useless dog. I have seen dogs such as these who take a beating and seem to enjoy it, but if another dog tried to rest for a minute, they grabbed the other dog to get him to continue with the fight, and once he was continuing again, simply go back to the down position, waiting for the inevitable. A strong bite is not important to these dogs, but total doggedness, tolerance, and courage obviously are. The counterpart to the indestructible bulldog is the super strong dog who has strength out of proportion to his size. He doesn't need to have a style, as he is so strong that he can do crazy things that no other dog can. Therefore, I have seen a yellow-colored dog that will grab a dog by the middle of its back and then throw it over its own body to the ground with such force that the dog was literally startled. Another piebald dog I saw in Mississippi in the 1950s would pick a dog his size or larger fully off the ground and shake him like a rag doll. Such dogs are an extravagance because they appear so rarely a euro, but they are obviously spectacular when they do. To a certain extent, I am oversimplifying when I talk about the fighting styles of various fighting dogs, as very few of them have the mentality of that style and nothing else, although many breeders were terrified to see their dog spit a muzzle and grab a leg, and most fighting dogs have a good repertoire of holds a euro, no restriction on style. However, they tend to favor certain holds and maneuvers. Although dogs learn style and technique in their training, they seem to be genetically predisposed to some. Now, since breeding is generally done without regard to fighting style, we can imagine the breed as being a mixed bag with all the traits, stubbornness, and different styles surrounded by a large number of successful fighting dogs. Occasionally, a dog will show that it absolutely has everything from absolute indestructibility to courage to tolerance for strong biting to intelligence in the ring and even to the uncanny ability to fight with any style. Therefore, he can adapt with any fighting style, finding his opponent's area of a euro a euro vulnerability in directing the appropriate style against him. This is the ace of aces, and I have only seen one. Judd Davidson's Josh, in 1950. I have heard of others but, needless to say, they are extremely rare. Finding his opponent's area of a euro a euro vulnerability and directing the appropriate style against him. This is the ace of aces, and I have only seen one, Judd Davidson's Josh, in 1950. I have heard of others but, Needless to say, they are extremely rare. Finding his opponent's area of a euro a euro vulnerability and directing the appropriate style against him. This is the ace of aces, and I have only seen one, Judd Davidson's Josh, in 1950. I have heard of others but, needless to say, they are extremely rare. Still, after all this discussion of style, I'll close where I started, that is, in de-emphasizing. If I were a breeder I would get a muzzle and ear dog, other things being equal. But that's it. Other things are rarely equated, and courage and tolerance are usually the deciding factors. Besides, a good dog makes any style work and an extra good dog can break any fighting style. This is known as dogfighting intelligence, and perhaps this should be emphasized a euro, even beyond style. Many mothers would call the police if she saw a horse being handled the way she treats her children. Andrew Salter Chapter 12 The Face of Cruelty Sometimes I feel ashamed of myself for the way I sternly berate humanists, 
chasing them uphill, downhill, challenging them to debates they stealthily dodge. It's not that I worry that I strike fear into the hearts of humanists or that I think the debate is one-sided, after all, the humanists are the only ones who have the public's ear and sympathy. It's just that I just feel like an evicted humanist, and the only difference between them and me is what we distinguish as cruelty. It's easy for humanists to find cruelty in dog fighting, and it doesn't hurt them one bit to deny breeders passion for their fighting dogs. They make no effort whatever to see things from the other colleagues' point of view. They take the white-black, good-evil approach and thus, for them, creators are nothing short of satanic. Humanists are quite happy to see a fighting dog breeder sentenced to jail time, in fact, they are clear that sinners are not being given the maximum amount of time in custody a euro, even though it seems that such space should be reserved for serious sinners who are a danger to society. Humanists probably get a certain purification of the rage they vent towards the fighting dog breeder, and the only sacrifice they make is an occasional contribution. And, of course, professional humanists receive funds and personal publicity. On the other hand, trying as hard as I can, I cannot find cruelty per se in dog competition. I think it is cruel of humanists to be somewhat so anxious to eliminate fighting dogs, that is, euthanizing them every chance they get. No doubt humanists think that fighting dog breeders are crying crocodile tears when their dogs are destroyed by animal welfare groups, but they really care about their dogs, not only as individual dogs in their own right but also because some of the destroyed dogs were famous among fighting dog breeders and were universally revered. To euthanize such admirable and lovable animals does not amount to murder in the eyes of fighting dog breeders, and perhaps the rest of us should see it in the same light. I'm sure some humanist-oriented people are quite sincere in their belief that they are doing the best for the dogs. But many of them know better, and many of them harbor real hatred for the race in their hearts. In view of the fact that I am a lover of pit bulls and have scoffed at the humanists' contention that dogfighting is cruel, it may be presumed that I am a callous type, immune to cruelty in all its manifestations. Amazingly though, I seem to see cruelty where others don't, not even humanists. Not that I'm oblivious to any cruelty involving pit bulls, mind you. On the contrary a euro, because I consider the expansion of pit bulls into stray dogs a flagrant abuse of the breed, and I have said so many times. And I don't care and the other dog is two or three times the size of the pit bull. He was not bred to be a fighter and is at a disadvantage for that reason, but more importantly, he wasn't raised to like it. And therein lies cruelty. But there is abundant cruelty, completely removed from the pit bull, that we all partake of, at least indirectly. We just don't have to think about it. We get our hamburgers and hot dogs and rarely, if ever, think about what was done in order to supply us with them. For those who care to know, here's what happens to supply us with milk and veal. Newborn calves are taken almost immediately from their mothers. The calf is taken to the slaughterhouse, and we wait for it to be humanely slaughtered, usually with a blow to the head. The calf that is taken for veal has an even worse fate. He is chained in a dark barn in a stable so small he can hardly move, no feed but milk for a few weeks, and then to the slaughterhouse in the meantime, the poor mother cow who has just as much maternal instinct as human mothers, even more than many I've seen, will cry profusely for weeks over her lost calf. The cow may not be a brilliant animal, but it is certainly hard to believe that such suffering is alleviated by that fact. Heat, this kind of cruelty is perfectly normal, because it benefits humanity. 
And I doubt many humanists will give up milk or meat in protest. And even I do not advocate that everyone should become a vegetarian, abstaining even from milk, in the name of compassion. Nor will I propose any oppressive law directed at the planters. However, it seems that we can be a little more aware of the tremendous cruelty involved here. But human society has not, to my knowledge, made any significant effort against this practice. With the general public, cruelties that benefit humanity are easy to overlook. However, hens are kept miserably confined in closed rooms to keep their meat tender and to prevent the eggs from getting bloodstained. And of course, the slaughter of chickens is not a pretty thing to look at, being mostly done on an assembly line, with some of them ending up in the scorching vat still alive, after having their throats slit. I'm often curious about the public's tolerance for bullfighting. Advertisements about bullfighting are carried in newspapers, television, buses, and on bulletin boards. In fact, this year's tagline has been a euro, a euro a Taurus fever a euro, catch it a euro and reports of the fights are taken to the newspapers, on the sports page. Still, what more vile activity involving animals is there? No matter how much you hide it, it is still a systematic way to torture animals to death for the amusement of onlookers and the glorification of man. I know a euro, at least, that the man there is taking a risk, but not too much. And I'd have a lot more respect for the boastful peacocks if they'd stay inside with the bull while it's fresh and crackling with energy and hate. But no, they dive behind those protective boards and take turns going out to wear it down. So what is cruel and what is not? Is it cruel to allow a hunter to track the raccoon even if it is cut by white heather or barbed wire and perhaps lost? Difficultly. Hunting dogs are better off hunting than eating. However, when we take the raccoon into consideration, we enter the element of cruelty. Is it cruel to allow pointers to point, retrievers to catch, and border collies to stalk the herd? Again, hardly. Anyone who knows performance dogs knows that they enjoy the activity they were bred for more. Yet, somehow most people fail to understand that a fighting dog enjoys what he was bred for, too. Once, when I was about 15 years old, I was scolded by a man who bred greyhounds to hunt coyotes for meddling with bulldogs. I was raised to be polite to elders, so I didn't ask him how would letting two dogs do what they wanted to do be worse than letting three greyhounds chase and catch a coyote and kill it. Why didn't this man see things from the coyote's point of view? Everyone seems to have a blind spot in their perception of cruelty. Maybe I have too. Maybe there's cruelty in dogfighting, I just don't see it. But if that's so, why can't the very people who know all about it see it? And why can people who know absolutely nothing about this see it so clearly? And so the mature man will take the word as it is, and inwardly remain undisturbed. Walter Lippmann Their webs were stretched beyond their usual size. And malnourished spiders consumed malnourished flies. Charles Churchill Chapter 13 Into Any Abyss Having been bred as an American pit bull terrier for nearly forty years now, these are the worst of times for me. The breed has become popular, and yet it must be the most hated breed of all time. I don't know of any other race that has even been considered to be exterminated, but this is exactly what many people, good and with good intentions, seriously propose. The justification is that pit dogs are against the law, and if you don't put them to fight, why do you need them? Fortunately, owners of other breeds have been on our side, 
because they know all too well that if you ban one breed, you can ban others. And what will be next? Rottweiler? Dobermans? Mastiffs? And what about all dogs a euro, as in Iceland? Thanks to media sensationalism, which takes its information from the publicity of hungry humanists, the public's image of race is actually distorted. It is true that there have been some attacks against people by pit bulls, but the publicity generated is almost always out of proportion to the problem. Attacks from other breeds go almost unnoticed, but a pit bull bark makes the front page. This is not pure rhetoric either. My local newspaper had a front page story about a pit bull barking. Somewhere in a minor headline was the story of an outbreak of war in the Middle East. Now, we all know that barking is not a breed characteristic, but neither is it characteristic of them to attack people. However, the public thinks otherwise because the exception ends up on the first page. Certain events develop a momentum of their own, and this seems to be the case with respect to some of the proliferating ideas about the pit bull. We feel powerless to say enough is enough, but we can at least analyze the phenomenon. First, there is the symbiotic relationship between the media and humanists. The media thrives on sensationalism, and humanists thrive on publicity. Such an immoral alliance makes for some truly eccentric stories. These stories, in turn, engender interest in race in exactly the wrong people. These people allow their dogs to attack stray animals in the park or on the street, thereby instilling untold hatred of the breed in the minds of the general public. Even worse, these newbies don't select people with good intentions towards pit bulls, and what was once rare pit bull attacks on people have become commonplace. But even now, the breed doesn't make the top 20 list for biting problems. The problem of non-selective breeding was highlighted recently by a fatal attack on a man in a town near here. In this case, the headlines were justified, but the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, even going back several generations. The breed is not in the top 20 list for biting problems. The problem of non-selective breeding was highlighted recently by a fatal attack on a man in a town near here. In this case, the headlines were justified, but the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, even going back several generations. The breed is not in the top 20 list for biting problems. The problem of non-selective breeding was highlighted recently by a fatal attack on a man in a town near here. In this case, the headlines were justified, but the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, even going back several generations. But the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, 
even going back several generations. But the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, even going back several generations. Like so many public arrogance, the one who says that fighting dogs are mean to people is absolutely contrary to the fact. The truth is, the closer you are to the arena with an American Pit Bull Terrier breed, the more likely you are to be in trouble, for a variety of reasons. One is that the arena dog breeder is not favorably impressed with dogs that dislike people, quite the opposite, in fact. Consequently they always prune them. Newbies on the other hand, are overwhelmed in large numbers and terrified, not to mention ferocious, towards people. Even so, pit bulls that are a real danger to anyone are quite rare. Taking the 99% of pit bulls a euro, the ones who don't mind people at all a euro, and looking only at those who can be categorized as dangerous against society, we find that most of them are either a euro oshi growler a euro fearful biters or they are a euro or disingenuous a euro. Either one will nip like a regular dog but won't really do much damage. However, once in a lifetime we come across a dog that will attack a person with the same intensity as any other dog. It is this type of dog that is the product of the horrific a euro was eating him alive, a euro reports. And for the sake of the race, not to mention the people, such individuals should be euthanized. In fact, I am in favor of euthanizing all bulldogs who don't like people, as I consider it essential for the future of the breed. I think in the long run pit bull fans will agree with me. But I would like to emphasize once more that the problems of people biting bulldogs have been, to put it mildly, too flourishing. With these bad times, one saving factor for the breed is that there are many fanatical supporters and advocates. Recently, I was caught up in a conversation with a dog trainer who was familiar with my books, and most other books, too, on dogs, and he gave me generous compliments, saying that I would be a world-renowned authority on dogs. If I had simply chosen another race to speak. While I was proud of the compliment, I had to reject it because I really do have a genuine interest in all dogs, I don't study them day and night like many people do. The fact is, I have other interests too. As a science teacher, I am an avid biologist, amateur geologist, and astronomer. Therefore, I go all out that I couldn't possibly be a high authority on dogs. And, even if I were and were recognized as such, I could never resist sponsoring the American Pit Bull Terrier breed. Not that I want the breed to become popular a euro, far from it. A euro, but I don't want hostility or loathing for the dogs. And I can't imagine anyone who's actually known them hating these dogs. All this hate comes from people who know absolutely nothing about them. For example, a favorable review of my book The Book of the American Pit Bull Terrier appeared in Dog Fancy magazine, and that review alone brought a torrent of letters from those angry readers directed at the critic. None of them knew what they were talking about and, of course, none of them had read my books. They were simply angry that the critic had read the books. This is the kind of mentality that comprises the almost tangible mass of hatred against the pit bulldog. Fortunately, the breed has enthusiastic supporters, too. Indeed, their enthusiasm makes my love for dogs seem almost tepid by comparison. And these breeders come from all walks of life and take satisfaction in many aspects of the breed.
Perhaps those who have the greatest joy are those who only have one or two dogs and are thus able to give them the proper attention and thereby allow the dogs to reach their full potential as individuals. Others train their dogs as attack and defense dogs and others in obedience work. Still others enter the conformation or weight pulling shows. All these competitions are great fun, and those good old bulldogs, as always, do their owners proud. Heat, there are those who put their dogs in fights, too, although it must be remembered that they are a distinct minority. Nationwide there are approximately only 300 or more who consistently race their dogs. In the past, other devotees of the breed have heaped scorn on fighting dogs, who preferred to be called fighting dog breeders, a term that is more accurate. But why do it? We all put up with them anyway, so why be so concerned about public opinion? Furthermore, if it weren't for these hard-working breeders, there wouldn't be this magnificent breed that we all love. After all, it's not the fighting dog breeders who have their dogs attack strays in the street or who have bred dogs to attack children. And breeders of fighting dogs can fall off the horse, too, as they can be intolerant of pit bulldog breeders who don't want to race their dogs. But they shouldn't be, by trainers, domestic dog breeders, and conformation people also made their contribution. Indeed, it is these people who are at the forefront of opposing oppressive legislation, while the fighting dog breeder keeps his low profiles. The truth is that pit bull breeders a euro divided with them by their philosophies a euro have something important in common, a certain irrational love for a certain unique breed. The breed will likely become more than solid over time a euro, and no one knows just how solid a euro, but pit bull friends, devoted as they are, are not to be underestimated. The world is in for solid times, too, and no one can say how solid, perhaps famine, perhaps widespread terrorism, perhaps nuclear demise, but pit bull breeders, not discouraged, draw strength from their brave little dogs and thank each day with renewed vigor and enthusiasm. I do not promote, support or condone any violations of the Animal Welfare Act 1976 or any other local, state and federal law. I am not affiliated with dogfighting in any way, or in any way. I am simply a pet owner and enthusiast of the American Pit Bull Terrier and the great history and legacy passed down through the generations. I believe it is important to know where we came from to know where we are going. Articles posted are strictly for historical and educational purposes. I do not necessarily represent the opinions expressed in these articles. My name is Rodolfo Luis, and I invite everyone to enjoy the knowledge of this wonderful breed. Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. God bless you all. I went. Handshake subscribe handshake.